Good morning. My name is Roger Sherman. I'm the Chief of the Wireless Telecommunications Bureau. And on behalf of the FCC, I want to welcome everyone to the Wireless Bureau's annual workshop on FCC environmental and historic preservation review processes. Your work is the foundation on which wireless broadband and other advanced wireless services are built, and we appreciate your participation today. The headlines often focus on spectrum and spectrum auctions, and infrastructure deployment often takes a back seat. But this commission recognizes that infrastructure deployment is a top priority. And as Chairman Wheeler said, high-speed mobile broadband also requires high-speed broadband build-out. Indeed, all of the commissioners have made this point and shown a clear commitment to the efficient deployment of wireless infrastructure. Specifically, in the last year, the Commission has adopted two important infrastructure orders. In August of 2014, the Commission unanimously adopted rules that substantially reform tower lighting and marking requirements and greatly ease compliance burdens for tower owners without any adverse impact on aviation safety. And then two months later, as you're all well aware, the Commission took unanimous action to bring new efficiencies to the federal and municipal review process for wireless infrastructure. And we're not done. Together with stakeholders, including many of you, Wireless Bureau staff is hard at work on developing a program alternative that will further facilitate deployment in certain circumstances, such as DAS and small cell deployments on existing structures and on developing a process for addressing twilight towers. We're also taking a small but important step in the Wireless Bureau that I'm pleased to announce. You're going to get some scoop here. Um, to recognize the centrality of infrastructure deployment and policy, we're changing the name of the uh, division that handles all of this for the Bureau. Uh, previously, it had been called the Spectrum and Competition Policy Division, but going forward, the division will be known as the Competition and Infrastructure Policy Division. This is a small step, but it's to recognize the critical infrastructure work that the division has done for many years and the importance of the Bureau's mission with regard to infrastructure deployment. Regardless of how much we might think we've accomplished at the policy level, the real measure of the Commission's work is whether it makes a difference on the ground. This workshop is geared toward ensuring that we are making that difference. Reviewing the nuts and bolts steps at the heart of the historic preservation environmental review process will help ensure that all stakeholders have a common understanding of the way the process works in their respective roles. As a preview of the substantive discussions to follow today, I want to give you a sense of the Bureau's approach to wireless infrastructure deployment. At a high level, we approach infrastructure issues with the following principles in mind. First, we have to address surging demand. Demand for wireless capacity is exploding, and we can't allow infrastructure limits to curb that growth. Second, we should encourage small cells wherever possible. A technological revolution has changed the wireless network landscape. Cumbersome review processes are not necessary in situations where there is no potential harm. We also should encourage co-locations rather than new builds. In the vast majority of cases, co-locating is cheaper, quicker, and less harmful to historic and environmental interests. We must respect the critical role of localities and tribal nations. State, local, and tribal governments play essential roles in this process, and we need to make sure that we, what we do going forward respects and honors this responsibility. Finally, we have to improve certainty and finality. In many instances, challenges arise because stakeholders have different expectations about what the process entails. This workshop, we hope, will bridge some of those gaps. While we do our best to develop policies and rules that encourage rapid but responsible deployment, we recognize that at the end of the day, the toughest part of the job is on you, the tribal representatives, historic preservation officers, and industry representatives who do the heavy lifting throughout the country. Thank you for your commitment to this process, and thank you very much for joining us today. Wish you wish you to learn a lot. Jeff? Thank you, Roger. Um, welcome everybody um, in the room and on the um, on the webinar. <clears throat> I'm Jeffrey Steinberg, Deputy Chief of the now newly renamed Competition and Infrastructure Policy Division. Um, as Roger indicated in his remarks, we're coming off a very busy and very productive year in infrastructure, and we're looking, for, looking forward to even more in the year to come. Particularly gratified to see a lot of new faces in the room here, and I, and I know that there are others watching on the web as well. 
Um, I'm certainly hopeful that our program today will have something for everyone, whether you're someone who's been doing this for years and come to all of our workshops or someone who's just here for the first time. But I think that, you know, for those of you who are new, this is especially for you to um, you know, try, try to try to bring you more into the up to speed. Um, speaking of new faces, I'd like to introduce a few new faces of our own as, as we've brought on some, some new people over the last year. Um, one is Jill Springer, our new Deputy Federal Preservation Officer, um, who you'll be hearing from later today and who has um, really helped us out. Um, Steve Del Sordo was terribly overburdened and um, Jill has been a great addition to our staff. Um, Erica Rosenberg. Um, our special counsel who came to us with years of NEPA experience and has brought some new perspectives to our work, which I think have helped to round us out about. A and also someone who's been with us almost a year now, I almost feel funny introducing his new, Chad Breckenridge, um, Associate Bureau um, uh, yeah, Associate Bureau Chief, who, um, who I work with very closely on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, as you can see from the agenda that you've picked up, we have a very full program today. Um, some of it is just going to be the basics. Some of it, a lot of it is going to be focused on developments in the past year and on topics that we haven't previously discovered in depth. These include um, the, the new DAS rules, um, some of the biological aspects of the NEPA review, and some common problems in compliance. Um, just sort of walking quickly through what to expect today, we will begin with a panel on the NEPA process, sort of an overview of our checklist and the process that goes with it. Um, then Joelle Gehring, our biologist, is going to talk about some biological review issues and um, working with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, then the panel on DAS and small cells, which I, I hear a lot of you are looking forward to. Um, and then, then just a series of... Um, <coughs> sort of before and after lunch, 15 or 20 minute sessions on, on some of the special problems that, that we focus, um, that, that, that we encounter, that some of you are encountering certain situations. Um, these include qualifications to, to do the Section 106 process, entering into memoranda of agreement, um, some positive train control, which is sort of its own little animal. Um, or not so little, um, the antenna structure registration process and some issues that have arisen under E106 and TCNS. Um, and then the last session, um, we're particularly pleased we have today um, a couple of, um, of representatives from the FIPO offices, Tribal Historic Preservation Offices, um, <clears throat> Alvin Windy Boy of the Chippewa Cree Tribe and Everett Bandy of the Quapaw Tribe of Oklahoma. And um, They'll be introduced in, in more detail later, but I, I would like to just say for now that based on my own experience with these two gentlemen, I expect that they will provide you with an enlightening window into both the many commonalities and the many differences in approaches that we can see across Indian country. I also want to thank PCIA for enabling Mr. Windy Boy and Mr. Bandy to be here with us. Um, and now I'm going to turn the program over to our Federal Preservation Officer, Steve Del Sordo, who will cover just a few logistics, and then we'll start with the substantive program. Thank you, Jeff. And welcome to everybody in the room and on the phone. Um, <clears throat> logistics for people that are in the room. Um, bathrooms are behind us, and over to your right in the corridor is down, down the left. Um, you don't need special permission to, to go to those, just off you go. Um, if you would uh, turn your cell phones down in, in the room so that um, you don't interfere with the speakers and the questions that people may have. Uh, we are live webcasting this so that your cell phone uh, calls will be broadcast across the web. So we, we try to avoid that. Um, for those of you who are on the webinar, uh, welcome and I'm glad that you're able to join us for part of the day or all the day or however it works in your schedule. Um, we will have this webinar, this webcast on our website at the FCC events page. It'll be a past event uh, starting tomorrow, uh, but so you'll be able to refer to it. If you take it back to your offices, your companies, tribes, shippos, whoever, um, you'll be able to um, refer back to it so that the information that is going to be presented today, the questions we ask today will not be lost. They'll be, be kept for 
as long as the website is up. And I'm not responsible for that, so I make no guarantees as to how long it will be there. So look at it as soon as you can. Um, if you have questions in the room, we have at least one person uh, with a blue jacket on who uh, has a microphone, and um, we would like you to um, stand and we'll We'll get him to come over to you and, and use the microphone to ask your question. That way it's captured in the, in the webinar and captured on that, that broadcast so that we can keep it on our website. If you're on the webinar, questions should be sent to live questions. That's um, plural at FCC.gov. So it's live questions at FCC.gov. And we have somebody who is... Um, Taking those questions, we'll, we'll give to the individual speakers. We'll be taking questions at each session, um, so it'll, it'll work fairly well. Um, we've been happy to be able to do these things the past few years. We found them to be very instructive and informative. Um, the other thing is, for those folks that are in the room, we've got a couple breaks scheduled, um, and then also we have a lunch from 12 to 1. Um, getting to our cafe, for those of you who've not done this before, know that it. it you need to know it could be a little bit of a challenge in that you have to go through our security gates, which means that you need an FCC employee because we have a magic badge that opens gates and opens doors and things like that, and your visitor badges don't do that. Um, so we've got some folks coming in at noon to help take you down to the cafe, which is here in the building. There is also a, a pot bellies out the front door and around the corner. There's a Starbucks up there and around the corner of Maryland Avenue by the Madrid Oriental. Um, if you can get in and out of the Mandarin Oriental for in an hour, you're, you're welcome to do that. It's your choice. Um, there's also a little deli around the corner, too. So um, whatever works for you, as long as you're, you're back here at 1 o'clock so that we can start promptly. Um, because we have found that while we schedule these things to go to 4 o'clock, they tend to, to bleed over. Um, and so with that, uh, are there any questions on logistics and what we're trying to do today? If not, we'll start with the first panel, which is the FCC's NEPA process. And um, I'm really pleased that Erica, you have to come up now, and Dan Veda, who is um, the assistant chief in our newly named um, division. Have a seat. Yeah. Um, Erica has, as Jeff said, has a lot of experience with the NEPA process at other federal agencies. She's helped us a lot since she's been here with um, answering questions about the NEPA process and how we could, could make that process a little bit better. One of the things that, as you may have noticed on the slides that we're showing this morning, um, which is the, the photographs you were seeing were, were my postcard collections, broadcast hours. Um, but Erica has been helping us with some NEPA things, and uh, the theme is improving the process, and that's why we wanted to start off with, with NEPA, which is a more overarching um, environmental compliance law than just the, the Section 106 activities, which is what I do and what, what Jill Springer does. And then um, Erica and Dan have 45 minutes, and when you're, you're done, we'll, we'll do questions. Are you ready? Do you have the, the, the clicker? And thank you. Welcome. I think I'm going to see how this goes. Does that work? Bear with me. I'm, I'm new to this PowerPoint system, so. There you go. Oh, okay. okay. And you've got two screens on either side. Okay. And, and one. That one's probably better to lead off. Of. Okay. Which one? This is probably the one I'm bigger here. I can barely yeah. read that. Okay. Okay. Well, I'm going to begin with a quick overview of NEPA and then give a, an overview of FCC's NEPA rules and procedures and a little bit of the nuts and bolts of how to comply with our rules. Um, but other people will go into more detail about aspects of compliance with our rules. Um, so NEPA um, is, sort of sets the context for our rules. It was enacted in 1969. It's the Magna Carta. Magna 
Carter, sorry, my Boston accent, Magna Carter of environmental law declaring a lofty policy of using all means, quote, to create and maintain conditions under which man and nature can exist in productive harmony and fulfill social and economic and other requirements of future and present generations of Americans. It requires agencies to consider and disclose the environmental effects of their actions to improve decision making and encourage transparency, public participation, and accountability. It requires agencies to integrate environmental considerations into their decisions and makes environmental protection part of every agency's mandate. NEPA itself doesn't mandate an outcome. It doesn't prohibit development or prevent a project from moving forward. It just sets out a process that requires consideration of environmental effects and alternatives in order to possibly mitigate those effects or at least be aware of them. NEPA and CEQ regulations, sorry, this this isn't quite coming up (laughs) as I'm pressing this, so I apologize for for the slides being out of sync. Anyway, um, NEPA defines effects broadly to include ecological, aesthetic or visual, historic, social and cumulative and indirect effects. Actions are also defined broadly to include programs, rules, funding, licensing, and permitting. Most people associate NEPA with NEPA triggers with projects like highways or dams or mines, um, but triggers are federal actions, which are far broader. NEPA has three levels of review, depending on the significance of the effect, which in turn depends on the context and intensity of the effect. Environmental impact statements, where impacts will be significant, there are detailed analysis and disclosure of actions and alternatives of significant land exchange, for example, a mine. Agencies can also do programmatic environmental impact statements, um, maybe for a land resources management plan or a wind wind energy development, something like that. Um, Second level is environmental assessments. For actions that may have a significant effect, um, it requires less analysis than an EIS. If there's no significant effect, the agency issues a finding of no significant effect, a FONSI. Finally, there are categorical exclusions for actions or types of actions with minimal or no impacts on the environment, both individually and cumulatively. Um, It might be some construction in a right-of-way or maintaining a trail, restoring soil, um, repairing a structure, those types of actions would be categorically excluded. Extraordinary circumstances are circumstances like the presence of wetlands or sensitive ecosystems or endangered species or significant ground disturbance that remove an action from a categorical exclusion and require more analysis. Environmental reviews can look very broadly at a panoply of effects. Um, Some of these effects are often addressed by other statutes like air quality, water quality, coastal zones, endangered species, and under our NEPA umbrella we do Historic Preservation, (coughs) Margaret River Treaty Act, Floodplains, Clean Water Act, Wilderness Act, and ESA. Um, FCC has not done an EIS. It completed a programmatic EA in 2012 that looked at registered towers with a focus on impacts to migratory birds. Other EAs that we get or do are for individual facilities. Um, Compliance with NEPA rests with the FCC. Um, Actions that trigger agency NEPA obligations are registering, (coughs) and licensing towers and facilities. FCC rules impose enforceable duties on licensees and applicants so that the agency can meet its NEPA obligations. We have delegated the initial assessment of whether a proposed facility is categorically excluded and certification to that effect, as well as preparation of EAs to licensees and applicants. We have categorically excluded from further NEPA processing, that is, environmental assessments or EISs, all agency actions except those associated with construction of facilities that fall into certain categories. 
The categories are facilities that involve high intensity lighting in a residentially zoned area um, or would cause RF emissions exposure in excess of FCC established limits or involve certain sites. These sites are, um, will, are an officially designated wilderness area or if the project will be located in an officially designated wildlife preserve. Since these two categories of extraordinary circumstances are generally on federal land, we defer to the land manage, management agencies for NEPA compliance. Um, sorry, my slide is behind. I can see that. Um, also, if um, another category is if it will affect listed or jeopardize proposed threatened or endangered species or designated critical habitat. But if informal, if formal consultation with Fish and Wildlife Service is required, we do it. Um, if it may affect districts, sites, buildings, structures, or objects significant in American history, architecture, archaeology, engineering, or culture that are listed or are eligible for listing in the National Register of Historic Places. That's our NHPA compliance. Here, here's the list. Um, may affect Indian religious sites, will be located in a floodplain whose construction will involve significant change in surface features, for example, wetland fill, deforestation, or water diversion, or would be over 450 feet above ground level and therefore may affect migratory birds. If any of these circumstances are present, EAAs are triggered. In addition, FCC will require an EA if it determines on its own motion or in response to an objection from a member of the public that a proposed facility may have a significant environmental impact other than one specified in the rules. So who needs to comply with our environmental rules? The rules apply to all licensees and applicants. Commercial licensees, broadcasters, utilities, public safety entities, railroads, mining companies, tower registrants. So let's talk about tower registrants for a second. Our antenna structure registration system links to our NEPA regulations. The regulations require pre-construction registration for any structure housing antennae for FCC licensed spectrum that requires notice to the FAA for painting and lighting requirements. Notice to the FAA is required when antenna structures are over 200 feet in a glide slope or require no hazard determination for some other reason. Although originally addressing aviation safety, the ASR regulations now also establish environmental notification requirements, both local and national 30-day notice, which generally registrants must comply with. ASR requirements apply to the tower owner, which may be a third party and not an FCC licensee. Because registration is the federal action, our environmental requirements apply to non-licensee owners of registered towers. In addition, non-licensee tower owners that do not otherwise require registration should use the ASR process as the vehicle for filing EAs where an EA is required under our rules. This submission is important to ensure that the tower is readily available for co-location by licensees whose facilities must comply with our NEPA requirements. Structures that will be used only for antennas using unlicensed spectrum do not need to be registered. And with regard to licensees, some FCC licenses are for operations at a specific location, while others authorize use of spectrum over a geographic area, which can range from a few counties to the entire nation. For a site-specific license, it's known at the time of licensing what infrastructure will be needed. So the applicant must comply with our environmental rules at that time. For geographic area license, infrastructure needs are typically developed over the time after the license is issued. So the rules require environmental review before constructing new facilities. If a facility may have a significant environmental impact, licensees must apply for a license modification and file an EA along with the application to comply with our requirements. So even with a license, building without following our environmental rules can constitute, constitute a violation of our rules and licensing and registering requirements as well as our environmental compliance rules and could subject the constructing party to enforcement action. Here's how our process works. 
This is how to comply. It's a very straightforward process, as you can see. Um, these are available as handouts on the table uh, as well. So um, this is for Form 601, and this is the process for Form 854, which is not coming up. Okay. Um, FCC forms for licenses and registrants ask about a project's environmental effects. It is the applicant's duty to consider the effects of its proposed facilities before filing an application and certifying the answer. Certifying means all statements are true, complete, correct, and made in good faith. I don't know why that isn't showing up there. There it is. Okay. Um, We've developed a NEPA checklist to assist applicants in determining whether an EA is required for any particular project. The checklist is a summary of the rules, so we recommend referring to our rules to make sure you've covered everything. In addition, it may behoove applicants to think more broadly about other potentially significant impacts and to consider them. For example, if a project is near a scenic byway or in a caribou migration route, these are things the public and the agency can raise, and it can slow down a project when we require more environmental processing. Form 601 is the Wireless Bureau's licensing form used when getting a site-specific or geographic area license, as I said. Form 601 is also filed, used to file a major modification when a tower built under a geographic area license requires an EA. Form 608 is similar to 601, but for less A's. Form 854, application for antenna structure registration, is for both licensees and non-licensees who need a no-hazard determination from the FAA. Non-licensees, that is tower owners, who do not otherwise need to register the towers should also use Form 854 when the tower requires an EA, for example, if it's in a floodplain. Licensees who also, who have towers over 200 feet, need to file both Forms 601 and 854 but the EA is filed with the 854. Even if the applicant has determined that no EA is required, the registration must still go through a public notification system. If the answer is yes to any of the impact questions about the projects having a significant effect on the forms, EAs are required. So again, this is the NEPA checklist. It's derived from our regulatory checklist that's in the rules, so you should check that. Um, on Form 601, instructions for filling out various schedules include a list of examples of when an EA is warranted. Although the instruction states the applicant must answer yes if the FCC grant of the application will have a significant effect on the environment, the applicant should answer yes if the action might have a significant effect. Again, to determine whether the project might have a significant effect on the environment, the applicant must review the regulatory checklist. That's this. Um, questions on Form 854 are worded slightly differently. In Item 48, the form asks the registrant applicant if the grant of their authorizations would not have a significant environmental effect. Accompanying instructions direct the registrant to submit an EA if any of the listed categories proposed um, are implicated. But the list is incomplete. The form doesn't quite reflect what significant effect means for our purposes or what's in an EA. We're looking into revising the forms because of that. So before certifying, refer to the rules to understand what a significant effect on the environment means, or ask us. Remember, height and design are not determinants of whether a proposed structure might have an effect. Also, projects include not just antenna structures, but equipment cabinets, fencing, roads, power and fiber connections, and their operation and maintenance. If the applicant reviews the checklist and concludes no potential significant effect, the project is categorically excluded and the application granted, unless the FCC identifies extraordinary circumstances through public comment or its own that require more environmental processing on issues outside the checklist. The agency can also ask for more information and mitigation to reduce impacts to decide whether to issue a FONSI. 
If the tower requires registration or a site-specific license for another reason, the applicant must certify completion of environmental review, but it is not required to provide supporting documentation. Sorry, these are the questions. <laughs> um, so if you answer yes, what happens? If the structure is not categorically excluded, that is, the project falls in any of the categories, the applicant must file an EA and get a FONSI before building. But if the project is on federal land, it can get um, its NEPA documentation from the federal land managing agency. Like categorical assessment, categorical exclusion assessments, we have delegated preparation of EAs and associated le legwork to licensees and applicants. We review the submissions. Um, as part of the checklist process, applicants use various tools and maps and informally consult with Fish and Wildlife, Fish and Wildlife Service for ESA purposes and consult with SHPOs and TIPOs for NHPA purposes. Um, others today will cover those parts of the process um, in far more depth than I will. Um, if there are issues with any of the checklist items, applicants submit EAs from which the Bureau or Commission can determine whether the pros proposal will have a significant environmental effect. But applicants can also eliminate or mitigate some issues by shifting sites or working with other agencies to mitigate the effects. Last year, the Wireless Bureau reviewed 200 EAs. Um, most of the EAs were required for floodplain or wetland issues, though there were also some for historic preservation, uh, threatened and endangered species, and tall tower issues. So what's in an EA? Um, under our rules, EAs must include a description of facilities and site and lighting, zoning classification, communications with and proceedings before any zoning or environmental commissions, a statement about whether the facilities have been a source of controversy on environmental grounds in the local community, a discussion of environmental and other considerations which led to the site selection, the nature and extent of unavoidable adverse effects and alternative sites that have been or may be considered. It must also address any feature of the site which has special environmental significance, including, for example, migration paths for birds and other wildlife. It also must detail any substantial change in the character of the land utilized, including wetland fill, deforestation, or water diversion, and other extensive change of surface features. Also, the rule suggests that in any sensitive protected area, the statements must discuss the effect of the continuing pattern of human intrusion into the area, necessitated, for example, by the operation and maintenance of the facilities. Site approval evidence from local and federal authorities is required as well. Again, others will speak more about this, the contents of EAs, but um, check the regulatory checklist. Um, the regulations provide for an opportunity for public comment on the EA and community notice on a FONSI and allow an interested person to submit comments justifying environmental consideration in the decision-making process. Sorry, these slides are completely out of sync. <laughs> um, if the commission finds a significant effect, it will allow the applicant to amend its application to reduce, minimize, or eliminate environmental problems or it can do an EIS, but it has not done that to date. Um, the applicant can also withdraw the application if there are too many environmental issues. After a 30 days notice period, and if no complaints or comments, we issue a FONSI and grant the application, usually within 45 days. If Form 601 is used, that is no tower registration, Certifications of no environmental effect require no paperwork and do not go out for notice and comment. Both EAs and CADEXs are noticed when filed with Form 854. We also have a provision in our rules that address um, other agencies doing NEPA. Um, 
Under our rules, we don't, an EA is not needed if another federal agency has assumed responsibility for determining whether the facilities in question will have a significant effect on the quality of the human environment. So t two items on our checklist, wetlands, I mean, sorry, wilderness and wildlife preserves are generally on federal land, so we defer to the federal land management agencies for NEPA compliance. I'm going to try to get through these contents of an EA, which is, uh, which should have shown up a long time ago. Um, as I said, others will cover these. <coughs> this doesn't seem to be a fast way of getting through the animated slides, so I apologize. If anyone wants a copy of the PowerPoint, I'd, I'd be happy to provide it. Um, oh, okay. So here are here's a final list of reminders or takeaways. Um, basically, refer to the rules is is a big one. Um, and if you have questions, ask us. And also. Remember to do your certifying before you build, your review of the checklist before you build, um, and certifying entails going through the checklist before you certify. So. Any questions? I'm sure that was crystal clear. Uh, remind, uh, remind people to send their emails. Oh. <clears throat> okay. I'm reminding the remote people to send email with their questions to livequestions at FCC.gov. That was crystal clear, so there are no questions? <laughs> Hi. Hi. Uh, Van Blois from PCIA. Um, you mentioned that the FCC is looking to revise Form 854 to clarify some of the terms. Do you know uh, what the approximate timeline is for that? I don't. I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> so it's, hard, it's hard to predict how long things like that can take. <laughs> so. Jim, right up front. Thank you. You mentioned uh, sites that have already been implemented years ago. I come from Montana, and there are a number of towers, FCC towers, on existing ceremonial sacred sites that was done in the 20s and 30s. What category would those be excluded or in the future? in addressing the needs of Native America? Uh, those towers don't fall within any category that, uh, that would be excluded from our rules. Um, the NEPA rules, as Eric said, have been in, in place for er, in many years. Most likely, those towers should have gone through an environmental review. Uh, um, so at some point, as we're looking at what we call twilight towers or towers that didn't go through a review process, uh, um, we're going to be looking at those towers and we're looking at um, what, if anything, can be done to make these towers usable for co-locations. That's going, to be, that's going to involve working with the Indian tribes, finding out the concerns that they have about these towers. And also, I just want to reiterate, <clears throat> NEPA is sort of prospective, so you do it before you build, and those either miss the process because <clears throat> they were built before NEPA was enacted or they, the law was not complied with. Well, I, I, the reason I raise that is... is uh, a place called the uh, Sweetgrass Hills in Montana, very sacred to many tribes, and was probably constructed prior to the right. enactment of this law. Right. So in the future, when if there is going to be reanalysis 
of those sites yes. include tribes. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I'd be happy to sit with you offline and get a sense of uh, where the towers are located, what type of facilities they are. So to the extent that we can learn about those sites now, that would be helpful as well. Okay, where's the question? We have a question. Do NEPA reports have a shelf life like phase one reports? Okay, and I'm not sure I understand the question. Jeff, does that make sense to you? Do you want to uh, try to uh, tackle it? <clears throat> do NEPA reports, reports have a shelf life Microsoft. like phase one reports? I think they're all on. <laughs> oh, okay. Oh, okay. Oh, sure. <laughs> Um, I mean, I, I guess the question there is if you've, you know, if you've done a NEPA review and you haven't built the tower and it's right. months later or a year later or years later, um, can you rely on the same, on that NEPA report? We don't, we don't have any formal principles in place about that, but, you know, I, I think there's a there's sort of a rule of reason here. Don't rely on something that's years old because things do, do change over time. I would... As a rule of thumb, I would sort of say if something is more than a year old or so, you, you probably ought to redo your work and to just at least at least have your consultant go back and 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 check you know some some of the basics and you know at least a quick check to see if anything might have changed. Um, yeah, that sounds reasonable. Um, should also ask people um, if you um, have questions either in the room or online, please identify yourself and who you're affiliated with. This, this question of shelf life often comes up within the Section 106 arena, and my standard rule is that if it's more than a year old, you don't necessarily need to rewrite it, but you need to check your facts, as, as Mr. Steinberg said, because it's entirely possible that either a SHPO or a tribe or some other entity that does historic preservation work and cultural resource management has identified new sites. So you at least need to check uh, to make sure that your information is accurate and up to date. And for me, that usually means after a year, you need to do that for the Section 106 process. Hi, I'm Craig Pruitt with Terracon. We're one of the consultants in this arena. Um, we've got a question related to ASR when another federal agency has the lead on so that FCC doesn't have the, the NEPA obligation. It's got a tall tower going up, so it's over, so it triggers an EA if it were, a, if it were an FCC uh, lead. What happens when another federal agency has the lead on that? So um, how tall is the tower that's going on? Uh, tall enough to trigger an EA, so it's 450, 500. Okay. And uh, the, where is the tower being built? Is it on federal land? Yeah, let's say it's Forest Service or BLM or okay. National Parks. They become the lead agency. Yeah, they're the lead agency for the NEPA work. Correct. Uh, I'm kind of just so ASR. The FCC's obligation to put that in ASR and and the automatic trigger of an, e, of an EA doesn't apply in that situation. Is that your answer? No, it no. goes through it, it goes through True. the e notice process. But it would okay. just be their EA. with their process with, so. yeah, with their environmental assessment. Correct. Attached to the so so it's up really up to the there if you follow their process, then you're doing it correctly. Correct, but it's still subject to the EA process. Okay. Yes. Okay. To the notice process, uh, right. Yeah. Or, uh, sorry, Jen. If you could bring the microphone. Sure. Craig, Craig you're, ver you're very good at finding those tiny little narrow. <laughs> 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 no, I think that's so. I have to say I missed part of the question because I was chatting, which I shouldn't have been and doing. Monty is one of the attorneys on our infrastructure team. Yeah, we've we yeah, it is a, a narrow issue, and we've talked it over. And uh, as I understand it, the question is, 
you have to do an FAA notification because it's a tall tower, but it's categorically excluded under a, a fe another federal agency, which is the land holding agency, is right? Is that correct? No. No. Mayor. No. Okay. So it's another agency. Right now, we do not have any agreements with any other federal agency that they are the lead agency. And, and as I'll discuss this afternoon, for purposes of our environmental notice rules, you still have to go through environmental notice under our procedures uh, if you are on another federal agency and you, you are registering the tower unless uh, the federal agent, you're on federal land and the federal agency has done it. You've done an EA and FONSI or an EIS and our uh, record of decision for them. So um, we are, we, you know, I guess you'd have to come with us. Come and talk to us about specifically about the facts, mm -hmm. but we think it would have to be registered if you go to, if you have to go to the uh, FAA uh, to, re to uh, get a no hazard determination. I think you have to register it with us and go through our processes. Is that correct? So yeah. more or less. Cover it. Yeah. Cover it. Yeah. Talk to us about the specific facts. And actually, I'll, I'll make that caveat for all these kinds of things that I'm sure Craig will find again throughout the day, or anybody else. If you're unsure about what to do, ask us. Um, we're the ones that interpret our regulations, and there's lots of in regulation interpreters in the room. Um, I do the sec Jill and I do the Section 106, but when we're unsure, we ask uh, any one of the attorneys in, in the office. And we even have um, general counsel's office represent the back, so we, we can get lots of legal opinions. And we're more than happy to look at your specific circumstance and make sure that for your specific circumstance, you know exactly what you're doing. So feel free to call. Um, we've said this in previous trainings. We're a very user-friendly agency as opposed to some other agencies, and we take a great deal of pride in that. I'm happy to give you my phone number. Um, I know Jill will do that as well. Um, call us. And if you, if you just want to give me a call, I can, I can find Monty because she's down the hall. Um, I can find our general counsel's office because they're upstairs. I know where Erica lives because she goes by my office all the time. So we'll get you the answers. All right. Is that it? Thank you. I just want to add that there's there will be a handout on NEPA later today on the table along with the flow charts, if you're interested. Well, thank you. All right. That was very good. Yes? One more question coming through? All right. Entergy constructs signal towers for internal <coughs> communications within the confines of power distribution substations. If a historical study concludes no impact, does Entergy still need to complete the full Section 106 process? Should I defer to the 106? And That's my right. answer is yes. <laughs> <laughs> if, if, if you are using licensed spectrum and you are putting up a communications tower, of any height, if it's if it's a foot tall, if it's four inches tall, if it's 500 foot tall, whatever in between, you need to do a form 620 for a new tower. We've run into to a number of of, of the utility companies, either directly or indirectly through people who are building for them, and you need to complete the the form 620 for a new tower. If you're putting your communications gear on an existing piece of your substation. Then a co-location, uh, Form 621, probably would be appropriate. But you need to go through the process. That includes notification to the tribes. It always is included. There's there's no option for not telling Alvin where you're putting your stuff if he's in your area of interest. 
and we're, we're very serious about that. So uh, work with the SHPOs, the State Historic Preservation Offices, and, and the tribes. If you're unsure about how to do this, uh, I got a call yesterday from a utility company in the, the central part of the country wanting to know how to do this because they recognize they have an obligation. Give me a call. Um, my f direct phone line is 202-418-1986. Call me. And we'll get you set up. We'll get you going and going in the right direction. Because that's the whole purpose of these training programs, is to get you going in the right direction. We're and user friendly. I'd also add uh, that if you're using licensed spectrum, you have to go through the NEPA process as well. Right. Yeah. Now that Eric is here, I can just focus again on the Section 106 part. And Eric always reminds me we've got, we got NEPA to do as well, which is very good. <laughs> Uh, are there any other questions for our the one in the, Jim, there's one in the back for you. Yeah, is a NEPA and SHPO required if um, we're using a small cell and we're going to replace the existing structure that is there uh, with a stronger uh, structure, but it's going to be the, if it's a light pole, and it's still going to be used mainly for a light pole, do we have to go through the NEPA and the SHPO? Um, that's a, it depends on what you're doing question. So I think we want to talk to you offline about the exact nature of what you're, you're doing. So it's hard to answer that kind of a, a, a general question. And my practice is that I, I tend not to want to answer general questions like that because they often will get misinterpreted. Uh, not saying you would do that, but, but that does happen. So those kinds of things I prefer to answer a specific question to give you a specific answer in your circumstance. And, and so we, we'll certainly we'll do that for you. Okay, because this is coming up a lot. Uh, we're, I know. We're implementing these all over the place. Yeah. and uh, yeah. so. We'll have a small cell discussion later today as well. Okay, great. Thanks. Yeah. Are there any other, other questions for Erica in her field? Okay. All right. Well, very good. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we're next going to hear, and we're, we're doing very good by staying on time. Uh, we're next going to hear from Joelle um, Gearing. It's actually Dr. Joelle Gehring. She's our biologist, and um, she's going to talk about biological reviews in the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And um, you're all set. Okay. I think so. And Joelle was the was the first. Um, I used to say it was it's the SEC is a lawyers agency, and it's was me and. <coughs> Thousands of lawyers, and then Joel came, and now it's it's me, a biologist, and Jill Springer, and so we're <laughs> we're rapidly gaining on the the attorneys and the engineers and the SEC. <laughs> I, okay. Rapidly yeah. gaining. I'm not sure we'll ever catch up, though. <laughs> I joined the FCC in 2012, late 2012. And uh, before that, after I finished my Ph.D. at Purdue University, I was working at Michigan State University and uh, studying the impacts of communications towers on migratory birds. So I've really been working on the issue of minimizing the impacts of communications towers on migratory birds for uh, about 12 years now. And um, I've interacted with many of you in the past, and I hope to meet more of you today as well. Today we'll be talking about uh, wetlands, we'll be talking about threatened and endangered species, migratory birds, and bald eagles and golden eagles, and we'll throw some other raptors into that category as well. When we're discussing our, our NEPA checklist, which Erica did a nice job uh, detailing earlier uh, today, we, uh, we have to pay attention to things such as wilderness areas, wildlife preserves, floodplains, among other things. And wetlands is on that list as well. So let's consider wetlands in a little more depth. The Clean Water Act refers to wetlands as areas that are inundated or saturated by surface or groundwater at a frequency and duration sufficient to support and under normal circumstances do support a presence of vegetation typically adapted for life in saturated soil conditions. Wetlands generally include swamps, marshes, bogs, and similar areas. I will add to that definition, we need to consider riverine areas and shorelines as well. Wetlands have many ecological functions. 
in the past, some of our ancestors would use them as, as dumping grounds for mattresses and things like that. We have learned, we have grown as a society, and we now value wetlands for uh, other things, such as flood control. Wetlands are important for storage of water, recharging groundwater, uh, reducing flow velocity, etc. Specifically, the storage of water and reducing flow velocity is thought to have been important in some of the flooding of the Mississippi River. Some scientists have linked some of the property loss and the uh, extensive flooding that we had to the actual loss of wetlands within that river shed. So they are important uh, for many reasons. Water quality is another example. Wetlands are important for transforming nutrients and pollutants and for catching sediments and settling out those sediments so that we have increased water clarity. Diversity, uh, diversity of wetland plants, wildlife, and ecosystems is an important function of wetlands. We are uh, familiar with wetlands providing habitat, they provide food, water, shelter for fish, shellfish, birds, mammals. They serve as breeding grounds and nurseries for numerous species, and many endangered plant and wildlife species are dependent on wetlands for survival. And I want to also emphasize that different wetlands have different values, even those that are flooded for only a portion of the year. Many of us think of wetlands as, well, something like we see in this slide. But sometimes wetlands are wet for just a portion of the year and then dry for the rest of the year. An example a specific example of why this would be valuable is for the reproduction of amphibians. Uh, fish would be a great predator for amphibian eggs, but if you have an, an ephemeral wetland, a wetland that comes and goes, it's not support, able to support fish. Therefore, it might be a, an excellent place for reproduction of amphibians with the lack of predator fish. So different wetlands have different values. Wetlands are also valuable for recreation, hunting. I've spent some wonderful time fishing with my son in wetlands and, of course, bird watching. Wetlands are also part of our natural heritage. Many cultures have been collecting uh, products such as wild rice on wetlands uh, for centuries. <coughs> so the value the ecological value and the societal value of wetlands has been recognized in many laws and policies, for example, in international law, federal and state law, executive orders, programs, local policies, and regulations. We oftentimes deal with the Clean Water Act, Section 104, when we are dealing with communication tower development and as it regulates uh, dredging and filling of wetlands. The Army Corps of Engineers needs to be contacted in situations like this, and other permits and authorization may also be required. How do we determine if we have a wetland and if we need a permit? Well, wetlands are defined by three characteristics, having wetland vegetation, wetland hydrology, and hydric soils. And these are not just something that we can necessarily look at a photograph and say, yeah, that's a wetland or that's not a wetland. This oftentimes uh, requires the in, in, uh, inclusion of a wetland specialist or an Army Corps of Engineer office to help you determine if your project site is in a wetland. If a proposed facility is would be located in a wetland, you need to provide a copy of the permit from the U.S. Corps of Enge uh, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers permitting the construction. And when you're uh, submitting application materials, if it's not in a wetland, that also needs to be submitted and, or man and maintained for your records. So some of the other things that we'll be talking about today include threatened and endangered species, a little bit of a longer section. The last bullet there talks about the uh, requirement of us to consider threatened and endangered species in our projects. Applicants must determine whether any proposed facilities may affect listed threatened or endangered species or designated critical habitats or are likely to jeopardize the continued existence of proposed threatened or endangered species or designated critical habitats. Uh, applicants are also required to notify the FCC and file an environmental assessment if any of these conditions exist. It's important to consider that both plants and animals are protected by the Endangered Species Act. 
And it's also important, we talked about the shelf life of a NEPA document. Well, oftentimes this, uh, the things change on the endangered species list. Things are delisted, things are added, things are added to candidate species lists. For example, in 2014, the Fish and Wildlife Service added 23 additional species to their candidate species list. So these are things that are constantly fluctuating. The Oregon chub, the Oregon chub, which is a fish, was delisted last year. And uh, the wood stork was downlisted from endangered to threatened. And just recently we added the northern long-eared bat, the red knot, which is a bird, the uh, northern Mexican garter snake, narrowhead garter snake, the western yellow-billed cuckoo, and Gunnison sage grouse were all added as threatened, among other species. So it's important to understand that things are changing and that most Fish and Wildlife Service field offices encourage uh, revisiting the t and &E species list approximately every 90 days. So that is definitely something that you would need to keep updated when you're thinking of the shelf life of a NEPA document. So how do we determine if a t and &E, a, a quickly called nickname t and &E species, is on your proposed facility site? Many of you are familiar with IPAC, the Information Planning and Conservation Tool from the Fish and Wildlife Service. It's fairly uh, new, and they continue to improve it all the time. This tool provides species lists and critical habit de habitat designations for any area that you delineate on their software. This is actually uh, one of the first pages that you come to on the IPAC. And if this looks different than what you're used to, if anyone's been using it previously, it's because in the last two weeks, I think, uh, it has the Fish and Wildlife Service has updated for a slightly different format. But as you can see underneath the, uh, the, the text, there uh, is a, a category where you can delineate your location on the map. Where will your project be? Then you can uh, define the area specifically of that project. And the third step there is to confirm that that is indeed your project area. And then you submit the next to the next slide or to the next uh, window. And this is where you could enter some specific information on your project. And note at the bottom, uh, it's, I do realize that it's a little bit hard to see there, but there is uh, information saying that uh, no designation of project type is currently asked for, and at this time, I believe that that is under development. That, that's a Fish and Wildlife Service uh, area, but I will, in the past, we were able to select communication tower and then move on to the next slide, and now I, 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 I'm not positive where the Fish and Wildlife Service is, is going with this, but I suspect that they are waiting to attach certain different management, different management uh, mitigation techniques to different projects. Therefore, because that's not under development, they're just having us kind of skip over that for now. But I think that that could also be changing. But if you're used to selecting communication tower on this slide or this uh, portion of the software, it's no longer available to select. <laughs> but the output it should still be very uh, comparable to what you would have seen in the past. It, in it looks different, but the information is there. We have a section on endangered species that would be present at that site, migratory birds, this program is still, the software is still just including the birds of conservation concern. There are many more migratory birds that would be protected at the site, but IPAC just focuses on birds of conservation concern. And then uh, we go into wetlands and wildlife refuges as well. So on this particular slide, you can see that there are two bird species that would be considered there. It's very up to date with the red knot being on there as well, as I just mentioned, they were recently added. The piping plover, pitcher thistle is a plant in the area. The endangered Indiana bat is in this area. And eastern Massasauga rattlesnake. At the bottom of the slide, you'll also see it has a, a section for the critical habitats for these species. And I think in this particular site that I was using as an example, there were no critical habitats. IPAC is also nice because it provides National Wetlands Inventory information, re and this particular site has a riverine uh, wetland de uh, delineated in the uh, project area that I used as an example. So IPAC is very helpful. It should be up to date. 
and is constantly imp improving and uh, is, is your direct link to the Fish and Wildlife Service. It also provides information for the field office that you should be interacting with for your particular project. Okay, so what happens if you, uh, w as you do your endangered species review? Well, if you have listed uh, or proposed threatened or endangered species, designated critical habitats, if they're present in your action area, and, uh, in a, 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 but these the species would not be affected by your proposed antenna ex structure, that would be the time to explain how you uh, came to that determination, for example, IPAC and why you believe that there would be no effect on, this, uh, on these particular species from your project. And this is information that you would be including in an environmental assessment if you were uh, providing one. Okay, if the proposed antenna structure may affect but is not likely to adversely affect, I believe I skipped ahead there. For the first se section, if there are no species, document that. For this slide, if the proposed antenna structure may affect but is not likely to adversely affect, then you would need to provide a <laughs> I think I'm, I'm confusing myself. I'll just read the slide for this one until I get back on track. <laughs> if the proposed antenna structure may affect, but is not likely to adversely affect listed or proposed threatened or endangered species or designated proposed critical habitats in the action area, that is the time to provide a letter from the Fish and Wildlife Service concurring with the applicant's informal biological assessment. If any measures are proposed to mitigate any effects on species or habitats, the assessment must outline those measures with the Fish and Wildlife Service concurrence. I have an example down there of the Indiana bat. If anyone's working in Kentucky on some projects, uh, that field office, uh, almost with every project, requires people to enter into a to an HCP with, this, with the Fish and Wildlife Service for any potential impacts to Indiana bat. Okay, if endangered species are present and if the proposed antenna structure may affect and is likely to adversely affect listed or proposed species, that is the time to prepare a formal biological assessment and the applicant should provide that formal biological assessment to the FCC for formal consultation with the Fish and Wildlife Service. So in review, protected species are not present. Maintain that relevant documentation, such as the IPAC output. If protected species are present but not affected, include a determination by the Fish and Wildlife Service or another qualified biologist. If they're present but not likely to adversely affect protected species, that is a time to receive or to uh, talk with the Fish and Wildlife Service and get concurrence on your conclusion. If your project is likely to adversely affect protected species, that is the time to work with the Fish and Wildlife Service on an incidental take statement. So moving on to migratory birds. It's estimated that 4 million to 50 million birds fatalities occur at communication towers every year in the United States. That's a wide range. Uh, most recent research has suggested that is about uh, 6.8 million in, the can in Canada and the U.S. every year. Almost all of these are considered, almost all of these fatalities are considered violations of the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. So what makes these birds vulnerable to collisions with communications towers? Well, these birds migrate at night. <clears throat> Their vision is not a whole lot better than ours is at night. They're typically active during the day, but during migration season they become active at night <clears throat> after sundown. They're migrating thousands of miles, some of them, from the boreal forests down to Mexico, Central America, some even South America. For example, the red knot, which I mentioned I think twice in this presentation, is a shorebird, probably about the size of my fist and a half. And he uh, migrates long distances every year. There was one particular bird that was banded, and a researcher real, uh, determined it had migrated so many times in its lifespan that it had migrated as far as the moon and back. These are long distances. He didn't do it all in one trip, but he, uh, he every year after year. And not only is, are these grueling uh, 
adventures to be going on, these migration, but it's also important that when you're dealing with something that's this, that's this small and flying over the Gulf of Mexico or any other challenging landscape to fly over, when you get to the other side, you need to eat. And so stopovers are important along the entire migration pathway for any of these migratory birds. So how do they do these long distance migrations? They don't have GPS units or blackberries. They use magnetic fields of the Earth. They use star constellations or stellar constellations, which if you think about it, they move throughout the night. So at 10 p.m., you pick up and you start flying north or south, and you're using stellar constellations, but these stellar constellations are moving throughout the night, which means you need to content continuously adjust for that. They, need, they also use polarization of the light along the horizons. Sunrise and sunset will help them get back on track if they get really off course. And some birds are using landmarks also in some of their uh, final identification of where they are. And these, these birds are migrating f all of these distances and then returning sometimes to the exact same nest site in the exact same shrub. It's, it's very impressive. And all of this is programmed in their DNA. Also, proteins, they're amazing. So what species of birds are likely to collide with communications towers? Who are these night migrating birds? Well, most of them are songbirds, tend to be small birds, when you think of songbirds. They include vireos, warblers, thrushes, sparrows, tanagers. So the small birds, not necessarily the birds you'd see at your bird feeders, but oftentimes hear them singing around your house. They tend to eat insect insects or insectivores. Shorebirds, such as the red knot, I've mentioned now I think four times, uh, they, they also collide with communications towers and waterfowl as well. Any bird can collide with communication tower, however, except maybe penguins. But, um, <laughs> but, but it is, uh, it, it, but the songbirds are more likely to collide with these structures. So what are some of the variables when, you know, we don't always see bird collisions at every single communication tower every night. That is definitely not the case. What variables contribute to whether we're going to see birds colliding with communications towers? Weather is an important variable to consider. And these, the visibility of, if the visibility is low, such as uh, fog or snowstorms sometimes even in the north, and rainstorms, that low, those low visibility conditions can not only decrease the ability of the birds to navigate, we, we suspect, but also increase their attraction into light. And that is a bit of a mystery as scientists, why they're attracted into lights, but that seems to be a very critical uh, variable during these uh, periods of inclement weather and bird migration. So the location of a tower in the landscape is also an important thing to consider. Some towers are placed in areas that have higher concentrations of birds moving through them. Tower support systems, such as guide or unguide, is an important variable when you're considering whether birds will have be colliding with the structure. Tower height and tower lighting system. We'll go into these last three variables in more detail. This information is based on uh, the FCC PEA and also on some research that I conducted in Michigan, 2003 to 2012. And I, I was going to ask you to ignore the y-axis, but I guess you can't read it anyway. <laughs> that is the number of birds uh, fatalities in general. But I would just like to understand that these are uh, compare the the uh, the graph relative, the bars relative to one another not specifically the details. So the bar on the far left is towers that are uh, unguide. And the, the, tower, the bar in the middle are towers that are guide. Those last the two on the left are uh, both about 470 feet tall. And then the t bar on the far right is our towers over 1,000 feet tall. So, this, so uh, these data are demonstrating that towers with guy wires are involved in significantly more avian fatalities than towers without guy wires. Yes, I said that properly. And this 
table or this figure also demonstrates that towers that are taller are involved in significantly more avian fatalities than shorter towers. Okay, and these towers, you know, when, when you think about the spectrum of towers that are out there, these are all pretty big towers, 500-foot towers and towers over 1,000 feet tall. But it's important to understand that the taller towers with guy wires are involved in significantly more avian fatalities than the shorter unguide structures. Lighting is also an important variable to consider. As I mentioned before, especially in inclement weather, these migratory birds appear to be attracted into non-flashing lights, so lights that don't flash, the steady burning lights. And these, so these lights on communications towers uh, tend to involve more avian fatalities than towers that are not lit with these steady burning lights. We found this to be true at towers over 1,000 feet and also towers that are about a 500-foot height. So this is imp this, a trend held through regardless of the tower height. We actually found a 50, to, we as in the research I did in Michigan, we found a 50 to 70 percent reduction in fatalities by just eliminating these non-flashing red lights. These are the LA tents or the side markers. Those are the lights I'm speaking of. And these are all at night. These are the nighttime conditions. So when you think about a 50 to 70 percent reduction, that equals millions of birds every year that are attracted into these steady burning L810 side markers. Okay, so what do tower operators have as options? Well, we have a white strobe system, uh, the L865 flashing white, and these, by the way, are all based on the FAA advisory circular. We have the L864, L810 option, which is uh, sl style A in this particular slide that includes a steady burning red light. We have style E, the dual system, also includes a steady burning red light. And style F also includes a steady burning red light system. In the past, that's all we had until 2012 when the FAA released their conspicuity study. The conspicuity study is based on the FAA's research looking at what happens if we turn off those steady burning red lights. Why do we have them on the towers to begin with? Uh, and is it safe to, for pilots if we extinguish those side-burning lights? And the FAA did find that indeed it is safe. And now they have released this, uh, 2012, they released the conspicuity study, and we are waiting on pins and needles for the FAA to release their revised advisory circular where they will include that information. But until then, we can still, and people are still changing communication tower lighting systems with the FAA approval. And so I would say that over uh, the time that I've been here in the past uh, two, almost two and a half years, the number of towers, it just keeps every year it practically quadruples on the number of towers that are lit without steady burning red lights. And the FAA it approves those. And I will go through that process in a second. So this is very beneficial because not only can tower operators save money on uh, construction of the tower, they can save money on maintenance, energy costs, and of course migratory birds as well. For those towers that are, and this is the case for towers that are 350 feet and taller, that's an easy fix. And right now the towers that are less than 350 feet lower than that, uh, we, the FAA is suggesting that they can use a s flashing steady burning light. So let me explain that again. That would be a, where the side marker was in the past, where the LA-10 was in the past. There, uh, the FAA is expected to recommend that they use a flashing light there instead, which would have uh, similar positive ramifications for migratory birds, that is decreasing the numbers of collisions. At this point, LEDs provide a nice option for uh, especially new construction and, and for, re, uh, for retrofitting existing towers because they can be programmed, as many of you know, to do just about anything. Okay, so there's a handout on the table over there. And Myra, I think that there are plenty. Myra's been great about getting these handouts prepared. And, uh, and it gives you the details on how to, exchange, how to change the lighting systems on both existing towers and new towers. And that is one of the great things about this 
situation is that we can change the towers that are exist currently on the landscape, the ones that are involved in the millions of, of bird collisions every year. We, it's for new towers and for existing towers. It, once we go through this process that I'll just uh, buzz through now, hoping that you'll look at the handout in more detail, once you go through that process, a person doesn't even typically have to even uh, climb the tower. It can be done from the technical uh, house underneath the tower, the shed. Sometimes it can even be done remotely with some of the tower uh, systems that we have available now. So I encourage you to, uh, to look at the handout now, to share it with friends, to spread it everywhere. And, uh, but the first step would be to work with the FAA and to file a marking and lighting study electronically with the FAA. It's their form 7460-1. And that will allow you to select, uh, the, designate the structure type, deviation from red obstruction light standards. That would be your first step. Once the FAA has approved the request and assigned an FAA study number, at that point, you can work with RFCC staff and file an e-support request. And that's, this is what we're doing until the FAA uh, revises and releases its revised advisory circular. So uh, once you have submitted your e-support request and the, you work with the FCC to verify uh, your FAA records and receive an FCC record confirming that the FAA study has been updated, at that point you can get onto our ASR and change your... Um, make a modification to update the lighting to option three, other, and provide a description of uh, your lighting system, such as style E with red light deviation. Okay, and once you've worked with the FCC, and if you have any problems with that, Diane Dupert and, uh, and Jonathan are excellent people to discuss some of your challenges with, your lighting challenges, that is. Let's see, I still have some more slides. There we go, let me go back. Okay, once you have done that, at that point, uh, we, we, can de we can extinguish those steady burning uh, side marker lights or those L810s. And as I mentioned, this can be done from the ground. No tower climbing is typically required. And if you're building a new tower, the tower lights don't even need to be installed on the structure. So you're saving uh, construction costs as well. Okay, so regarding migratory birds, uh, some of our po policies here at the FCC or some of our approaches, we have uh, towers over 450 feet age, uh, above ground level, preparing environmental assessments, and including sections specifically addressing potential migratory bird impacts and your efforts to reduce those impacts. Those could be things like tower lights, building lights, bird flight diverters. So building lights, I just mentioned building lights. We talked about birds being attracted into steady burning lights at night. The same is likely true and has been shown at stadiums and cruise ships and oil platforms that any kind of steady burning light can attract in migratory birds. So this makes it extra important to be using, uh, to be using motion sensor lights or no lighting at all on your outbuildings underneath communications towers. And most people are using motion sensor lights already. But this is very important. It also is important to uh, seek comment from the Fish and Wildlife Service on migratory birds, no steady burning red lights, and again, motion sensor lighting or no lighting on your buildings. For those towers that are 350 to 450 feet, okay, so we're still within, we, we don't need to necessarily, uh, this does not, I will say, this does not trigger, the height of this tower does not trigger a migratory bird EA. There may be other reasons why you're doing an EA, but in this situation, you wouldn't necessarily have to do an EA for migratory birds, but uh, it is still possible to light the tower without your red steady lights on the side. As I mentioned, it's for 350 feet and taller. And again, motion sensor detecting light uh, outside and the outbuildings is highly recommended. And that can be done at any height tower, 100 foot tower. So the next topic is on bald eagles and golden eagles. Bald eagles and other raptors, 
and some other raptors are protected by the Bald and Golden Eagle Protection Act, or BGEPA, the Migratory Bird Treaty Act, and some state protection as well. I also want to point out that eagles are not necessarily uh, included in your IPAC output. So eagles are kind of falling through the cracks a little bit with the IPAC approach because it, any nests would not necessarily be included in IPAC. And you would need to in, uh, look into other databases. And uh, contacting the Fish and Wildlife Service would be a good first step and your, the state or local uh, go, uh, natural resources governments agencies. So in addition to, uh, to any Fish and Wildlife Service guidelines that you might uh, approach with, the, with nest bu buffers, you may also want to consider this information. Well, for one, the number of nests on towers is increasing. This is mainly true for bald eagles and ospreys. There are a lot of, of uh, eagle and osprey nests, especially in Florida and uh, I think along the, uh, in Seattle and in some of those areas. So we need to be aware of that. And if there are any nests on the towers that you're trying to maintain, it's important to contact the Fish and Wildlife Service or other state natural resources agency before any construction or maintenance activities on the tower take place. This may require permits and definitely a timing uh, consideration. When the birds are on the nests in a sensitive period, sometimes these structures are not even able to be approached. If a person or a tower owner wants to uh, minimize the likelihood of that happening, nest exclusion devices can be used. And uh, I would work with the Fish and Wildlife Service on that and, and your, uh, your technical people as well. Some of them work better than others, and they're always in development as well. Another thing to consider is that raptors be can become entangled in antenna wires uh, that are part of the tower itself or in, uh, in twine that is oftentimes brought to the nest. Ospreys are notorious for bringing baling twine from farming operations to their nest, incorporating it into their nest, but then having issues with in, uh, young and adults becoming entangled. And uh, this is obviously not a good situation. So it's important to minimize access wires and securely attach wires to the tower. I encourage you to work with your technical people on this and how to, how to successfully do this. Uh, sh shrink wrap might work. I'm not sure. I'm not a tower person. I'm concerned that over time it would weather. Uh, but somehow, maybe conduit, something, these tower t wires need to be more securely attached to the tower structure to avoid uh, places where birds could become entangled. If you do see a situation where birds are entangled on a communication tower, it's important to contact the state natural resources agencies or the Fish and Wildlife Service. If anyone is working in uh, Southern California and uh, Nevada, I believe, where we have the range of the California condor, this is particularly Im important. We just had a workshop with the BLM and Forest Service, and they have very specific rules about uh, micro trash, I think is what they call it, micro trash, which includes anything, uh, anything small and able to be picked up by a California condor uh, that needs to be removed from their tower sites. Uh, because California condors tend to ingest these things and bring them back for their youngsters. It's, uh, it's uh, confusing to all of us, but, it's, but it exists. Uh, California condors also tend to become quite comfortable at communication tower sites, walk around, stick their heads in places that probably aren't safe. And uh, so entanglement is a serious con concern for that species. And so these are good uh, approaches for all of our tower sites, but especially in Southern California and, uh, and Nevada where we have California condor. So we've talked about a lot of information today. Wetlands, threatened and endangered species, migratory birds, and then the importance of not using steady burning lights either on your tower or on your buildings. We've talked about avoiding disturbance to uh, nests on towers and contacting the Fish and Wildlife Service, containing loose wires, and avoiding entanglation. A lot of information. And I just encourage you to reach out to me and contact me if you have any questions. Email me. Um, I look forward to any of your thoughts, questions, suggestions, ideas. Do we have any questions in the audience or online? While you're gathering your questions, um, 
Thank you for sending them in to live questions, plural, at scc.gov, because I can't leave well enough alone on Joelle's wetland slides. I'll also remind you that wetlands, in addition to being repositories for mattresses, are also very important archaeological sites that have been used by tribes and also um, other settlers in, into this country because they make good places to hide broken pieces of pottery. Uh, mm -hmm. The tribes use them to, to gather resources. Um, I spent a, a couple weeks wandering through the wetlands in Delaware looking at old uh, work boats that were run up the guts mm -hmm. to, to, to die. And that's a common tradition in, in, in areas where, where they're present. And also with, with the raptors, I've been, been to a couple tribal meetings where the, the presenters who are tribal members, we have our first question, have been talking about very elaborate eagle burials. So eagles are more than just things for us to admire and for, for to be the symbol of the United States. They're also very important to the tribes as well. That, Thank that you for that key? addition. Yeah. Here's a question uh, from Gina Gordon of Environmental uh, uh, Environmental Coordinator with Monte R. Lee and Company. We have many smaller or rural utility clients. When asking if they can switch from guide to non-guide towers, usually under 350 feet, typically the answer is that guide towers are cheaper. How can we best negotiate cost of building while reducing migratory bird deaths? We've used bird diverters in the past. Okay, so she points out that these towers are typically under 350 feet. This is a, this is a good question, and this and sometimes we need to uh, to be creative in these situations. She suggests uh, that they've used bird diverters in the past. We we don't have data on, and I'm aware of uh, the scientific community does not have data looking at the effect of bird flight diverters on decreasing bird collisions on towers. However, there is good solid data on utility lines, electric lines, when I was little we called them phone lines, and uh, we, we have used bird flight diverters on those structures and we have good scientific data that show a significant reduction in bird collisions with those wires. We could use some information on bird flight diverters and the effect on minimizing uh, bird collisions at towers, uh, but we, many Fish and Wildlife Service field offices do recommend them, and I would say that generally the science suggests that they are helpful and useful. So bird flight diverters is a good idea, especially if we're dealing with some potential diurnal or daytime collisions, maybe near a wetland, maybe near uh, endangered species or raptor concentrations where you have birds moving during the day that, that uh, could potentially be impacted by collisions with towers. So bird flight diverters are helpful. I would say that if, if you're unable to build an unguide tower or a non-guide tower and you're not able to extinguish the L810 lights because it's under 350 feet, that this would be a good example of a time to use uh, LED lights and work with the FAA to try to have your side marker lights flashing in concert with your top level of lights as well. Does that make sense? I'm not seeing nodding. Um, okay, <laughs> good. We, had, we saw, said that over 350 feet, we could just extinguish the side markers. Less than 350 feet, we have to make those side markers flash, according to the FAA. So the, and LEDs are the best option for that, from my understanding at this time. So this would be a good opportunity to use those LEDs, have them flash at night, possibly use bird flight diverters, and of course, use motion sensor lights underneath the communication tower. So you're not, if you have to use lights at all on your security building, in your building for security, to minimize the attraction of the site. Uh, to migratory birds. Actually, I said that wrong. The site would not be attracted to migratory <laughs> birds. Have birds attracted to the site? <laughs> yes. Uh, Elvin Windy Boy, uh, Chippewa Creek Tribe, Rock, Blue, Montana. Is there such a creature that exists within FCC, whether it be a PA or or some agreement with, say, Department of Energy, out in Montana and Wyoming? That area, we're seeing a lot of uh, 
wind towers. This communications device, is that something that could also be rendered with those facilities for Eagle, both Boulder, uh, Golden and Bald? I'm not sure if I'm understanding the question. So are you asking, could... Um, this device that you just talked about. Oh, the bird, bird flight diverters. Right. Okay. Is there such a, an agreement within FCC and DOE, as an example, that would potentially require, I don't necessarily require, but request that this device be a part of that structure? Because we're, we're looking at 100,000 acres of, of wind towers that potentially could affect uh, migratory uh, uh, migratory uh, bird uh, routes. Mm -hmm. The FCC does not typically work on wind energy projects uh, unless there's communication tower or some other uh, nexus there. Uh, and but the bird flight diverters are uh, are actually their little um, they can be diversity of things. They they have uh, just big balls that they can put on guy wires, and we have these little twirly gig things that attach on to uh, to the guy wires, and that actually allows. We believe that it. Uh, scientists believe that it allows birds to actually see the guy wires so that they can fly around them during the day, which can be helpful for eagles and other and other large birds uh, who fly during the day. So sometimes, uh, from my knowledge of working um, when I worked with Michigan State University, we worked on wind energy projects, and those wind energy the turbines do not tend to have guy wires. Now there are oftentimes uh, met towers or meteorological monitoring towers as part of a wind project which monitors uh, the wind consistency strength throughout the year and those met towers almost always have guy wires and many of which do not have bird flight diverters on them so I guess I'm trying to bring um, I'm trying to make sure I'm understanding your question and answering it properly I don't know of any uh, plans of the FCC to require bird flight diverters, but oftentimes the Fish and Wildlife Service will recommend it for individual towers. Did that answer your question, or at least partially? Yeah, yes, no, I'll get the answer. <laughs> <laughs> I'm one of those nosy Cree Indians. <laughs> well, let's, we can talk afterward as well. Let's see if I can help. Are there, are there other questions? Uh, say, okay. Um, we often get the question about uh, wind turbines at, at this agency because we're in charge of tall things, uh, but we're not in charge of wind turbines. And actually one of the issues that often arises is that wind turbine farms don't have any federal involvement. And so there's, there's not a lot that we can do as, as federal officials at the SEC to get involved in that. And there have been proposals to put communications gear on some of the wind turbines themselves, but I understand that the vibration of the turbines interferes with the communications equipment. Um, but that's an engineer's question. So, um, if there are no questions for no other questions for Joelle, you feel free to ask her. She'll be here all day. Um, we have a, a. Do you have a? Just one something quick I wanted to say. Okay. Uh, okay. Well, why don't you say that, and we'll talk oh. about a break. Okay. Um, I just wanted to quickly, before we go on to break, I had introduced a few new people on the team before, and I also wanted to add to that one Kim, who has actually been in the division for many years, but has started working recently much more on infrastructure matters. Um, this is an environmental workshop, so we're not focusing on Section 6409, which governs local regulation, but Juan is expert on that, but has also been working on some of our environmental matters recently. So um, she's around as well, and as, as we're all on break, we'll all be, you know, available over lunch and so on to, you know, meet with folks. So just wanted to introduce everyone. And, and in that spirit, yeah, the SEC staff tends to be over here. Um, don't forget... Uh, Myra in the corner because she helps with a lot of our logistics and has a background in, in environmental compliance. And then Don Johnson is the attorney that I work with most often. He's hiding back in the other corner. 
Um, so we're all here to answer questions. We have a break scheduled now. Um, we're doing very well about keeping on time. Um, it's we're five minutes behind schedule, which is pretty good for us. So why don't you be back in your room, back in your seats at five after eleven? So we'll do the fifteen minute break, um, and then we'll get started with um, the DAS and small cells uh, presentation with um, Jeff and, and Jill Springer. Hey. hey. Back here in 15 minutes. If you all could take your seats, please. There she is. I probably said it was I can't see the slides. Okay. That's okay. Um, Let's get started, and we'll we'll move on to um, further adventures in environmental compliance. Um, the next session is um, one on DAS and small cells, and um, Jeff introduced Jill earlier as, as my deputy. She's been, you've been here since October, and I I can't tell you how happy I am to have somebody to talk to. <laughs> um, we keep on getting more and more projects. I'll just make this real quick. In last last calendar year, we handled 17,000 projects. Some of those are rare PTC projects, but the year before that, we had 14,000 projects. The workload keeps on increasing. You keep on building new towers, new facilities, and so it's it's nice to have a, a another um, preservation uh, person to be able to handle all this work. And so, um, with that, I'm going to let Jill and Jeff talk about DAS and small cells and um, We'll keep on, on track. Jill? Um, just a moment before um, before Jill starts in, I was introducing, and Steve was introducing people on the staff before. Um, Irene Griffith is also over here. A lot of you have worked with her on your applications and EA, so I wanted to introduce her as well. OK. Um, hello. Um, I, as Steve mentioned, I joined the commission in October of 2014, and we're going to be talking today about something else that happened in October of 2014, which is the um, infrastructure order. Um, I actually, previous to that, was became familiar both with Steve and working with Jeff um, and the FCC when um, I worked for Department of Commerce and NTA. NTIA as the Federal Preservation Officer on some Recovery Act um, broadband projects, the Broadband Technology Opportunity Project. And one of the things that happened um, um, in that experience was NTIA, Rural Utility Service, and FEMA were all able to take advantage of the National Programmatic Agreement for Towers and the Co-Location Agreement um, and the great TCNS system through some efficiencies that were created with a program comment. And um, that kind of support and the kind of, uh, of structure that FCC has put together for environmental compliance, particularly for Section 106, is something that I became very um, appreciative of when I was at NTIA. Um, so in terms of more support for broadband, um, in October, the uh, new rules that were adopted that streamline environmental requirements for distributed antenna systems and small cells, something that um, we are all excited about. And I realize that I don't have the clicker, which is over there. <laughs> Um, so, as Steve mentioned, I'm a historic preservationist, so you all, I'm sure, know more about small cells than I do. Um, small cells take traditional cellular architecture down to a more granular level. Um, cell radius has, um, a cell radius is hundreds of feet or less. These are suited both for outdoor and large indoor spaces. Sometimes small cells are used to fill small gaps in coverage or supplement service in limited areas of high demand. And distributed antenna systems take the concept a step further. Distributed antenna systems are integrated systems of many small antennas that are con connected by fiber. There's a base station transceiver that can serve several nodes 
Neutral host technology lets multiple carriers share the same antennas and other facilities. Outdoor DAS is commonly located on streetlights or utility poles. And indoor DAS applications include stadiums, hotels, shopping malls, and office buildings. So there are a lot of advantages to this smaller infrastructure and technology. Um, it expands the capacity for coverage by many multiples, um, obviates the need to keep splitting cells as demand increases. It creates capacity for high-speed high broadband data services, improves indoor coverage. Um, it's an opportunity to share infrastructure, but it's not economically feasible in all circumstances. Um, typically, uh, it's used as a supplement and not to replace an existing macrocell network. So what we're talking about um, in terms of October 2014, the infrastructure rules are meant to improve environmental reviews um, and to remove unnecessary obstacles to the siting of facilities that are needed for broadband. It, in terms of the environmental implications, we're going to be talking about the National Envo Environmental Policy Act NEPA review. There are some new and expanded categorical exclusions under the um, infrastructure order. The National Historic Preservation Act review, some new exclusions there, and then a, an exclusion for the environmental notification for temporary towers, um, the ASR notification. So the first set of um, exclusions we're going to talk about are NEPA exclusions. These um, cover co-locations on structures other than buildings and towers. Um, these might be poles, uh, water towers. These are now considered categorical exclusions for NEPA, except for effects on historic properties and radio frequency emissions exposure. Um, in that sense, this is a NEPA exclusion. It's not a Section 106 exclusion. So while the co-location agreement might you, you might have a circumstance where the co-location agreement applies for Section 106. That's not an assumption that you should make. You should make the assumption that um, you need to check that because tribal consultation and Section 106 may still be required. The definition of an antenna is also clarified um, as not just including the antenna itself. The uh, new rules specified that the wiring, the cabling, the cabinets, and backup power should be considered part of an antenna as far as um, the application of the categorical exclusion. And then finally, uh, there was a clarification that the existing NEPA categorical exclusion for mounting antennas on existing buildings also applies to installations in the interior of existing buildings. So there's an image here, which um, may be a little bit difficult to see. Um, the categorical exclusion for co-locations on towers and buildings is broadened and now applies to utility poles. The illustration shows um, uh, infrastructure on a utility pole. It also applies to water towers and other man-made structures. And the categorical exclusion includes equipment like power cabinets, cabling, and wiring. And in this particular illustration, you can see um, a power cabinet that's beneath the um, main antenna structure. A second very significant categorical exclusion area is the categorical exclusions for deployment of wireless facilities on new or, or replacement poles that are within designated active utility and communication rights of way. And that applies if there is no substantial increase in size over the existing uses that are within that right of way. So again, the requirements. Um, the facility will be located in right-of-way that's designated by a federal, state, local, or tribal government for communication towers, above-ground utility transmission or distribution lines, or any associated structures and equipment. The right-of-way must be in active use for these designated purposes, 
and the facility will not constitute a substantial increase in size over the existing support structures that are already located in the right-of-way within the vicinity of the proposed construction. So this also is not an exclusion for Section 106. It's a categorical exclusion for NEPA. So you do need to check to see whether Section 106 review is still required. Um, and associated tribal participation should not be assumed not to be required as well. If this is, does not meet the exclusion that's within the NPA, then 106 um, review and tribal participation is required. The um, infrastructure is also subject to 1.1307C and D of the FCC rules, and based on that, there could still be an environmental assessment triggered um, if the processing bureau or public complaints um, results in an issue that we feel needs to be explored in that way. An EA can also be required if radio frequency emission exposure exceeds specified levels. And in terms of no substantial increase in size over existing uses, the definition for substantial increase in size is drawn from the co-location programmatic agreement. Many people are familiar with that. Can't increase the height by more than 10 percent or 20 feet. It's got to have a standard number of cabinets not to exceed four. No appurtenances that protrude more than 20 feet or beyond the width of the structure at the level added if that is greater. And there can be no excavation beyond the existing leased or owned property surrounding the structure or the right-of-way easement near the structure. So there's another set of exclusions that does apply to Section 106 and the National Historic Preservation Act. Um, this covers certain co-locations on utility structures, including utility poles and electronic transmission towers from Section 106 review. To qualify as exempt, these co-locations must meet specif specified size and other limitations. So these requirements are there can be no new ground disturbance, can not, not be within a historic district or within 250 feet of a historic district boundary. Co-location cannot be located on a designated National Historic Landmark or a property that is listed or determined eligible for listing in the National Register of Historic Places and cannot be subject of a pending complaint alleging adverse effects on historic properties. Co-location on buildings and non-tower structures over 45 years old are now excluded from what Section 106 review if an antenna already exists at the proposed location. Um, to qualify for this, the new antenna must meet requirements related to visibility and proximity to the existing antenna. Um, it must also comply with any zoning and or historic preservation conditions that apply to the existing antenna. Once again, there can be no new ground disturbance associated with this co-location. Co-location cannot be within a historic district or within 250 feet of a historic district boundary, not located on a designated National Historic Landmark or property that is listed or has been determined eligible for listing in the National Register, and cannot be subject of a pending complaint alleging adverse effects on historic properties. And then finally, with respect to Section 106 exclusions, there was a clarification that the existing exclusion for co-location on buildings um, that are in the NPA and the co-location PA also apply to co-locations inside buildings. Um, the final aspect of the infrastructure order that has specific environmental ramifications has to do with a new ASR notification exemption for temporary towers. Um, it's new in the sense that it's been made permanent. It was a, a temporary um, exemption that had applied. 
um, and it is now permanent. So local and national environmental notification requirements that are associated with application for antenna structure registration um, are now lifted for temporary towers, provided that the tower will be in place for 60 days or less, that FAA notice of construction is required, that there's no FAA required marking or lighting, that the tower is less than 200 feet above ground level, and that it either involves no excavation or excavation only where the depth of previous disturbance exceeds the proposed construction depth by at least two feet. So basically it's not new ground disturbance. Um, previous disturbance has already happened in that location. And then just a note that this is not um, a categorical exclusion. If this temporary tower location um, warrants an EA or an EA is otherwise required, then public notice would be required associated with the environmental assessment. So uh, it was also made clear in October that while this is a great step in streamlining um, environmental reviews, we do want to explore going further. Um, and we are in consultation now with the Council, Council on Environmental Quality, the, advi advi wow, the Advisory Council on Historic Preservation, State Historic Preservation Officers, and Tribal Nations um, to determine broader exclusions and additional efficiencies for environmental review of DAS networks and other small facilities. Um, the goal, the immediate goal, is a program alternative to further streamline Section 106 review for DAS and small cell deployments. And we have the schedule goal um, of accomplishing this within 18 to 24 months after the release of the report in order. Um, just leave with a couple of illustrations of DAS and small cell and um, open it up both to folks in the room and who are watching the webinar for any questions. And again, the reminder for those um, on the web that you email questions to livequestions at FCC.gov and we'll, we'll pick those up. Um, again, if you're either in the room or on the web, if you can identify who you are and who you're affiliated with. Hi, Jeff. This is Tony Trainee with Sprint. Um, a question's come up a number of times on uh, when applying the 45-year-old exclusion that exists, um, specifically proximity to historic districts. Is when when you're applying the 250-foot um, uh, directional or, or proximity um, paradigm, do you use the building or do you use the antenna? In other words, are you measuring 250 feet from the antenna placement or 250 feet from the building the antenna rests upon? I mean, oftentimes a building might take up an entire city block, which could be 150 feet or more. And if you're at one end of the building in the historic districts, you know, at the other end of the building, um, that could, that in fact, not infrequently comes into play. Hmm. That, that, that's a good question. Um, haven't really thought about that one. Um, I guess the... Um, the NPA, if, which I don't have it in front of me, but I, I, it's really more an NPA question than, than a new rules question. Um, it talks about, um, is really focused on the deployment. So, so right offhand, I would probably say the better answer is it's where the antenna is. Um, but... difficult to kind of discern one or the other. Okay, well that's, I, I guess that's an interesting question then. Um, we can try to take that back and, and, and see if we can give you a clear answer to that. Okay, thanks. Yeah, Owen Stromer from uh, Network Building Consulting. I've actually got two questions. Uh, first of all, what constitutes an existing antenna? Would a microwave dish that's being used by the uh, current owner or landowner uh, constitute as an antenna? Um, okay, an antenna, well, um, 
I, I guess that anything that if we would, well, certainly anything we would license, I suppose, would be an antenna. Um, now, these are uh, a receive-only microwave dish. I mean, logically, is certainly it's, I mean, it would, it would be the same in terms of, of its effects, um, but it wouldn't necessarily have, um, you know, gone through our NEPA review the same way, so, um, or, or come under that. So, um, we'll, we'll, we'll try to look at that and give you a better answer on that, too. Okay, and when you talk about ground disturbance, uh, can you define that more? Um, ground disturbance essentially would be anything that constitutes um, new excavation. Um, if it's already been been dug up before, and, and you know, for instance, if it's something's already paved over, and you're just within the pavement that's that's already been laid, and not digging beneath it, that would not be new new ground disturbance. But but pretty much anything that involves, you know, digging into the soil that's there um, would be ground disturbance. Hi, Jeff. Um, Jackie Payette from ERM. I have a question for you about um, the small cell exclusion that applies only on utility poles. If there is a utility pole that does carry power and it also happens to have a light on it, I know that the exclusion specifically excludes anything that is considered a light fixture. So how about a utility pole that also carries a light? Um. I think if if it's a if it's a utility pole, then then it's a utility pole, and and if it happens to have a light on it, that that wouldn't stop it from being a utility pole. So so if it's a utility pole, it would come under the exclusion. This is a question from Darlene Malloy at AT&T. You mentioned many times that Section 106 and Tribal Review are not automatically categorical, categorically excluded. Can you speak to what type of situations where Section 106 Tribal Review would be excluded as it applies to this new streamlined ruling? So the answer would be if it's already covered in the National Programmatic Agreement or the co-location agreement, if it's established within those documents as exclusions, then you would cross-reference that to confirm that 106 review and tribal consultation requirements did not apply. Anything else? Are there any other questions? I, actually, I, when we put the agenda together, I thought that this would generate at least a half an hour of questions. <laughs> but, okay. Very good. Um, okay, we'll we'll move on. Uh, we actually picked up a few minutes, which is good. Um, the next session is is primarily me talking, and I'll give Jill her name tag back. Uh, and Jill's going to stay here since we, we talk together and we share these things um, frequently. Thanks, Jeff. Um, this next session before we do our lunch break is loosely titled, and it continues it again to after lunch, it's uh, Special Problems and Solutions. And what this is in many respects, especially this particular half hour, are things that have come across my desk, either as questions or um, items that have frustrated me that I felt I needed to share with you all so that these don't continue to frustrate me or Jill. Um, and, and, and also, you know, while it's in some respects it's self-serving, it also, uh, a lot of these items frustrate the tribes and the shippos. And, and 
I've referred to the tribes of Shippos before as our preservation partners. One of the unique aspects of the MPA is that of those 17,000 projects that um, the FCC was engaged in last calendar year, very few of them actually came before Jill and myself. Uh, we deal with adverse effects. We deal with the, all the questions that everybody has. Um, but the actual projects that have no issues go right through the review process with the SHPOs and tribes. But there are certain things that you need to do in order to make sure that that continues to be a smooth process. And um, the f number one thing I have on my list this particular year is the Section 106 qualifications. Um, I know a lot of you who do tower reviews tend to send somebody with a college degree um, and some experience to the SHPO offices to gather their information, to look at their databases, to go through their paper files depending on what, what the state is. Not all states have electronic databases you can search remotely from, from 30 states away. Sometimes you actually need to go there. Um, and in many respects, you actually need to check with the, with the states because not all state databases are accurate and up-to-date. I've, I've been in a number of state offices over the years where um, they've got a year or two's worth of survey documentation, national register nominations that are sitting in a, in a cardboard box on a floor waiting to go into the, the uh, data system that will let you access it. So you need to check and make sure that the SHPO's electronic database is accurate and up-to-date. And if there's a time lag, it's incumbent upon um, you as the consultant representing the FCC. Uh, there is a delegation letter, so you're, you're there at the SHPO's office or working with the tribe as my agent, as Jill's agent. Um, and we, we take um, inappropriate behavior very seriously. So um, one of those inappropriate behaviors is when you try to have someone go beyond just the data collecting, but to actually make determinations of effect. Determinations of effect, the effect of your tower project on an historic property, on a house, a farmstead, a tribal site, need to be undertaken by a qualified individual. By and large, architects are not qualified individuals to, that can do cultural resource management determinations of effect unless there's something special about their particular skill set, their training and education that gives them that qualification. The same thing with archaeologists. Archaeologists tend to um, look at things that are below the surface, below the ground. Archaeological sites. Um, very few archaeologists have the the proper training experience to look at a building and say that's a, a early 19th century uh, federal building with some um, colonial revival highlights or it's been altered or to pick out those fine points. You, you know, it's, that's, that's the language that I grew up with as an architectural historian and as a historian. Um, so it's important that you stick to the proper qualifications. Archaeologists do the groundwork. They do the archaeology that, that may be necessary at, at a tower site. Um, and the tower site is not just the tower, but it's also the access road. It's any kind of power, conduit, um, electricity that needs to go to the particular site. So it's a whole package of things. It's not just the tower site. Um, in some respect, in some cases, depending on where you are, it may be the fence posts that you're putting up. They need to be examined for their effects. That kind of work is done by an archaeologist. Um, it is not work that can be done by an architectural historian. Um, conversely, adverse effects to historic districts, to landscapes, tend to be done by architectural historians and historians. There are some archaeologists that have backgrounds sufficient and education sufficient that they can do landscape studies and look at a landscape that's important to a SHPO or to a tribe and say, yes, this tower has no adverse effect to um, this particular landscape that is a, a good farm setting from the, the 1930s and eligible for the National Register because of that. Um, so it's a, some of it's situational, but by and large, you need to have the archaeologists do archaeology, below ground work, and then historians and architectural historians do the above ground work. 
the same is, does not necessarily apply to the tribes. The tribal store preservation officers have been appointed by their, their tribal governments, and a lot of them have professional training. There are, they are archaeologists, they are historians, they're ethnographers, they're anthropologists, but they, the tribe has determined as a sovereign nation that they have the proper qualifications to represent them in the Section 106 process and uh, to be keepers for the tribe's traditional knowledge so that you need to respect the office of the tribal store preservation officer or the cultural resource office, whatever the tribe tends to call that, they have, have been given the responsibility to do the identification. So if a, if a, a, a THA, THPO, to use that shorthand to cover all the, the tribal historic offices, cultural resource offices, um, says to you that this is a plant gathering area, you need to take that as for what it is. Um, and I've, I've repeated this several times at several of these, these kinds of gatherings. Um, I've been at field visits where an archaeologist working for a tower, a, a commercial carrier, and I think in both cases, has said there's not a site here. And we've been with tribal members, tribal store preservation officers, and they said, well, you're, you're saying that in the middle of a prayer ring, and there's a burial behind you. The tribes know what their sites look like, and you need to respect their ability to identify their sites and to know what their sites are. Um, that kind of expertise to, comes from their association with the tribe, but it also is something that's been acknowledged both by the National Park Service and by the Advisory Council on Historic Preservation. That segues into tribal areas of interest. I know that's a big topic for a lot of folks here. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a big deal for the tribes. One of the things that everybody needs to recognize is the tribes are where they are for the most part, not voluntarily. They were moved to those locations by um, the federal government. They're there because they were placed there. And I just just the other day I got a question from um, a company wanting to know why they, they were in Oklahoma and wanted to know why they had to consult with a, another tribe in Oklahoma because they didn't think that that tribe was ever where they were. No. It's not, not how it goes. It's not your feeling about where you think the tribe should be. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I got a question from somebody who's doing a tower in the Ohio River Valley. They wanted to know why a tribe from Miami was interested in their site. Well, it wasn't Miami, Florida. It was Miami, Ohio. The tribes have been around. Um, tribal traditional territories are quite extensive because they moved in their own migration path through through the country before uh, Europeans came here, before the uh, the Spanish were here, uh, before the Vikings, if you want to do do that kind of thing, um, uh, they they had their own territories. Um, they moved also because of intertribal wars, conflicts. So um, a lot of the tribes can trace ancestry, and ancestry often means village sites and burials two areas that are far removed from their current locations. So you need to re respect those self-identified de self designations that are in TCNS, in the Tower Construction Notification System. That's the tribe saying where they were. If you have questions, um, best not to call the tribe and say, you're in Oklahoma, why are you interested in something in, in Nebraska? If you have that kind of question, call me or call Jill and will help you understand uh, why it is the way it is. Now, we've also been asking the tribes when they can and they feel comfortable with that, putting on a website, maybe on their, their cultural preservation office's uh, page of the website, information about their tribal history and why they are where they are, what their areas of interest are, why they they're, were it, are interested in the Ohio River Valley, why they're interested in sites in um, the Carolina Mountains when they're in Oklahoma, uh, why they're interested in sites um, in the Great Lakes when they're in Montana. There's a reason for that, and it's a, it, it's a very legitimate reason. So if you have those kinds of questions, call, call Joe or myself, and we'll, we'll take care of that. Um, the other thing I wanted to talk about uh, as we do this 
is um, survey. One of the unique aspects of the NPA, the Nationwide Programmatic Agreement, is that it does not require additional survey work except to identify and to work with the tribes on sites that are important to them. So that one of the reasons why you're going to the State Historic Preservation Offices, going to um, their online systems, is that all, it's all you're required to. You're, you're required to identify existing and known historic properties. Those things that are already listed on the National Register of Historic Places, those things that have been determined listed on the National Register of Historic Places. I know that some SHPOs try to ask you to do new survey and evaluations. That's not really what our rules say. And, and um, as the Federal Preservation Officer, I would discourage you from doing those kinds of things because that's not what our rules say. Um, and if, again, if there are questions, call me and, and we'll have a discussion with the, the particular State Historic Preservation Office to make sure that they understand the exact parameters under which you're working. Um, you know, the industry worked real hard and we've worked real hard with industry to, to have everybody understand what it is that we're actually looking for. Um, I know sometimes in local zoning uh, situations, somebody will pop up and say, I've got an old house. I, I, need, I need you to consider my old house in the zoning process. Well, one, we're not involved in that zoning process. The other is that if they go to the State Historic Preservation Office, then um, they may say again, I've got an old house. I need you to be uh, paying attention to me. Um, if it's not already listed on the National Register or evaluated for the, for the National Register or in the process of being listed on the National Register, then that's not something that anybody has to consider unless there's some extraordinary reason. And we like to be involved, Jill and I like to be involved in those extraordinary circumstances. So if you're getting involved in those kinds of discussions, let us know. I know we're busy and sometimes it takes a day or two to return phone calls, um, but we, we will do that. Um, emails work best for me um, so that I have, I have a record, I can see what it is that you're, you're, you're asking and think about how to, to do that um, rather than, than being caught on the spot so I can compose my answers. It's one of the, the benefits of working with lots of attorneys for all these years is that I've learned to, to think about what I'm saying before I answer my questions. Um, for, this, for the survey on tribal lands, the um, section, the Form 620 has a particular section and it's on there for the reason that you need to, to tell the tribes where your project is and you, you need to get information from them if there are sites that they're aware of that are not on the SHPO's database. And that's one of the reasons why we really strongly uh, insist, which I think is a good word, we do insist that you fully complete the tribal engagement and um, working with the tribal pre store preservation offices before you go to construction. It's, it is not a pleasant experience for anybody involved for you to start construction of a tower and for a tribe to say, well, we tried to tell you we had a site there. Um, that's, that's not a, the position you want to find yourselves in. So you need to complete that tribal process beforehand. And again, Jill and I will help you with that. Um, the other person that helps you with that, and unfortunately she couldn't be here today, is Anne-Marie Vibieski, who's in our Gettysburg office. A lot of you know Anne-Marie, uh, even if you can't pronounce her last name. Um, she had a family obligation, otherwise she, she'd have been here early this morning. Um, and you'd have even more water, because uh, you would have brought her own. Uh, but she's very helpful. She knows a lot of the tribe uh, members. She's got alternative phone numbers for them and uh, knows how to get in touch with the tribe. So if you're having a tribal issue with survey, with getting responses, make sure Amory or Jill or myself know and we'll, we can help you to go through those issues. The other thing I want to talk about, actually I'm, I was going to talk about MOAs this morning. I'm going to leave that till the afternoon. The other thing I wanted to, to talk about was um, the PTC, or the, uh, yeah, the E106 and TCNS. There are two electronic systems. TCNS is the Tower Construction Notification System. For those of you who are new to, to our processes, 
Uh, TCNS, as we call it, is the only system in federal government that engages the tribes automatically. When you put your tower projects into to TCNS, either as part of a batching for the PTC, the railroad project, or individually for a commercial tower, or a public safety tower, or a broadcast tower, every Wednesday those tribes and every federally recognized tribe participates in this process gets a notice. That's their notice to look at their files to see if they have an interest. Um, it, the system does not require, TCNS does not require any attachments. I would strongly encourage you when you're using TCNS to provide some attachments, a, a location map, really helps speed the process so that if you're, if you're interested in moving your projects forward through the tribal uh, engagement process, include a map. And with that regard, one of the things that um, Diane Duper and Jonathan Jonas were mentioned earlier today, I, I often refer to them as our back office. Again, they're in the Gettysburg office. They're the ones that, that do TCNS and E-106 and keep it running. They've been working with the assistance of, of uh, I guess, financing and, and resource management from our commissioner's office and from our front office in the Wireless Telecommunications Bureau. They've been making improvements to, to TCNS and also to um, E-106 so that now if you put in a uh, Google Earth image, uh, an ESRI image, ESRI, um, that image does not get converted to a PDF. It goes in as a live Google Earth image, which means that if a tribe has Google Earth or a SHPO has Google Earth installed on their computers, on the computer on which they're reading that, that image where you're showing the location of your tower projects, where you're showing an APE, um, where you might be showing historic properties, um, could be located, stays live. So that it automatically come up in your own browser in Google Earth. Um, I will, will mention, this is not a plug, uh, it's just a, the fact that it's out there. Google recently, two or three months ago, made Google Earth Pro which used to be a, a fee license system, it's free. So there's no reason not to use Google Earth or Google Earth, Earth Pro or an equivalent. Um, there, there are other companies that do that kind of stuff, but because we've been able to make TCNS, the mapping system go live, there's no reason not to in include those, You're not required, but there's no reason not to include those in your TCNS notices. It'll help the tribes immensely. And the same thing applies to E-106. Those Google Earth images, if that's what you're using, are, are now live in E-106. So a SHPO or a consulting party who's, who's in the E-106 system um, can go um, and look at those Google Earth images live. And actually, that helps Jill and I, too, because we, we both use Google Pro, Google Earth, to look at things. Um, so that's a huge advancement. We're trying to make other advancements into um, the two electronic databases. Uh, one of the things that frustrates folks a great deal is that, I know it drives me to distraction, is when you're looking at the attachments and you want to go back and look at the main form, you, you can't get back there easily with using your back browser. We're working on changing that. Yeah, and I can see all the smiling faces in the room. Um, so we're, we recognize that those things are out there, um, and we're, we're trying to do what we can. Um, that's what I wanted to cover this morning. So do we have, um, so I'm going to talk about MOAs um, this, this afternoon uh, during the, the time period from between one and when we start the tribal session. Um, we have about 10 minutes or so for questions. So I'd be happy to answer any questions. I, I asked Jill to, to, to be up here as well. One, because we share these responsibilities. We talk all the time. Amory and I talk every day. So there's a great deal of communication that occurs within uh, the infrastructure team. Um, we take the word communications to heart. So uh, we'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. And um, just before the break, I put some of my business cards out on the table with, with the notepads and the other handouts, so you can take those as well. So, um, who's got the first question? Okay, we got one back here.
Thank you. Karen Caldwell with Caldwell Compliance. There have been several questions that have been asked today, and the response has been, uh, we'll research it and get back to you. Mm -hmm. How will those of us in the audience be made aware of the responses? Um, it depends on what the question was. In some cases, we'll, we'll put those kinds of clarifications on our website. We've been trying to do that in a, in a, with greater efficiency. It's, it's hard right now because our, our website's in transition. Um, if, if you've asked a specific question, it might be best if you want us, uh, to answer to email the person to whom you asked that question. Uh, right, yeah, I know. Um, but uh, we, we don't really have a good way of getting those kinds of questions back. We'll, we'll, work, we'll work on that and we'll, we'll figure out a way. Uh, unless you have a thought, Jeff. I'm sorry. Oh, oh, oh. Um, the question was, we've got some questions that we've said we're going to back to folks on today because we didn't have a, a, a definitive answer we wanted to give out. We don't really have an effective way on our website, just because our website's changing, um, to get questions back to the general audience, not just to the person that was asking the questions. Yeah, I, I've been thinking about that as a, as a bit of a challenge. Um, I wonder if there's a way we could post them along with the, um, you know, on the website that's going to have the video for this, because I think we're going to have the, um, the, um, the, the slide presentations up there, and maybe we could post a document with some Q and A along I, with that. I, I think that. But we'll we'll have to work on that internally. I, you know, Cecilia stepped out, and I was going to ask her that question. We we have an events page. We have an events page for this webinar as well as the others. So I think we'll try to put something there along with an announcement. So check back in a couple of weeks. Uh, I think is the best we can do for you at the moment. Um, are there other questions? Question in the back, Mara. Yeah. Oh, okay. Hi, uh, Robert Smith with GPD Group. I've kind of got a two-part question. Um, regarding the research um, for the 106 and TCNS submittals, um, does a Secretary of the Interior qualified principal investigator have to conduct that research or just take part in effect determinations once that research is submitted to them? The the, the question was to the level of extent that somebody who is properly qualified under the Secretary of Interior Standards needs to do the research. To gather the data from the SHPO files, because I have a, a multi-part answer, to gather the data from the SHPO files, that person does not have to have qualifications as an archaeologist or as an historian or architectural historian, because all they're doing is taking information back to their offices, so they're data gathering. It's like sending an intern um, to pick up the information. That's all they're doing. They're making no decisions. Any decisions about the effect of a tower project on historic properties that are identified within the area of potential effect need to be done by the appropriately qualified professional. Um, if you're having to put together a narrative report, because some states and some tribes require a cultural resource report, that cultural resource report needs to be done by an appropriately qualified individual so that if um, you're putting together a narrative history of um, the, the tribal use of a, 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 a river intersection, a couple of rivers come together that were used by tribes for 10,000 years or, or whatever, and then um, with European occupation and involvement, you need to get trading posts and that kind of stuff. That kind of information needs to be done by somebody who has a specialized knowledge of that area to make sure that they're, they're identifying all those things, especially that would be identified archaeologically. Um, and Because there, there are lots of little things. Um, one of the things that comes up every once in a while, which I'm always surprised that folks don't know, for instance, if you're, if you're near a national park that's an, that is an historic national park, that national park is listed on the National Register. So it doesn't show up in, in a survey file necessarily because it's on the register. Somebody who's been to graduate school as an historian, as an archaeologist, would know that. And so that's why we're real careful and insistent on the proper qualifications. Hey, Steve, can I make another qualification? And that is that there are certain states 
um, where you do need to be, in particular, a licensed archaeologist to access the files that would enable you to identify archaeological sites. And so those would be cases where you do need an archaeologist, obviously. The state of Utah is one of them. Um, and then the other thing is, if you are sending someone who is not a fully qualified under the um, Secretary of Interior standards to do research in a state office, make sure that they are um, conversant enough with the system to know, Steve had mentioned, that sometimes a nomination will be in process. And so it's already been determined eligible. And different state offices have different places that you need to go or people that you need to ask. And so while technically, D the person doesn't need to meet the um, qualifications to gather information. They do need to know all of the sources, and in certain states, they do need to be licensed. Okay, thank you. Uh, the second part of the question relates specifically to PTC mm -hmm. and batch submissions of sites that are excluded from 106 review. Would those section E106 and TCNS submittals need to be submitted since there are no effect calls associated with those submittals by a qualified professional? The, the actual data entry doesn't need to be done by a qualified individual. You can have a clerk do the data entry, but somebody who has the appropriate qualifications needs to check and make sure that the information is correct and accurate. Jill, do you have anything to add? Yes, yeah, so the first step, and we're going to go over this in the PTC um, session uh, with the flowchart, but the first step, obviously, the railroad identifies where the locations are that, um, uh, where the qualification or where the exceptions apply, the exclusions apply, but then you do need to have a cultural resource professional do the check to make sure that there are no National Register listed properties that would um, impact that, meaning the infrastructure can't be within the boundary or, in one case, within a certain proximity to the boundary. So you do need to have um, a historic preservation professional involved in validating those exclusions. So we just have had an uh, experience just in the past weeks where someone who was not qualified tried to secure that information and basically didn't realize, didn't know what they didn't know. And so they submitted something to a tribe as excluded, and it happens that because they didn't have access to the right information, um, they did not know that it was within a National Register listed archaeological district and a TCP. So we don't encourage it. Um, and because it, it's not pretty when it, it happens that the information wasn't accounted for properly. Because we are, you know, one of the challenges with PTC is with the vol volume of information and with the program comments streamlining things, um, you know, we do need to maintain that reasonable and good faith effort standard of identification um, in order to make the system work. So we encourage you to have a qualified professional look at that. And, and you know, it gets down to, to experience, too. Um, I, I'm helped in some of this. this. This is actually my 40th year of being paid to do this kind of stuff. So I've been doing it for a long while. But if you're looking at a site that for whether it's a, for a railroad or utility for a commercial tower company, it's along a waterway. It's near where a waterway comes together. It's on a, a plain next to that waterway. It's on a mountaintop um, with a water a water source nearby. I mean, those those are, are kinds of very gross generalizations. But you need to think to yourself, <coughs> I need to be careful here. There there might have been use by the tribes. There might have been use by Settlers, because that's an attractive area for them. Um, those kinds of you know, areas right behind the floodplain, because you don't you don't want to be camping next to a a water water course, a stream, river, whatever, uh, when the snow melts, because the rivers get a little wider. Uh, but the stuff's there. So if you're going to have people that are not don't have a master's degree in in this stuff, at least give them a little bit of training so that when they go and look at the maps. 
they can think about those kinds of things and bring it back to your, your principal investigator and say, I happen to notice that there's all this wetlands here. Why we need to take a closer look at that before we go further. And it's just it's just a matter of being careful. Um, the the term I used to hear from, from some of my lawyer buddies is a, it's a belt suspenders approach. Just be careful. And it only takes a few extra minutes to do that. And it saves a lot of aggravation with this one situation we had. The tribe that called is actually somebody I've had a real long relationship with. Um, the, the Tippo and my cousin actually go Harley riding together. Um, he was bad. So, you know, I want to avoid that. Because then he tells my cousin and my cousin yells at me. And I don't want to do that either. Um, got another question. You just mentioned that cultural, cultural surveys are only required per your rules if there are properties listed or in the process of being listed on the National Register. Yet Section 106 requires assessments to determine if there are properties that are eligible for listing. Are you stating that for the FCC process, you do not need to consider previously undocumented properties that may be eligible for listing? And that's what our NPA says. If you're doing a tower project um, near a say a small village intersection um, in New York State. Nice little crossroads, it's a country store, a bank, a church, that kind of stuff. If, if the New York State SHPO did not go there and document those properties to, to, as part of their survey effort and make a decision as to whether they're eligible for the National Register or not, they're not documented. You do not need to consider them for the, the effect of your tower project on those store properties. Um, it's not a situation as a preservation professional that in that particular situation I, I'm happy about, but that's what our rules say. And I, I will work with the SHPOs to make them sure that they understand that, because sometimes the staff doesn't understand that. And as a, as a federal um, preservation official, I would say that it's incumbent upon the states to do their own survey work. You know, that's why they've been getting funds from the National Store, Pres the National Store Preservation Fund since, well, not really since 1966, but since about 1970 or so, to do that survey and documentation work. That was my first job in preservation, to do, to go out and look at farms day after day after day and, and make those kinds of decisions. So the work's, work's out there. So, no. Do we have any more questions? He has one in the back. Yeah. Hey, uh, Zach Champ with PCIA. Hi. First of all, thank you so much for putting this on. It's always an educational uh, experience. Um, my question, I think, sort of broadly is in uh, taking Twilight Towers out of the picture uh, for this. If uh, there's an acquisition of towers or facilities that uh, may not have had the E106 or the consultation that was uh, required, what would you recommend to folks in industry to, uh, to help get that in, in order? Uh, what steps would you recommend? It's a question we get a lot. Uh, we want to, you know, we want to hear from you what we should be recommending. And then uh, one follow-up, okay. um, part of that, uh, so we don't repeat the same problems, is having data about where the tribes and Native nations uh, were. Um, and so an update on, on where, um, uh, how conversations are going to get that information more public so the relationships mm -hmm. can be established before an application is submitted. Thank you. Okay. Um, Don, are you still here? Yeah, there, oh, you're over there. You, you keep on moving your seat. Um, Don and I, actually Don did this a couple of years ago. So we'll do the first question first. What about non-compliant towers that need to be made accessible for a co-location, which I think is the heart of your question. And Don developed this system called the, the Glenwood Letter. It, it doesn't clear the underlying tower. It looks at and clears, makes the tower eligible for co-locations. It's not a it's not an easy process. It was something that we could do more effectively when I first started, um, and because you guys weren't building everywhere, um, so I could get to them more quickly. It it needs you need to do a form 620, and either Jill, I looked at it, or Jill and I could look at it um, for mergers and acquisitions for M and A's. We would, I would really strongly dis discourage you from just giving us 50 towers that you want to purchase just because you want to purchase them. Um, but if you've got 
co-locators want to go on those towers, talk to us, and we'll 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 try to work out a process. And it usually is going to be the fallback onto the the Glenwood process. It it takes some time, but if they're co-locators, we'll we'll because we're a user-friendly agency, we'll work something out. And now that that I have a, a companion. Um, <laughs> I'm not saying I can get to them faster because you keep on increasing the number of towers you're building. We'll, we'll get to it as best we can. Um, the other question was something we get frequently, and that's how to identify tribal areas of interest. There is no real way to do that. Um, there are, I know that there are some companies that, that use TCNS all the time that have developed a shadow TCNS system. So they look at the notices they receive on a weekly basis for their projects. They keep track of them. They keep track of where the tribes um, have said they have an area of interest, counties they have an area of interest. That's one way to do it. Um, the tribes get really aggravated, and I, 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 I can't emphasize aggravated enough in tall, giant capital letters. If you use TCNS to ping them to find out how many tribes are interested in the county you're interested in putting a tower up or some other project you're doing um, because as soon as they get those they've got people in their offices that run off and start looking at their files so when you do that you may have wasted one of the tribes um, employees you might have spent them off for five or six hours until you got around to withdrawing that so it's not a fair thing to do it's not a nice thing to do and makes you liable for fees if the tribes charge fees for that, that kind of, of research that somebody has already done. Somebody, somebody needs to cover those costs. So that's not a good thing to do. And um, we all, always like to remind everyone that um, we're not the only federal agency out there. So the tribes are also looking at projects from all kinds of other different agencies. And, you know, we hear from um, licensees and uh, our applicants when they're having trouble getting answers from tribes on projects that are real. So if you just kind of think of it in that context, every time you do that, you are um, burdening the process and making it harder for the tribe to get quickly and efficiently to the projects that you really need cleared. So, so we don't like to hear about that <laughs> yeah it's, it's not it's not it's it's just not a nice thing to do um we've we have been asking the tribes because this is an issue not just for our, for us for you as as our licensees and for the industry but it's an issue also that the tribes have and they recognize is important for that information out there so some of them have been working to put that information on their websites so look at websites and see if you can gather information um zach does that answer your, your questions Okay. And, and I want to thank you again for providing the, the, the ability for Everett and, and uh, Alvin to come. That was, that was very nice. Um, I have another question. This is actually from a tribe. When a company submits their project to the FCC through TCNS, what is their time limit they, to inform the tribes in their projects? The tribe has 30 days to respond. Um, tribes try to respond in 30 days. The, the, the companies have no time limit to provide the information to the tribes, but companies that are doing this, the use its consultants to do this, need to recognize that if you're not providing all the information to um, the, the tribes, they can't respond. And so if you don't give them what they ask for, if they say they have an interest, then you're holding up your own project. Uh, I've been dealing with an individual for the past few months who doesn't want to do that kind of stuff and he's been complaining to me and to, to Jeff that his project's taking too long well when I, I talk to the tribes he hasn't given them what they asked for so the tribes are trying to respond you you need as, as um, a responsible party in this to give them the information up front and not try to, try to anticipate their needs and if you've been working with a particular tribe often enough um, if they are asking for cultural resource reports, give them the cultural resource report up front. If they're asking for a SHPO clearance letter, which some tribes are doing that now, give them that information up front. I, I hope that answers your question. Um, and if not, call me and, and we'll, we'll work at it again. Okay. Any more questions? Okay. 
Um, Suzanne Derrick with EBI Consulting. And okay. regarding your comments about the level of survey and some issues requiring additional survey, just as a practical application, um, when we were at the meeting in October, you both were there with Pennsylvania SHPO. Right. You're aware that they require the agricultural survey. Right. Um, when we don't supply that, we get a comment back through the system. They don't complete consultation with us. They request that survey. Um, so what would be the practical steps forward in that sort of um, standoff? I don't know. It, it, maybe not um, such an adversarial word. It, okay. Yeah. In that particular situation, um, I, I, I will call up with the responsible party. I'll, I will solve that. Okay. Um, on a global basis in that state. Okay, is that, that's what you're asking. She, 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 you want me to finish what I started in October, right? <laughs> okay, all right. I understand. I will do that. Okay. Um, I hadn't heard anything back from anybody, so I, I thought maybe the issue had gone away. Well, you didn't say anything. Okay, all right. I, I, will, I will finish what I started. Uh, Steve Bilsill, Wilkinson Barker. Um, it came up earlier in, in the discussion today that there are um, there's always a question of lead agency for the purpose of, of the NHPA, and there aren't any agreements uh, to date that I know of between the FCC and the lead agency. Um, would you suggest that we contact you or Jill uh, to find out whether um, the FCC considers the, lead, the other agencies' uh, NHPA practices sufficient in order to um, in order to use them so that we don't wind up going through two different sets of uh, NHPA processes? Okay. Um, the, the, the question is when there are two projects involved, two agencies involved in a, in a project, how we would interact with that. One, if a project is on federal land, the federal land owner's agency is the lead agency, and we typically are not involved. That applies to, to tribal land within the bounds of reservation. If it's on private land within the reservation, we're actively involved. But we've been getting a number of situations from uh, a subset of our licensees, which I think is where you're thinking of, where somebody did a, a whole NEPA study and a Section 106 study for a land-based project. Um, for, the, for the sake of argument, we'll call it a big industrial park with lots of rows and a railroad track and smelters and whatever it is that they're doing there. And then somebody comes in six months later and they want to put up a communications tower to uh, provide communications to that facility. In general, we would, we would accept um, that other agencies, Section 106 uh, work with one caveat. We need to make sure that they, they contacted the proper tribes through tribal consultation and that the APE was sufficiently wide enough to cover the visual effect of the, of the, of the towers. Does that answer your question? We might want to mention the program comment too because we actually, there is actually an agreement yeah. That well, just with with respect to certain agencies, there it was a program comment again associated with the broadband grants and some public safety towers that um, addressed the duplicative responsibilities that NTIA, Rural Utility Service, and FEMA have when they're funding projects that involve communication towers. And that program comment allowed the elements that qualified for consultation under the NPA to become FCC's undertakings. So it, it clarifies um, the duplicative responsibility for right. those projects. Um, and that's um, in the process right now of being negotiated for some kind of renewal. Right. Jackie? Uh, Jackie Payette, ERM. Um, Steve, I have, I think, a pretty simple question for you. Um, is there any way to move forward with the E-106 submittal and the submittal to SHPO prior to actually having the public notice affidavit in hand if we have um, the public notice requested or published but we don't have the proof of publication yet and we can provide that to SHPO as a follow-up? Is it possible to go ahead and get that filed? We're seeing delays of up to six weeks trying to get the affidavit in some cases. Um, I'm uncomfortable with that 
I'd, I'd rather you have all the, the pieces together so that the shipper doesn't have to go back and look at it twice. Um, so you might want to think about building that into your project lead time. Thank you. Okay. Can I sneak in one more question? Sure. It's probably should have been asked in the prior session. It's about the um, Jill had a slide that said that this the um, backup power should be included as um, in the definition of antennas. And I guess I'm curious as far as the actual definition in the area, the cubic volume of the equipment goes for potential small cell exclusions. Is the backup power counted in the 17 cubic feet? That that's <laughs> your slide. Yeah, <laughs> I think we'll Sorry, follow Jill. up with you on that uh, that that level of detail, unless Jeff knows offhand. I'm trying to look it up fast. Okay. <laughs> so by after lunch, that's the first thing we'll tell you after okay, lunch. Okay. Thank you. Um, if there are, there are no other questions, because uh, it's 20 after 12, so um, there are several food trucks. At least I'm being told that there are several food trucks across the street. I I can't verify that for sure. Next door, there's a small deli. There's also the pop alleys. Go up to Maryland Avenue, go around. Uh, there's some eateries down at LaFont Plaza, which is down uh, the other street. And then the cafeteria here. If you want to go to the cafeteria, we have to escort you down and bring you back up. Hold on to your red visitor's badges. Don't give those away. Otherwise, you'll have to go through security again. Um, and be back here at quarter after one. We'll start up again. I'll just take care of that right now as I was looking at it. It looks pretty clear to me the 17 cubic feet includes the backup power, so that would be included in the 17 cubic feet. She's not listening, but I'll go tell her. It includes the backup power. Yeah. I think we'll get started again so we can keep more or less on schedule. Just wanted to cover a um, couple of quick things before we got started. Um, first of all, um, I don't know if people, um, is Jackie here? She is. Okay. Um, just, I, I don't know, I sort of got in, Jackie, um, you had to, that question right before the break about the, um, the, the volume and the backup power, and um, it's clear to me looking at, yes, the, um, the backup power is part of the 17 cubic feet. So um, that's one. We also had another question that got missed before the break. Um, this is from um, Steve Geist of Geist Engineering and Environmental. And the question is, are there any pending lawsuits that might impact the newest rules on the programmatic agreement exemptions for utility co-locations or existing antennas on buildings? The answer to that is no. There's nothing pending on that. There is a um, suit that was filed addressing part of the infrastructure order that came out last October, um, that's pending in the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals in Richmond, but it's only the part of it that went to Section 6409A, the piece of the, um, the order that goes to local government regulation over co-locations. The plaintiffs in that lawsuit did not challenge any of the order that has to do with our NEPA or Section 106 process. So for those, the um, the, the filing de deadline for facial challenges to those orders has passed, so those are effective, no litigation pending on that. Um, just again, a reminder for um, people over the web, questions can be submitted to livequestions at FCC.gov, and I'll turn it back to Steve to continue with the program. Good afternoon. Thank you for some of you for coming back. Um, <laughs> before before we start the uh, the one o'clock session at, at twenty after, um, we have a new handout that was referenced this morning. It's on the back table. Um, you might want to wait till the break before you go up and get it. It's the National Environmental it's the Environmental Compliance for Communications Towers. It's the NEPA uh, SSC and NEPA that um, Erica did. Um, so you might want to do that. 
This, we're going to continue with the this, this session on special problems and solutions. Um, first off, we have uh, Jill Springer, who is going to talk about PT, some PTC issues. I think even those of you who are not with the railroads will find it very interesting because it speaks a lot to our process and things that we're looking for. So with that, Jill. So if you're looking for another reason to go up to the table and get your NEPA handout, um, I understand we, the um, PTC slides are pretty dense, and so the closed captioning might make it hard to read them. So there are copies of this slide presentation, too. It has a flow chart and some graphics in it. I don't know where the slides are. Um, no, I mean, Cecilia. There it comes. OK. Um, so in May 2014, the Advisory Council on Historic Preservation issued a program comment to tailor Section 106 review of positive <coughs> train control, which we're going to be referring to as PTC infrastructure. Um, the ACHP recognized that uh, with Congress mandating that uh, these poles be installed by December of 20. 15, that there was a real challenge to move all that infrastructure through environmental review. And, um, and so as a result, developed this streamlined process that we're going to go over in just a moment. Um, the program comment excludes some specified PTC infrastructure from standard 106 review, and it streamlines um, review for other PTC infrastructure. Railroads need to use the FCC Tower Construction Notification System, TCNS, to ensure tribal nation participation. Um, and it, the program comment also provides direction on how and when monitoring may be appropriate or required. It establishes more definitive time frames um, for 106 than are typical in a standard review. Um, and in general, it is uh, rather long as a program comment. So one of the things that we did in terms of helping practitioners to understand what the requirements are is to break it down in this daunting flow chart that you see here. But fortunately, the slides that I have are going to um, make it a little bit more granular. The first thing um, that the process does is to um, have the applicant determine whether the infrastructure is proposed on tribal, federal, or private land. On tribal land, it's up to the tribe to determine whether or not the program comment applies um, and whether they're willing to go through this streamlined process. If it's on federal land, um, it, the program comment definitely applies because the um, program comment relieves other federal agencies of their Section 106 obligations with respect to PTC infrastructure. So it does put all of the um, all of the emphasis on this process. Most of the consultations are with State Historic Preservation Office um, unless the infrastructure is proposed on tribal lands where the, as I mentioned, the tribal nation decides whether or not to follow the program comment. The first step that um, has to happen, and we uh, alluded to this earlier, is that the railroads need to hire a cultural resource professional because there is a requirement um, that identification happen. Um, and even with respect to the exclusions, there's a step to ensure that that infrastructure that might qualify as excluded based on its proximity to other um, aspects of the rail structure um, cannot be within a National Register eligible or listed property, and in one case cannot be within 500 feet. We'll go over that in just a moment. So the railroad prepares a map that shows the proposed PTC locations. Um, the program comment addresses PTC poles that are less than 75 feet in height. And planned in railroad rights of way. Um, the 
program comment allows the consultations for polls to be batched together within, so for all of the polls that are proposed within a single county, there's a mechanism for putting those all together. Um, and that mapping has to also show where PTC base stations will be. Um, and if there is film material that is proposed as part of the um, installation, that has to the, the source for that material has to be indicated. So PTC base stations typically are greater than 75 feet. So while we um, there, need to show them on the mapping, they're typically not covered by the program comment in terms of the uh, requirements for documentation. So once the railroad has identified the locations where the poles are proposed um, and determined or identified which of the exclusions they qualify for. The cultural resource professional goes to the SHPO office or um, does whatever process is appropriate within the given state to conduct the reasonable and good faith effort of, of identifying historic properties. Um, then for the non-excluded infrastructure, they're going to be preparing mapping that um, overlays the boundaries of the National Register listed or eligible properties with the APE um, and the proposed PTC locations. Um, one of the things that we ha has come up because we're doing so many consultations so quickly in so many states is that there are states, as we mentioned previously, that require archaeologists who hold a state permit or license um, in order to conduct the record searches that is required as part of this step. Um, these searches all, almost always need to be performed in the SHPO office or state archives. Historic properties um, for the purposes of the program comment, like with the uh, nationwide programmatic agreement, are properties that are eligible because they've been formally determined eligible or have been listed in the National Register of Historic Places. So we have also come into um, uh, the situation in several states at different times that properties that were in the process of designation or had just been evaluated and not yet put back into the files um, were missed. And so there, there is a real need to do the reasonable good faith due diligence effort on the part of the cultural resource person uh, working for the railroad. Um, there, the three types of exclusions that the program comment establishes is for the first one is poles or infrastructure that is within 500 feet of signal equipment that's 25 feet or taller or within 500 feet of an existing catenary bridge or mast, also that is 25 feet or taller, or within 500 feet of an above ground utility line or, or other utility infrastructure that's within 100 feet of the railroad right of way center line. Um, the second is a wayside antenna of less than 10 feet on existing railroad infrastructure. And with respect to those two locations, the one thing that would make them not apply is if that proposed location was within an identified historic properties boundary. So when this has come up, um, typically it's been that the poll is proposed within a National Register listed historic district. And in that case, those locations wouldn't be excluded. The third exclusion is for wayside poles or infrastructure that's within the yard track and not within 500 feet of an identified historic property. So again, in that case, um, it's, it, it um, can be eliminated as an exclusion uh, if the historic property is within 500 feet. It doesn't have to actually be within it. So once the railroads have identified the excluded infrastructure and the cultural resource professional has cross-checked the mapping and confirmed that there um, that it is, in fact, it is, in fact, a valid exclusion. Um, that those locations have to be identified on the mapping, and the program comment states that the applicable of those three exclusions has to be listed with that location, so the SHPO and the tribes can see why that location is excluded from Section 106 review. 
Um, as I mentioned, the PTC polls, both excluded and non-excluded infrastructure, can be batched within counties, so multiple polls can um, be submitted at the same time. So when a location has been confirmed as excluded and the poll or the batch of polls um, has been prepared, the consultants working for the railroad will initiate TCNS and E106 notice, um, and we actually have altered our TCNS and E106 system slightly to accommodate all of the polls that are going through PTC. And so those would be identified within our systems as excluded PTC. The mapping and explanations of the exclusions would be uploaded to TCNS and E106, and if the tribes or the SHPO um, requested, hard copies should also be provided. If there's no SHPO or tribal objection, Section 106 would be completed, considered complete, after the 30-day review period ends. In cases where a SHPO or a tribe objects within the 30-day review period, um, we would ask the consultants in the railroads to notify the FCC. So typically this would happen in the case where a ship or a tribe is aware that there is a property, a historic property, um, either nearby in the case of the uh, yard track exclusion or um, if the poll is proposed within the boundary of a, a historic district that somehow the consultant missed or uh, other Otherwise, in the case of some tribal properties, um, it's not information that they might have had access to before notifying the tribe. So again, in that case, you're going to be notifying the FCC. Um, and then one of two things can happen. The railroad would continue to consult with the SHPO and tribe to resolve the concern with Steve or my involvement in many cases, or if that was not possible, um, the FCC would resolve this issue, um, and we have the goal of doing that within 10 days. Um, the, the need to construct this infrastructure within the short time frame and the very real um, safety issues that are driving the projects uh, motivated the Advisory Council to recognize within the program comment that after that basically the 30 days is a, a hard 30-day time frame for these reviews. And so typically CHIPO or tribal concerns or issues about excluded polls would not be considered outside of the 30-day period except in an extraordinary circumstance. For non-excluded infrastructure, um, TC and S and E 106 notifications would be initiated, and the program comment spells out in great detail what the review process is for non-excluded polls. The overlay mapping for non-excluded PTC sites would be prepared showing the boundaries of National Register listed or eligible properties within a quarter mile of the proposed poll. Um, there is the possibility within the process of batching together excluded and non-excluded infrastructure. Um, we found as we've been assisting railroads with this that it's helpful to the process um, to separate those out just so the, the tribe or the SHPO is aware that all of the um, uh, polls that they're looking at in any given location, basically they're supposed to be um, considering under the same rules and guidelines. Um, but it is possible that uh, excluded and non-excluded polls could be batched together, and in that case, uh, the locations of excluded PTC polls would need to be identified on the mapping. For non-excluded polls, any alternative PTC locations that were considered um, should be identified in the event that adverse effects are um, are anticipated and we'd have to avoid or minimize them. And then, um, although Although you wouldn't have the actual proposed poll, the types of poll, some type of um, photograph or um, other schematic of the type of poll that's proposed and any infrastructure that's required, as well as a description of the installation techniques and the fill material source if it's anticipated. So this documentation is submitted through E106 um, for 
SHPO and FCC access hard copy forms provided to the SHPOs and uh, tribal nations if they so request and upload the information to TCNS for tribal access as well. Um, there's also a process for local and federal government agency and public review and so that would be the point at which um, any kind of newspaper notice or um, letters that would go out to local agencies would happen. There are three possible outcomes. The best of these is that the SHPO and tribal nations concur on no adverse effects or agree if there is an effect anticipated on an adverse effect agreement to, um, to deal with that. In that case, the um, agreement would be executed and filed with the FCC Federal Preservation Officer, so with Steve. Section 106 would be considered complete and the project could proceed in accordance with anything that was identified in the adverse effect agreement, if applicable, and upon completion of NEPA and any other regulatory requirements. Um, in the event that uh, an adverse effect agreement was required, uh, as a result of that, that would be a trigger for an EA. So there would be associated NEPA responsibilities that are um, beyond the process that we're describing here for 106. The second possible outcome is no response. If the SHPO or tribe did not respond within 30 days, the railroad refers the project to the FCC, and we call this reason one. <laughs> um, there are two situations, two ways to do that. If the um, tribe has not posted a reply into TCNS, that lack of response can be referred to us through the TCNS system. There's a, an actual link that would appear after the 30-day point. Um, if tribes have posted a reply in TCNS or for SHPOs, these referrals come into us through an email box, ptcquestions at fcc.gov. Um, copies of uh, and or summaries of any communications that have happened within the course of these 30 days. We expect those to uh, accompany any kind of referrals. Um, and then basically if the 30 days has expired according to the program comment, um, technically the consultation is over and there would be no further opportunity for participation unless we decided um, that it was an exceptional circumstance. And so we review these referrals quickly, and within 10 business days, we alert um, the railroad and the tribe or um, SHPO in the case of, um, you know, they're having an issue, whether we're suggesting that the project should proceed, again, in accordance with NEPA, if that's applicable or any other requirements, um, or we might just determine that there's an exceptional circumstance and then um, consult or enter into the consultation or advise the railroad on what the next steps would be. The possible outcome number three is um, if the SHPO and or the tribe raises a substantive concern. Um, two possible outcomes here following that. One is that the railroad um, consults with the SHPO and the tribe um, and hopefully either reaches an agreement on a way to avoid an adverse effect or um, negotiates an adverse, ef agreement, adverse effect agreement. Um, if that's not possible within the 30-day time frame, this is another situation where the um, consultation is referred to us. We call this reason two. Um, and the railroad continues to consult with that ship or tribe, we would ask them to do so for 10 more business days. In the event that during this time um, agreement is possible, again, uh, the adverse effect agreement would be executed or the avoidance would be determined. Um, the project could proceed in accordance with any other requirements. In the event that that didn't happen, uh, the FCC would further get involved and consult for 10 or more business days in order to resolve it. Um, and our hope would be, again, to get to the point of agreement where the project could proceed. Um, in the event of exceptional circumstances, 
we would advise the railroad what to do in terms of next steps, and it, it really is a case-by-case -case basis. Fortunately, um, I'm not sure we've even had any that have gotten to this extreme point, and I would say that um, we really appreciate the patience and the dedication of all the parties involved in this expedited process. Um, the tribal nations have um, really had an increased workload here and in order to make it possible for the system to, to uh, move forward. The railroads have been great to work with um, in terms of understanding what Steve and I need to do to keep the Section 106 process moving, and the Advisory Council did a great job with the program comment. The SHPOs have been very understanding as well. So that's the... P that's the special case of the PTC. Okay. I actually have a series of questions and then a couple comments. Okay. Uh, the first question is, is, is the, when the railroads uh, initially sign up onto your system for, for a PTC project in whatever county, what is the uh, what what date is considered the start date of the 30 day time frame? Because every Wednesday I go on your site and I and I look through the list of projects that are proposed, and and I know some of those projects were submitted to your site probably on a Thursday prior. So, but what date do you use as that first day to start the 30 day process? So this is an issue that just really came to our attention last Friday <laughs> on a call that we had um, with with the tribes and so I, I hate to again defer a, a question but um, I, I think the understanding would be that the date that it was uploaded and initiated would be the 30-day date but it does seem like there's a lag that we're understanding may be happening and I don't know Steve if you want to add anything to that yeah actually the 30-day the, the thir the time period starts the day the weekly notices are sent out so that if a railroad or anybody sends you a P, puts a PTC notice or a, a regular tower notice into TCNS, you don't receive it until you get your weekly thing on Wednesday. That's the start of the 30 days. Well, in our the way our system works, we we use, utilize your site to reply mm -hmm. initially to these to the TCNS proposed project. So it comes out on Wednesday morning. That's the first thing I do is I go on your site and I read through the list of projects that are proposed within our Aboriginal homelands and then I reply to them on your site. Mm -hmm. So it, it, the railroads, and I keep track of which ones I've replied to in our own in our own system, so the railroads as of that day, the 30-day period begins. Okay? Is that what you're saying? That's correct. Okay. Now, she mentioned, uh, this lady here, I'm sorry, I forgot Jill. your name. I'm sorry, Jill, Jill mentioned fine. that that there have never been a project that's gone into this phase three portion. You know, and I think part of the reason why tribes haven't haven't done that is because most tribes don't have a system like ours. We we do everything interactive online and it's a system, it's a it's a platform that's very efficient for us. And I, and I think most tribes are stuck with one individual in, a, in an office, and normally it's in a corner somewhere with no windows. <laughs> and it's one guy, and he's got a stack of stack of paperwork that that big, and he doesn't have time to go through every one of those right. notices that he gets. So, so they're at a huge disadvantage in, in trying to answer to all of these different uh, PTC projects. Actually, any any FCC project. Uh, but when that 30-day window comes into play. Tribes have already lost out on the boat. They're, they're already gone, except for us. We've, we've been able to kind of keep up with them to, to a certain extent. Prior to, prior to us understanding the process, we missed out on a whole bunch of uh, projects that we would have wanted to, con you know, have a field tech at least on site. Uh, one in particular, there's a, there's a stretch of land or a stretch of railroad between uh, Malta, Montana and Glasgow, Montana. And we, our tribe, considers that a very, very historical site because they call it Cree Crossing in our, in our, in our, in our, our in Montana. And it is a historical site for us. It's where our, our tribe migrated south from, from Canada all the way into, heck, all the way into Wyoming and back and forth, you know, prior to uh, English settlement. So it's very important to us that when, when a, a pole gets inserted in there, 
we know that there's artifacts, we know that there's cultural significance, and there could be an area of potential effect that would adversely affect our tribe. So we wanted to, we, we want to make sure that when that happens, that 30 day, t you give us, make sure we get 30 days, okay? Because we, we go through those, especially our tribe, and I, I, I can't speak for every tribe, we go through those thoroughly, those archeology span reports, that's one of the things we do very well as we go through those stories. We've got an archaeologist on staff now that helps with that process. But, you know, we're behind the eight ball on this thing, just like a lot of tribes. We, we've actually caught up, but I don't see other tribes catching up on this. So you may, at some point in time, see more of these tribes uh, disputing uh, some of these, you know, where these poles are going. So yeah. we, We've had several tribes bring poles to our attention. And in the two cases I'm familiar with, both of them were resolved. Mm -hmm. the, the, both of them were, were considered to be excluded poles. Mm -hmm. And the tribe stood right up and said, well, no, we have a village here. And in both cases, there were village sites. Mm -hmm. And so they've been resolved. Um, I know the stretch of land you're talking about. Mm -hmm. I've been an Amtrak passenger on that, yep. as well as a Route 2 passenger on that mm -hmm. stretch. Um, and I so, but I thought that actually was built out before the program comment was issued. I, I'm not. I'm not sure. It, it could have been prior to that. Yeah, May I think. I think, I think that stretch. I just gave that as an example right. because I, mean, we, I remember I talked to you on the phone, Mr. Windy Boy, and myself, right. and about a, about sites in Pennsylvania. Right. And you didn't even know there was a pet. You said I, I'm from Pennsylvania, and I don't know of any petroglyphs. Well, we found 12 of them. Yeah. <laughs> That's. <laughs> well, I, I, I know there were some down in the Susquehanna River Valley. Okay. In Lancaster County, but I didn't know they were up there. Okay. Um, so that was a surprise. But you need to bring these things to our attention. You need to myself, and we'll we'll work with them. And the railroads, you know, I guess I'll make two comments. One is that. We did not write the, the program comment. The advisory council wrote the program comment. So they're the rules that they gave us, okay. um, as well as giving you. The other piece is that in those instances where we've had issues like this with village sites or, or whatever, the one we were talking about earlier today, in each case, the railroad has stood up and said, we will fix this. Now, recognize that when I've, I've done that or Jill has done that, We've not talked to the consultant, and because this is such a time crunch and such a sensitive issue, we go directly to the contacts that we have at each of the railroads, who usually have a title that includes a vice president somewhere in their long list of responsibilities. So we're, we're stepping pretty far up the, the food chain at each railroad to, to make these things work for everybody. Well, and I appreciate that, and I think our tribe appreciates that. It's... Uh you know, and, and first of all, I'd just like to say with the railroads, we've been pretty fortunate to be able to work with them on, on certain situations. In fact, we had a project just last week where it was out in North Dakota, and actually there were two village sites that, mm -hmm. that the train track had traversed, one on both sides of the, right. of the highway and the railroad track. And we asked, hey, well, we would like a tribal field technician out on, and that's the first one we've had. We, mm -hmm. That was the first one. Right. First PTC, because we yeah. know of the, the urgency to get these in, mm -hmm. that was the first PTC site where we wanted to have a tribal right. representative, and Shippo had right. a representative out right. there, and they had no problem with it. So the railroads are really uh, interested in, in keeping this process moving forward, and so are we. Mm -hmm. I, I think the problem is that we have so many tribes out there that do things differently. They do, everybody does it differently. Every right. tribe does it differently. It was, we're lucky that we have a system in place that keeps us, you know, ahead of the game, basically, and in touch with th this 30-day time frame. The one issue I do have with the railroads is they'll, they'll register their project on your site, and we'll ship out an we'll email saying, we'd, you know, as we reply to those, that we would like you to upload that information onto our site. And there's a lag, and that's where the lag in time occurs sometimes. And if and if they go beyond 15 days, even we have a heck of a time catching up to that. The the rest of the 15 days we have left. So if anybody in here is from the railroads, if they could remind their consultants to please upload those on our site the minute we ask for them. Otherwise, they're giving us they're putting us at a disadvantage. So and we don't you don't want that. We don't want that. We're we're responsible to our tribal government. And we have to be accountable to our tribal government because they've tasked us with the responsibility of making sure that our Aboriginal homelands, anything that happens in their Aboriginal homelands, 
not, none of our cultural resources are affected. So, yeah. thank you. Okay. Thank you. Any, are there any other questions? Because we wanted to, our next session starts at 2.15, and we may cut your break out. Um, but we also have Manya that wants to talk about ASR, which is a subject she, she lives to talk about. <laughs> Uh, but we, we do. Yeah, I know. Yeah, it's fairly <laughs> pathetic, actually. <laughs> uh, but I, th I think we probably have time for another question or, or so, if there is one. Uh, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Hey. Uh, okay, we use the, the microphone so we can get it on the tape. Oh, hello. Um, my name is Guy Lopez. I work at the Advisory Council on Historic Preservation. I'm a historic preservation specialist. I'm assigned to review the FCC. And um, if you have any questions, you can approach me. Um, I'm one of the lower level uh, reviewers. I have several directors above me. Um, but I know the FCC has made efforts to train um, you know, to reach out to tribes to train them on how the PTC uh, program comment works. And um, I would urge you to to have more, to you know, to work more with tribes. And I know you, you do. And I'm wondering if you can share more about that with us. Um, on, in terms of training and outreach to tribes, we, there's there's lots that we are talking about. We're constrained by a small staff and also by some travel budgets. And I, I, but, but that's also a question I'll defer to um, Jeff Steinberg and Jeff Blackwell with our Office of Native Affairs and Policy because um, we may not have an answer for, the, for Guy's challenge at the moment, but I think we have some things that might come up later that we, we can share. Unless you want to add something now, Jeff? I can talk about that briefly now since the question came up, although, again, our tribal panel will be coming up later. But I know, you know, one thing we do have planned, which is um, fairly certain in the works, is in conjunction with the, um, the conference of the National Association of Tribal Historic Preservation Officers, which will be in August in New Mexico. Um, Bambi Krauss, the executive director, has very generously offered to, to give us um, up to two days or, or at least a, par, at least portions of two days after that conference um, solely devoted to um, to FCC and, and tribal um, and that there will be more about that coming out soon but I know that's you know whatever we do is inadequate by nature because that there's just so much out there but um, but but that's one thing that, that we are looking together and that's not the only thing we're looking at but that's, that's a major um, um, you know, tribal um, event that, that, that we are looking forward to Okay, then I have one last question. Um, again, this is from a, a tribal member, and she said she's commenting on what I had said earlier, which was that once a company submit something to the FCC, they have the same time limit as they do. Uh, and actually, when I was saying that, I was not referring to the PTC program comment process. Um, the PTC program co comment process for Section 106 gives everybody basically 30 days to respond. So, so as, as Neil pointed out with the Chippewa Creek Tribe, um, this has to move quickly. And so it's, it's incumbent upon everybody to look at the TCNS notices, to get the material to the tribes, for the tribes to respond. And the tribes need to respond with a reason why a site's important. And it may be because that was a traditional migration route. This is a place where you traditionally gather plant materials. There's there's lots of reasons, and we can help you with those kinds of things. But but there at the, under PTC, there is a, a very tight deadline. Um, so so with that, um, we'll move on to Manya and your presentation on ASR. Yeah, I'm going to uh, speak very briefly about uh, and 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 offer you some tips based on my experience uh, that hopefully will smooth and facilitate and speed the process of getting your ASR registration. And these are based just on 
issues that have come up frequently in my experience. Uh, so take them for whatever they are worth, and uh, you know, it, based on your own needs and experience. Um, and I'm not going to do them in any particular order of importance. Uh, so the first one I would offer is, and it, it may be counterintuitive, but I've seen this more than once, where the contact information listed in the application is really inadequate. It's either a generic mailbox that nobody looks at, or it's a random, or it's a generic phone number. Um, it, it speeds it up if you would give us the contact information for a person who is authorized to communicate with us about the application and knows about the application, not just an officer of your company that's generally in charge of communications, for example, but someone who knows about the application. Otherwise, we're going to have to go through a repeated step to try to get to the right person, and you will as well. So it, uh, it, it does speed it up, and, and there are times when we need to get additional information, so that's extremely helpful. Um, in addition to that, again, another counterintuitive one, uh, it's important to give us complete information on the application, particularly, for example, when you request a waiver. Um, the waiver request does not have to be long, but it should meet the criteria of the request that you're seeking, uh, whatever that request, whatever, whatever category of request uh, you're seeking a waiver under. Uh, we, we have had requests that, uh, for waivers that, for example, will just say this is a categorical exclusion, and that's not sufficient. When we get something like that, we have to go back and get information from you. Uh, we may play telephone tag, et cetera, et cetera. It, it just slows up the process. Um, so some particular examples of, of situations I've seen with this, uh, one thing I've seen is we will get a waiver request uh, that uh, is for, to correct the, uh, the, the registration. Um, you know, it's an existing uh, tower. There's no change, but the registration has to be corrected because there's a mistake in the earlier correction. Well, we'll not just look at your waiver request. We'll also look at the whole application. So if you're telling us that you're correcting the height, but it shows that your lighting is also being changed or corrected. We're going to have to ask you, is it really only being cor uh, corrected, or are you actually changing the lighting? So be sure to give us complete information for every change that you're seeking if you're make, you know, asking for a waiver. Uh, similarly, if you're seeking to register uh, a tower for the first time, and you're also, again, asking for a waiver because it's an existing tower before June 18, 2012, when the environmental notice criteria took effect. Please tell us those facts. Again, you don't have to give us all the gory details, but just tell us uh, that, uh, that the, the, the tower is existing. It's existing as of when, if you know the date, or as of before June 18, 2012. Uh, and also, um, it's helpful to us if you, if you explain to us why you're now registering the tower if it wasn't previously registered before. For example, it failed F FAA notice. Uh, again, we try to act really quickly on these waiver requests. We try to keep them moving because we understand that you guys are in a hurry, and, and we also want to facilitate these infrastructure uh, events. So having complete information facilitates that. Now, we may, under any circumstance, ask you for additional information. If we do, uh, again, this may be counterintuitive, but you, it's not enough to give us that additional information over the phone or by email. You have to actually amend the application to provide that additional information. Uh, if you need help amending the application or working with the, with the application online, Diane Dupert or Jonathan Jonas are uh, expert at that, and they can work with you. Uh, in addition, uh, I wanted to put in a plug for our resource sheet, uh, which we have, on which we have a, a list of. Again, the website is in transition, so the links may not be good for long, but they are current links for anything you ever wanted to know about the ASR process, and probably more than you want to know. But the links are on there. If you're interested, you can take a look. Um, 
Another one, ordinarily, if you ask for a waiver, we're not going to notify you if it's granted. You're going to have to go online and check yourself. So don't wait for us to call you, you know, check it. Uh, as I said, we try to act on these quickly. Uh, however, we, you will hear from us if your waiver request is deficient, uh, one way or the other. Either we will, uh, we will call you, we'll email you, or we may return the application if it's apparent that it's deficient and, and or if the facts of the uh, case warrant it. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to move now to a topic that other people have discussed, but I'm going to do it in more nuts and bolts. Uh, and am I going too quickly or? No. Okay. So um, federal agency waiver. Uh, this comes up a lot. Um, there's a uh, waiver criterion if the tower is on federal land and the land holding agency has issued uh, an either an uh, EA and FONSI or an EIS and record of decision. Uh, I spoke about it briefly this morning. We get a lot of waiver requests where the, the tower uh, has, for example, it may be on federal land, but there's a categorical exclusion, or it's not on federal land, but they've had a federal funding. Uh, the, the request will not be granted unless all three criteria are met. However, in, though, in some circumstances where that may not meet the criteria for the federal land holding exemption, if the tower, and we have had these circumstances, if the tower is in existence before June 18, 2012, and it meets the criteria under that waiver, it still may be eligible for a waiver of environmental notice. So, so check with us um, on that one. Okay, now here's another one that you might think would never come up, but it does. So you go through the national notice process, uh, everything went smoothly, and you're, you're waiting and waiting and waiting, and where's your grant? You call us. And the first thing we ask you is, did you certify at the end of the process? We will not grant the application at the end of the national notice process unless you go back in and certify. So you could be waiting a long time. Uh, similarly, if there has been a request for further environmental review and we've acted on your request, we have uh, denied the request or we've stated that no further environmental review is necessary, you still, at the end of your environmental compliance process, need to go back online and certify before we'll grant the application. Uh, on the other hand, and this is really very, very important, and this has come up as well, if you have filed, your, your uh, application has gone on environmental notice, during the time period, um, during the notice time period, there have been requests for further environmental review filed and they're still pending. You may not certify environmental compliance until we have finished the process and, and reviewed those requests. And at the current time, the system will let you certify, we're working on that, but you, you may not certify. And what's going to happen if you certify, we're just going to make you, we're going to undo that certification and make you start over. Uh, so that was basically the long and short of my little nuts and bolts and tips to hopefully make the process smoother. Uh, if you have any questions about environmental notice or uh, the environmental notice process, you can contact me or Aaron Goldschmidt, and our numbers and email addresses are on the resource sheet. That's it. Are, are there any questions for Vanya? You did a good job. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, I had one item I wanted to, to do very quickly in about a minute, which was to talk briefly about MOAs. And I've talked about MOAs and other training programs, but I wanted to remind everybody that it's with an earshot, and you can spread the word, please. If you have an adverse effect you're required to do an MOA, prepare an F a draft MOA, work it out with the SHPO, any consulting parties, the tribe, whomever, 
But before you go and get signatures and consider final, you need to send it to the FCC for review, which means you need to send by email a copy to me and a copy to Don Johnson so that we can look at it and make sure that the form is correct. Um, when there are more than three, three parties or more, it's, it's among, not between. Um, we also, well, it's, it matters. Um, also, mitigation measures, we, we like things that have a public benefit. We like projects that actually mitigate the adverse effect. So writing a check to an historical society uh, or even a tribe for an unnamed project to occur sometime in the next whatever doesn't work. It needs to be a specific mitigation measure for the historic property that's related to the adverse effect of the tower. Um, and I, th I think with, with those caveats in mind, if you send them before you go too much further to Don and I by electronic means, send us an email, um, then we can make sure that it gets going in the right direction. Uh, and also, I, I emphasize send things to us by email. A consultant sent me a big packet for a Form 620 because the state hadn't responded, and it went through our radiation process and security process, and it's a nice, solid lump of paper. Crispy I, paper. Yes, I can't do anything with it. <laughs> so don't send us paper mail. Plus, it, it comes very late. I mean, it takes well, it a while. Does, it, yes. it, there's a process. Yeah. Email is best. And, and, I, and I'll make a special mention that especially applies to the Connecticut Tower Siting Council <laughs> and who, whatever lawyer keeps on sending us all that stuff. Can't do anything with it. Anyway, so that's the end of that. Um, we're going to take a short break. I would encourage you, unless you really need to, to stay in the room while we get set up to transition to our, our next session. Um, just one more acknowledgement before we break. Um, Manya um, referenced Diane Dupert and Jonathan Jonas, who um, fortunately were um, in town today and able to come and be with us for a while. So introduce yourselves, and um, they'll be around during the break. I'm sure a lot of you have spoken with them over the years and maybe have met them and maybe haven't, but it's a good chance to get to know people. All right, <clears throat> we're we're now set for the last session of the day, and I think it's it's a session that that we've done before. I think it's been a very productive in, engagement and an opportunity for people in the room and, and folks on the on the webinar to um, listen to to not just Jeff Blackwell, who is the chief of our office of Native Affairs and Policy, and um, a tribal member, but also two TIPOs. Um, this year, I'm very happy to have um, Alvin Windy Boy, who was the TIPO for the Chippewa Cree at Rocky Boys Reservation in Montana, and um, his associate Neil, and then um, Everett Bandy is the, the tribal store preservation officer for the Quapaw Tribe in Oklahoma. So we've got two different regional uh, groupings for the, the tribes. And uh, I have the, and I with two very different perspectives. Um, I think you'll find them interesting. They both have presentations to make after Mr. Blackwell uh, makes his his remarks and moves us forward, and then we'll be able to answer questions. And um, we'll go as long as we're able to. We're we're constrained in some respects on the webinar, in the closed captioning ends at four o'clock, so that's a. A deadline, but we'll see what happens. So, with that, Jeff. Thank you, Steve. Hey, Jay Chukma. My name is Jeffrey Blackwell. I am the chief of the Office of Native Affairs and Policy. Uh, I am teased on almost a weekly basis by tribal leaders across the United States that yes, my professional title is actually chief. Uh, I've, uh, I've worked most of my professional career to become a chief. I just never thought it would be in the federal government. Um, so I would like for you folks to, uh, to take a deep breath and sit back. Uh, this is the portion of the program that 
Uh, we always try to make uh, issues that one deals with uh, at great distance or through the tower construction notification system uh, come alive. We are very fortunate to have the guests that we have here today from Indian Country. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about myself before, uh, before we begin, and I'll make just a few remarks to try to get us back on track or as close as possible uh, to the timing. Uh, I am a graduate of Dartmouth College and the University of Virginia School of Law. I am an attorney by training. I am also equally proud that I am a graduate of Tulsa Memorial Senior High School, uh, which actually is in the part of Tulsa, Oklahoma, that was originally deeded to the Muscogee Creek Nation. Uh, when I was 14, my mom taught me how to read the land title all the way back to the original Creek Alati, an eight-year-old Indian girl. Uh, I learned the history of Indian country from two parents, one who was a federal government leader and one who was a tribal government leader. Uh, I worked here at the commission before as a senior attorney and the liaison to tribal governments, and that's where I met Jeff Steinberg and his uh, fine team uh, dedicated to these issues. That's when I first joined the FCCs. At that time, we called it the NEPA team. Uh, our jurisdiction has grown. Now we call it the infrastructure team. Uh, I feel very fortunate... Um, to have spent six years here. I went back to work in Indian country for Chickasaw Nation Industries and was an appointed tribal leader. I make that distinction because I was not elected by a tribal population. I was appointed to a post by tribal leaders from across the United States. I chaired the National Congress of American Indians Telecommunications Subcommittee. Uh, after six years of working in Indian country, I came back to the FCC to help make good on a promise that the FCC had made almost 16 years ago now, to create an office dedicated to working uh, with tribal nations. Uh, there are three sovereigns recognized in the United States Constitution, federal government, tribal governments, and state governments. And you will hear tribal leaders talk about their inherent sovereignty. It is a subtle but very important point under federal law that state sovereignty is created by the Constitution. Tribal sovereignty is recognized by the Constitution. So we have an Office of Native Affairs and Policy at the FCC because of this inherent tribal sovereignty, a unique and special government-to-government -government relationship with tribal governments. There are 566 federally recognized tribal governments in the United States, 229 of those in Alaska, 109 are in California, 40 are in Oklahoma, 25, about 21 to 25 each in Arizona and New Mexico, and then eight to ten in several western states. The Office of Native Affairs and Policy was created for several purposes, chiefly because we have an incredible digital divide that persists on tribal lands across the United States. Tribal lands are federal enclaves that sound just like what they are called, reservations. They were lands that were reserved for tribal occupancy, where populations were put out of the way to deal with the aboriginal interests in the United States. And as a result, tribal lands did not benefit from certain historical periods of infrastructure development in the United States. The Rural Electrification Act, the Eisenhower Interstate System, the first major piece of, of policy making that uh, involved a nationwide infrastructure that Indian country was actually earnestly included in was actually the National Broadband Plan. It was uh, created by the Commission just a few short years ago. The Office of Native Affairs and Policy, our responsibility is to advise the Chairman and the Commissioners and all of the bureaus and offices all the way down from their Bureau Chiefs to their staff attorneys on matters that involve federal Indian tribes, uh, federal Indian law and policy. We are created to breathe life into the rules, uh, to create an, an, an agency-wide agenda uh, regarding tribal nations. A large part of the work that we do continues to be the work with the infrastructure team on a particular area of work that the FCC does under the National Historic Preservation Act. In federal Indian law, the strongest rights that tribal nations have are those that are articulated by Congress. And uh, Section 106 has become shorthand for an entire body of law and policy related to uh, the preservation and advancement, if you will, of tribal culture. Uh, viewed by tribal nations, Section 106 is the only piece of legislation that actually protects tribal cemeteries in the United States. For many tribal nations, they feel as though it is the only 
piece of legislation that will allow them to learn where their people were, where their people were buried in the mass exoduses to these, uh, to these reservations. It is very interesting and challenging work. I thank each of you who've come. Uh, I see several familiar faces over the years of folks we've worked with who've worked very diligently with the Commission to try to craft rules and policies that work for all uh, involved parties. But also today, it's a very hot day. It's the hottest day of 2015 so far this year. And uh, it's such a wonderful uh, room that we're in with such a wonderful view of the Potomac right over there. So uh, appreciate you coming and spending time with us. Uh, I want to finish my brief remarks by telling you I'd like to introduce a couple of folks who are here from the Office of Native Affairs and Policy. I'm going to introduce them and embarrass them and ask them to either stand or wave. No, stand, please. Irene Flannery and Sayuri Rajapaksa. Irene is my deputy chief in the office. Uh, Sayuri is our new senior legal advisor. Uh, we're very happy to have Sayuri with us. She actually managed. Uh, she was the... Uh, the lead attorney on the $300 million uh, mobility fund for the Wireless Bureau before she came over to, uh, to ONAP. Uh, with that, I want to make sure that you also know that um, uh, not only am I an enrolled member of the Muscogee Creek Nation, I am also a member of the Nkesebe clan of the Omaha tribe. I'm going to tell you a little bit about a place called Haskell Indian Nations University a little bit later, introducing one of our speakers. But uh, the Inkesabi, Inkesabi means black shoulder, and it is the black shoulder of the buffalo. Uh, that's what it refers to. Uh, it is wonderful to work in an area of law and policy where both the modern and the historical meet. So uh, I hope that you have uh, a rich experience in this panel, and I also hope that you have uh, good questions. Uh, if you do not, I certainly do have several questions to put it to this panel. Uh, with that, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, um, he is a gentleman that I have known uh, and been aware of virtually my entire life, uh, and it's not just because he has uh, really cool cowboy hats. Uh, Alvin Windyboy Sr. Uh, comes from a distinguished tribal family dedicated to public uh, service and to tribal service. Uh, he is currently the Tribal Historic Preservation Officer of the Chippewa Cree Tribe of the Rocky Boys Reservation in Montana. He is also a member of his tribe. Uh, and he has held several senior posts in Indian country. I'm going to mention just a few of them to give you an idea of what a rich uh, uh, wealth of knowledge and experience that Mr. Windy Boy has. He is the former chairman of the Kip Chippewa Cree Tribe of the Rocky Boys Reservation. He is the former chairman of the Montana-Wyoming Tribal Health Board. He is the former chairman of the National Tribal Leaders Diabetes Committee and the National Tribal Diabetes Council. He's the former vice chairman of the National Tribal Self-Governance Advisory Committee. Now, that is a big deal. Self-governance is a code word for a number of strategies that tribal nations and the federal government have used to return home rule and rebuild tribal nations. He's the former president of the Montana-Wyoming Montana -Wyoming Indian Stock Growers Association and secretary of the National Intertribal Agriculture Council. I first became aware of Mr. Windy Boy as a student in college. Uh, my father, who was a tribal leader, was involved in tribal health issues as well. And uh, of the many honors that Mr. Windy Boy has received over the years, there is one that I wish to mention uh, in particular uh, because of that familial connection. In 2000, the National Indian Health Board chose Mr. Windy Boy to receive its top honor, the Jake White Crow Award, for his work promoting native health care issues. Um, he is joined by Mr. Neil Rosette of his office. Uh, the last thing that I would tell you about uh, Mr. Windy Boy is that in Indian country, we think generationally. Uh, my generation of American Indians is just coming to its opportunity to serve in, in different capacities and leadership. And we have excellent examples like Mr. Windy Boy to look to uh, as we move into leadership. So with that, I would like to introduce uh, Mr. Alvin Windy Boy Sr. of the Chippewa Cree Tribe of Rocky Boys Reservation. Thank you. I just had a, forgot his name. <laughs> just stand. But you know, if you could rise, I'd appreciate it. 
Okay, you can sit down now. I forgot what it felt like to be tribal chairman and in, and in control. So I just had to brush off some cobwebs. You know, it's an honor for me to be here. I, I certainly uh, appreciate uh, coming back to the hum humidity. We don't have that in Montana. We, uh, we have 40, 50 below weather, which is, brings the rawness out of a man. And uh, <clears throat> I, 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 I come here as a friend. I come here as an advocate. And I come here as a future friend to you. I haven't been involved uh, uh, very much with the Federal Communications until recently. And it, uh, <clears throat> we in Indian country uh, also have, uh, have wishes and desires. I remember, <clears throat> I remember the first time we had electricity I was about a 21, 22-year-old, a rambunctious young fella back in 73. And uh, let alone a uh, telephone, what we'll take a rotary phone, up until about 1982. But then to make a phone call, we had to go nine miles to my, to my uncle's place, let alone TV. We never had that. But uh, time has, has progressed forward, and... And all I wanted to do is be a part of that. If it's called progress, well, I too want to be part of that progress. And <clears throat> to where we're at today, FCC and the, and the phones, uh, uh, the problem that I see in not only Indian country, but country in general is people are having to have muscles in their neck. And they're having muscles in their neck because they're always looking down, <laughs> playing with their phone. Well, that happens at home. Kind of reminds me of these three Indians. Uh, there was a Cheyenne Indian, there was a Cinnaboyne Indian, and there's a Cree Indian. There's three old guys who are sitting there on a, on, a, on a bench one day, and pretty soon these six young guys come. One guy, young kid said, hey, we should go help, see what these old guys, see what we can do for them. So they went over to the hat, and uh, the one young guy told these old guys, hey, grandpas. You need you need anything? <clears throat> One old the Cheyenne guy said, Ah, uh, no. He said, You sure? <clears throat> yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure. He said. Pretty soon a phone rang, huh? Ring and everybody's looking around with each other. Lad. Pretty soon a Cheyenne guy said, Oh, uh, that, that's me. He said, uh, right, I'll, I'll get this. He put his punched his hand like that and he answered the phone. Yeah. Okay, I'll call him later. Okay, honey, I love you too. He clicked that cheese at the Cinnaboyne, that Cree guy looked at each other. Hey, that's pretty good. Cheyenne said, yeah, we uh, Cheyennes are real innovative. Rather than carry these things around the hat, we had this little chip put in here, the hat. So we never lose it. Oh, that's good. All of a sudden that phone rang again. Huh? That Cheyenne went like this. Oh, that's not me. Kept ringing and ringing. First one, that Cinnaboyne guy said, "Oh, that's me." He said, "We too like these Cheyennes. We're we're pretty innovative too." Wait, he said. He punched one hand in the head. Yeah, honey, I'll call him when I get done. I'll, I'll check my email here. Wait. He went like this, and I'll call him later. So he punched that. Geez, that Cree guy looked at him. Hey, that's real good. He said, "Damn, that's good." He said. Pretty soon, he said, "Yeah, we're like that Cheyenne. We not only had a." Cell phone chip put here, but we also had our email over here. Hey, that's good. Pretty soon the phone rang again. Uh, kept ringing and ringing. Pretty soon the Cheyenne guy said, hey, that's not me. And the uh, Cinnaboy guy said, oh, it's not me here or here, he said. The phone kept ringing. And pretty soon that crew, he didn't want to be outdone. Oh, that's me. Just a second. I'll be right back. He went around around the corner. He come back. He had a bunch of toilet, dragging a bunch of toilet paper in the back. I have to go get a fax, he said. <laughs> <laughs> so we too in Indian country we want to be modern but we want to be modern in our own way and in our, in our own capacity back in 1917 my grandfather and grandmother uh, were a little older then and uh, the first time they camped they had nothing because now they couldn't go hunt beyond certain boundaries there was no elk, no deer buffalo since then gone and uh 
the leader of the that band said uh, told the general that our, our our little ones our little ones are are hungry so the general said I'll bring food provisions tomorrow 30 miles away the nearest fort came by about four wagons full of food they made announcement all head of head of household come to the wagon so they all did my great grandfather he came and went back to his tent with two big boxes my great grandmother they opened up boxes and there was a watermelon cantaloupe a scaba all these plants they looked at them there was uh, food that was foreign to them but they were going to improvise maybe my grandma great grandma thought she hit it a hollow noise hey maybe we're supposed to fry it huh? so she cut that watermelon hat she fried oh, it didn't work well maybe we're supposed to boil it so she cut another one up boiled it huh? it didn't work huh? well maybe we're supposed to eat it just like that so that's how they lived for several days and I say that because that's what the United States government gives us things that are foreign to us my philosophy is if you're gonna give me something let me create it and let me show you that something that's going to work and what I'm going to show you is something that works not only for me but can also works for my tribe and it can also work for the rest of Indian country if they take the took the time to listen and understand because I have an answer as well as 565 other federally recognized tribes have an answer as the problem is is wanting to think outside you know you guys say think outside the box well I say us I think outside the teepee sometimes we have to do that to get what we want one of the things that when I when my uh, when I, they first asked me to uh, to run the cultural resource preservation department was I told my then archaeologist you know you know I don't want to be doing this same thing redundantly next year so I what we've created is, is, is a model. It's a model that, that, uh, that certainly uh, allows us to, uh, to think outside the teepee, to create a, a process that's conducive and that works for industry. It also works for the United States government. You know, uh, five, three years ago, I attended a meeting in Denver with uh, five federal agencies, Department of Defense, Department of Energy, Department of Interior, USDA, and I forget the other one, Department of Commerce. And they were boasting, hey, I got, we have this uh, interagency agreement. It ain't worth the paper that it's written on in my, in my books. Why? Because it doesn't allow me as a tribal, tribal individual to be part of the discussion that's going to create change where I come from. So with that, I have plans for that. That's going to make, and the only way that, that change happens in this country is in the halls of Congress. That's where, the, that's where it has to begin. Because it's like, it's like that uh, soldier man bringing that fruit out, foreign to us. So as, and as we, as, as we go on, I, uh, I, I, I certainly... Uh, I have to laugh. I met this gentleman. We do a lot of work with GSS, and uh, they sent me a fruit basket uh, about before Christmas, and I had to laugh because it reminded me of that story of my great grandpa and great grandma when they brought me this fruit. So anyway, uh, this gentleman I have along that I brought with me is, is uh, for a lack of better word, is my tail. And the reason I, tell, I say that he's my tail, it's his generation that is going to step in my place. Because I'm not going to be here forever. I'm, I'm at the age of, uh, I'm ready to retire. I've got uh, 15 kids. My youngest is two years old. And I want to I wanna, I wanna show them what life is really about. Gagi nehi ego man stohtamag. Gagi pikskwatag. That's what's important. That's what makes me who I am. I can show you 
the Sundance Lodges, the Rain Dance Lodges, this, all the ceremonies that we have, that's what makes me who I am. And that's important in my native way of life. And that should be the rest of Amer rest of Indian country's way of life. The thing that hit us in Indian country alongside the head that is very foreign to us is drugs and alcohol. I'm proud to always say that I have always been drug and alcohol free. But it's the generations behind me that, that concern me. And that's the concern of the elders that I work with. So with that, as, as, we, as we progressed, uh, we, uh, I was tired of, tired of FCC sending me all these huge documents. And as, before I start the, uh, start the, uh, the slide, this is me. This is me when, uh, when I was doing, uh, doing this work. That's really me, but. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe he fell asleep. But anyway, uh, we would, one company, we would get about 300 pages of documents in one week. And it was my responsibility to go through all that. In the back of my mind, I kept thinking, but isn't there some federal legislation that says uh, something about the Paper Reduction Act or something like that? <laughs> and uh, this kept going on and on like that. And uh, finally, I, I, I kept thinking, a little girl about 10 years old, 11 years old, my one of my daughters, she said, Daddy, you got to get with, you got to get with the program. Uh, what program? <laughs> you know, that computer is in. You need to do it, work it that way. So that all stuck in my mind. And, and I'm, not a, I'm not a computer kind of guy, but I better get somebody that is. And uh, so we started this, uh, this, uh, this process utilizing consultation. And as as we go on, I'm going to have Neil kind of get into the guts and bolts of how this is done. And uh, uh, it's to the point now we've brought on another tribe, the Shosh uh, Eastern Shoshone tribe, where we're going to be doing all their work. So those of you that in the, in the industry, when you see Eastern Shoshone, it's like that eagle. They're going to be under our wing but this is just one one month from one company the picture on the left now everything i do now wherever i'm at i could be riding a horse i could be on a track dragon i can go through all this it makes it so much easier so with that i want neil to kind of go through what the projects that we're doing thank you Alvin, and thank you uh, fcc and industry folks that are here, as well as the railroad folks, uh, it's a pleasure to be here uh, and show you what uh, the Chippewa Creek Tribe has done to uh, uh, make the consultation process more, more uh, uh, reasonable, not just for us, but for the industry folks that we, that we have uh, uh, here in the room. Uh, first of all, I just want to say the Chippewa Creek Tribe is, uh, uh, was established by executive order in 1916. Uh, it's home to the Rocky Boys. The Rocky Boys Reservation is home to the Chippewa Creek Tribe, and we're located in rural north central Montana, uh, about 128,000 acres, what we live on. It's all trust property, meaning the, the tribe owns every acre, and the federal government holds that land in trust for us. Uh, the government, we have nine tribal 
uh, elected officials, eight councilmen and one chairman. Uh, we are a self-governance tribe, and as Mr. Uh, Blackwell mentioned earlier, Alvin was on that. You know, there's, uh, I might interject there, in Indian country, when people say there's 568 federally recognized tribes, well, each of those 560, you guys watch uh, uh, that game show, Price is Right? You know that one game where you get up way up on top, they call that plinko? They drop that hill and land somewhere down there. Well, in Indian country, we're that same way. There's three types of lands in Indian country. Trust land, a lot of land, and fee patent land. And those 568 are going to fall in one place. Likewise, tribal governments. There are three types of tribal governments that the, the, how services are delivered to their people. There's those that are, that are direct type services, uh, direct type services, and those that are contracted. And the third one is those that are compacted. I look at that as uh, the direct type services are those projects that are administered by the Bureau of Indian Affairs or the Indian <coughs> Health Service. The contract tribes are those tribes that have limited ability to carry forth functions associated for their people. The third type is self-governance, where the tribe literally assumes those responsibilities. If you ever see that sign, the buck stops here, the buck does literally stop with those self-governance tribes. In Montana, the seven tribes, there are two compact tribes, Chippewa Cree tribes, Salish Kootenai. Our tribal membership is approximately 6,200 tribal members, of which about 3,800 live right on our Indian reservation. Uh, our Aboriginal homelands extend from Pennsylvania all the way to, to Montana. So when there's a project, uh, a TCNS project or a cell tower or a PTC project that occurs in any one of those nine states that we, we call our Aboriginal homelands, we, we naturally want to consult, well, at least look at it and consult if, if required on, on, on those types of projects. Any, anytime there's a ground disturbing activity, we want to consult. Uh, uh, our, our mission statement is to inspire traditional values that relate to the Ojibwa and Nehio uh, way of life for its people through established culture, history, language, and life. And that's uh, the, the Cultural Resource Preservation Department, of which Alvin is the uh, tribal historic preservation officer is is very important to our tribe. Uh, Mr. Windy Boy, as as you probably well know now, is one of the one of our tribal historians, basically, and one of our elders. Or, I don't <laughs> not an elder, I guess. He keeps telling me not to call him an elder, but he really he's an elder statesman of our tribe. So, <laughs> as you know, the legal authority that allows us to to provide consultation uh, or to to receive consultation from various federal departments is through Executive Order One Three. 175, which was signed by uh, then President Clinton back in uh, 2000, November 6th of 2000. Also, the NHPA Section 106, National Historic Preservation Act Section 106, and that's that's the reason why we are involved with with consulting on the FCC-related projects. Um, we do things a little different. We we what we've done is we've created a. Uh, oops, sorry about that. We've created a, a, a uh, platform uh, based on, uh, on, on a database that, w that is specific to, to our consultation uh, requirements as a tribe. Uh, w one thing I would like to uh, commend the FCC on is the fact that they've got a platform as well, uh, internet-based platform that, that uh, uh, companies will, will, fi will file a, uh, a, uh, re a proposed project onto that site. We interact with that site on a daily basis, uh, at least on a weekly basis, I guess, and we reply to projects that are submitted to that site from the various companies around, around, around our, in our Aboriginal homelands. And we've, we've also talked to other federal agencies about possibly uh, utilizing that methodology in their, in their, in their projects. Uh, because we believe that 21st century is here. We believe that the internet and, and interacting on a, on, a, on a digital scale is the, is the way to go. Uh, we're, able to, we're able to proceed with uh, uh, you know, handling projects in that timely manner. 
not just for us but for the for the consultants that are that are out there uh, doing this for the industry um, our, our tribal consultation includes uh, 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 a consultation request and then a review of a project and then some t type of action whether it be a field tech requested on the site or we clear the project and say we have this this project will have no adverse effect on a cultural resource that's significant to our tribes uh, this here uh, that's part of the uh, process that we go through once we get a request. Uh, we, we do provide a, uh, we do uh, a charge a fee for our consultation, uh, and, th and that fee is based on uh, uh, what it takes for us as a staff to go through that uh, process uh, from everything from staff time to open the project to review it to, uh, uh, you know, the accounting, the, the lights, the, the O&M that it takes our tribe, our tribal uh, 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 cultural resource department to actually provide a responsible review of any project that comes up through the FCC system and through any other systems. Uh, that that there is a uh, uh, a screenshot of what we see every day. This is that's our database right there. Uh, the company that actually uploads their information onto our beta database with their new projects. They see a different screen. But essentially, this is what we see on the right there, our list of projects, our list of, of uh, act, recent activity that hap happened with our, with our uh, uh, from, a, from a company submitting information onto our system. Uh, we, uh, we're very uh, uh, efficient at it. We're caught up with, uh, with all the PTC projects right now. There's nothing that will ever go 30 days unless we don't get the information from the railroads. Uh, the other projects, the other uh, cell tower type projects out there, we, you know, we're caught up on those as well. We're very, uh, once, once we get a project uploaded to our site and that payment is made, we can turn around that project in a couple days at, at the most. So we're not, we don't slow up the system for industry. We actually have made it to where industry is very happy with our system, and you'll see some of the testimonials at the end. And, and we're very happy with how it works through FCC. FCC has created a, their database to where it's, it's interactive with us. It, it helps us as a tribe to interact with the companies that are out there. Because once we give them our coordinates for our, for our Aboriginal homelands, it's plugged right into the FCC system. So when a project comes up in any one of our states, we reply, it automatically goes to that company, and we automatically see, see the project because it came up in our, in our Aboriginal homelands. And it, it works so well that we would kind of like FCC to show these other federal agencies how that works because we believe it can, we believe it can, uh, uh, it can lead to more, more of the federal agencies emulating what, what FCC is doing. Because that, to me, is true consultation when there's an interaction. It doesn't have to be an individual across the table from each other. It could be an interaction over the Internet. As long as that consultation occurs and that interaction is back and forth. Uh, so many times what we've seen is a federal agency will send our tribe a, uh, a document that says, do you want to consult on this? And it goes to our tribal chairman, who never, who doesn't understand what, where this came from, who it belongs to, and by the time Mr. Windy Boy gets it, it's too late to consult <laughs> because it sat on the chairman's office for for two months, and it was 30 days. He should have replied within 30 days. So, what happens is because we didn't reply, they said, "Well, the tribe's not interested." But I guarantee you, we are interested in projects that occur within our Aboriginal homelands because we're, that's our job, to protect cultural resources that are significant to our tribes. Uh, well, the reason why we charge a fee uh, is because we, have the, we don't have the resources to do these, these, these consultations uh, on a, on a uh, uh, global scale because we are a poor tribe. We don't, we're, not a, we're, not a, we're not a gaming tribe. There's a lot of gaming tribes out there that can afford to do this. We can't. The, the fees that we generate keep our office open and keep this consultation process moving forward. Uh, our fees were based on a CPA coming in and actually telling us that this is what you need to charge to operate your office. It doesn't come right out of the air. And I, I know we've talked to other industry folks. That tribes charge all these different types of fees. We don't know where they, you know, and that's not our business. We know our business is to, is to take uh, advice from our, from our consultants, being our CPAs and what, what have you, 
and using that as our basis because then we can justify it to, to industry that this is what it costs us. So we have to pass that price on to you so we keep our office open and this consultation process can continue. Uh, our consultations include uh, detailed review of the geographic region of the proposed project, uh, determine way, determine a determination of whether the proposed project location has known history of major sacred events, uh, encampments, uh, medicinal plants, and other significant markers that are significant just to our tribes. Uh, review of the proposed site to determine whether it has characteristics or potential properties, unknown sites, that make it more likely to have a cultural resource. Uh, one, of the, one of the things we look for is, it, is it located to a water, is it located near a water source? Are there other archeological finds within a, within a certain distance from that, from that site? And uh, you know, things that we look at, in fact, if you go on Google Earth and you could pinpoint the site, we've found sites where there were teepee rings within, a, within 20 feet, 50 feet from where that proposed site was supposed to go. And we could see them on Google Earth. And, and that's the first place I go when I, when I open up one of these new projects. I'll go to Google Earth, see exactly where it's at. And then I go back and we start reviewing the archaeological report and then our own history to determine whether it's something that we, we feel is very important to us. And the last thing is our staff commitment and time to review each project in a responsible and efficient manner for our tribe, not for anybody else, but for our tribe so that we can go back to our tribal government and tell them, hey, look, we're doing the best we can. We're being thorough, but we're also being efficient so we don't hold up projects uh, for, you know, that, that are moving along in, in a timely manner and that, that we're being responsible to our tribe and our tribal government. So uh, I think one thing that we, when we want to mention is that these, the contractors do need a better understanding of, of the consultation fee and the process uh, because Sometimes we'll get people that'll call us, some of the consultants will call us and say, well, you have a field monitor on site. Uh, we have to pay for that. Well, I've got three other tribes that want to come in here with the, a field monitor for the same job. We don't, we don't want that to happen either, just as much as the, the contractor doesn't want that to happen. We will defer those projects back to the tribe that's sitting closest to that project. If there's more than one tribe that wants a field monitor there, we're not going to say we need three field monitors there. The one tribe that has the most interest in that site or is closest, which will save the contractor or the contractor money, that's who we'll defer to. All we want is the report back from that, that job once the project is, is completed. And we've done that in the past. So I know there was a little, little issue with that uh, with some of, the, some of the industry folks. Uh, one of the things that we're going through in the next week or two weeks here is we're holding a tribal field uh, monitor certification training. We, we take this seriously. Our folks go through two weeks, 80 hours of intense training conducted by a archeologist and some other professionals to make sure that our monitors when they're out on site are trained and understand what they're looking for. They know the safety issues that are out there. We had issues with uh, uh, contractors asking if our folks were OSHA certified, uh, you know, be on a construction site for safety issues. Well, yeah, they are. <laughs> they're, 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 they're trained very well on what they're supposed to be doing out there. They're, you know, they, they, they fought, we follow a, a very strict regimen within our, within our tribe. So what we're trying to do is just let the industry know that, hey, look, we're professional at this. We know what we're doing. Trust us in, in understanding that. And I know you pay, you pay a fee to have this consultation done. But on the other hand, that fee is providing you the opportunity as well to get your projects completed, meet the Section 106 review process and, and the NEPA process, NHPA, so that you can, you can go about your business, get these projects done, and, and move, move along with your life. Uh, the other thing is uh, ongoing FCC consultation projects. Uh, I know, oops, positive train control, that was yesterday. <laughs> oops. Okay. Uh, one of the things that, that we've, we've discussed with, with some of the uh, FCC folks in the past was uh, understanding what true consultation is. And I think FCC is ahead of the game when you talk to these other federal departments, FCC has taken the, the uh, uh, 
the issue of tribal consultation seriously and you know it it's uh it's evident by their website that they have with the cns system we interact with that system like i said on an ongoing basis we uh you know we believe that if fcc would uh maybe share that information with some of these other federal agencies we would uh, uh we as tribes would be a lot better off we also have our own platform that i think industry is as uh as has worked with here in the past year that i think they're getting very happy with uh we do tweak it once in a while when industry you know we've asked the question to industry what what can we do to improve our system uh in the past year we've done a little over 4000 uh consultations uh over 3000 of 3000 almost 3400 of that 4000 have been closed out so that tells you we're going through a large volume, but we're doing it efficiently, we're doing it uh, uh, responsibly, and we're doing it in a way that, that's innovative. And I don't know if there's any other tribe doing it like we're doing it. I wish there were, and I think, I think we would all, all, everybody would be a lot more happy if we were all working on the same system, or you know, working to the same. Uh, these here are testimonials from some of our from our, some of our consultants that we work with, uh, uh, the online consultation is great. I don't know if there's anybody from CTL in here. Uh, Tri-Leaf, I think the website works pretty good. I love the interactive capabilities and the fact that we can see where our projects are in the review process on a daily basis. <laughs> if there's any, if there's any correspondent that goes back and forth, it goes back and forth through that process. It doesn't take forever to get an answer from us for for a particular project. We answer it pretty much daily. If there's if there's an email or a, if they go online and say we need something done, it's done. We we go act and we we act on things immediately. So, with that, Mr. Windy Boy, and I thank you guys for your time. Uh, I just want to say that you know in the in you know finally that. We feel like this this process and the way that we interact with the FCC is is innovative. We think that other tribes, uh, in fact, we are working with another tribe right now to access our platform, and hopefully by June 1st, that it, that other tribe will be online with you all with the industry, so that you know we can start. Other tribes can take advantage of this system, and the industry can move along with uh, with a system that works for them as well. So with that, I thank you. In reference to the training that he talked about, uh, that's going to be happening next week. We also incorporate uh, the training that gives it the uh, a traditional uh, understanding of not only the medicinal plants but the areas. How significant is when you go out in the field and see a teepee ring? Automatically, you think of oh, this is an old teepee, but it's more than just a teepee. Rock heron. There's a reason why rock herons are there. Uh, everything that's associated with this earth is also in line with uh, someone call it the constellation of the stars. We also provide our, our field techs the opportunity if there's a con if there's a uh, is a compound by a hundred by hundred, our field techs will go out and literally walk identify <coughs> all the medicinal plants associated with these two tribes. And uh, wa water. Someone talked about water this morning. That does have a very major positive impact to to my tribes sweet grass uh water and the list goes on we have several elder ladies that that are pro provide this direction to our field techs and there's a protocol process also before they even leave the reservation to a site so, so with that i want to thank you and thank you for the opportunity to provide to you a, a different way of doing business. Hi, hi. Brandon Everett Bandy is the Tribal Historic Preservation Officer for the Quapaw Tribe of Oklahoma. Uh, he is responsible for issues concerning historical and cultural preservation on tribal trust lands and for consulting with state and federal agencies and private businesses. He is the former director of public relations for the Quapaw Tribe, where he dealt with every aspect of external relations of the tribal nation. Uh, he is a graduate of Haskell Indian Nations University in Lawrence, Kansas, uh, with a degree in Indigenous and American Indian Studies. Uh, 
I am a third generation Haskell rascal. My, uh, I told you that my, my mother is Muscogee Creek and Omaha. That is a very strange mix. It is like, uh, for non-Indians, it is like being uh, Finnish and Peruvian. Uh, two very different uh, cultural uh, identities. Uh, and those uh, Haskell Indian Nations is a place where tribal members from across the United States, particularly the southern and northern plains, uh, met. And it is, a, uh, it is one of the, uh, the really important uh, uh, flashpoints of knowledge for uh, generations of American Indians. And uh, I feel as though I should say we've heard today from uh, a current and former tribal leader, uh, and we are going to hear from a future tribal leader, if I may be so bold. Um, while at Haskell, uh, Everett was a, a program assistant for Haskell Environmental Research Studies. He played an instrumental role in the 2014 agreement. Uh, I'm sorry, at his tribe, he played an instrumental role in the 2014 agreement signed between the Quapaw Tribe and the Arkansas National Guard, implementing a statewide integrated cultural resource management plan protecting and enhancing sacred sites and other historical and cultural resources in the state of Arkansas, where the, where the Quapaw lived for hundreds of years prior to Arkansas statehood. He is both a scholar and a person steeped in the history and traditions of his tribal nation. He also knows his way around the business end of an archeological site, uh, but he can also explain both the modern practices and cultural implications of, uh, of Quapaw Society uh, in modern times. So please help me by uh, welcoming uh, Brandon Everett Bandy of the Quapaw Tribe. That was quite the introduction. I don't know if I can live up to all that, but I guess I'll try. Um, can you, yeah, there we go. Let's see if this will work better for me. Um, I don't really need to really introduce myself, I guess. I don't know what else to say, so I'll just jump into it. Um, I was asked to kind of briefly describe uh, the Quapaw tribe, and so I'm going to try and talk short. I don't want to keep you guys too long, but um, kind of follow in from where we come from to who we are today and where our office fits into all that, and then delve into TCNS and what that uh kind of what our experience is with it. So um, briefly, I'm going to talk about just um, our views on our our beliefs on uh, how we were created. And then um, it says Degaha split and tribal name, which is kind of the same thing. You'll understand that in a minute. And removal, that's kind of a prehistory before we got to Oklahoma. So we have... Um, as Jeffrey Blackwell mentioned, he's in KSLV clan. We have a number of clans, and they all kind of uh, organize in two halves. Um, we have five tribes that are closely related, the Omaha, the Ponca, the Osage, the Kaw, and the uh, Quapaw, myself, our tribe. And um, so all of our clans, they kind of sit on two halves. And um, all of our clans, they have their own creation story. And they, we believe that whenever we were created, then all of our clans found each other and they spoke the same language, so they decided to make basically a nation together. And um, eons ago, that was uh, what what the archaeologists like to call Degaha people. Um, but eventually we broke apart into the five tribes that I had named earlier. And so our name, Okachba, uh, refers to when we, we were the first ones that broke off. And... Um, so we came upon this river, the Ohio River, and uh, there's different versions to the story, you know, but the way that we say it, um, we were uh, all using this uh, braided rope uh, made out of grapevine. I guess they must have been in a hurry or something because they didn't have like a real rope. And um, a fog came up and the rope broke. So our people floated down the river. Ukah was like when you break off and go down. And um, so they call us the downstream people. In, a, in other words, in English is uh, what people translate that as. And um, so that's kind of who we are and where we come from. We believe that we came from um, the area where the ocean and um, the land meet, so the east coast somewhere. And then we moved kind of into the what the archaeologists like to call the Ohio River Valley. And um, 
<clears throat> then we went down the Ohio River into Arkansas, and while we were in Arkansas, we encountered uh, Europeans, which was a drastic change. But I was going to show you just a couple uh, images of some of our pottery from Arkansas, um, just to kind of give you an idea of kind of work that our um, people do. One of my coworkers, who's uh, very well known in this field, kind of describes um, our tribe as sort of bohemian pot slingers. We were known for <laughs> we were known for uh, selling for selling our pottery, and um, archaeologists can determine if it actually came from our state based on the temper and the soil. And there's been pieces of our, of our pottery from Arkansas found as far away as California or Canada. And um, there were three robes that we actually made and gave to the French. This is the most well-studied one. Um, it's called the Three Villages Robe. It actually depicts, um, let me see if I can kind of point the laser. Those three villages there are actually three Quapaw villages. And then there's a French post, and it shows us going um, and attacking the Chickasaws. And uh, the French actually, I guess, gave us guns to do this. But um, we've commemorated it by making this robe and the French actually wrote, you can't hardly see it in the picture, but they actually wrote notes over each one of the villages and it's kind of an interesting robe just showing who we were um, before removal. And then this is just uh, uh, showing a buffalo dance that they did prior to going on a hunt and um, then they called this one the chief's robe. Um, my primary chief's clan was the snake clan. Uh, and you can't hardly make them out anymore because they're faded, but they call them calumets in English. There's like these pipes that are on there. So I'm, I'm not going to go into too much detail on all that, but after uh, in 1817, we signed the first treaty that we uh, had with the United States government, and we ceded um, basically all of the state of Arkansas, um, half the state of Oklahoma, a portion of Louisiana and Mississippi, in exchange for, or excuse me, and we reserved um, a portion of land near Little Rock, uh, extending south, I think about 100 miles. That's just off the top of my head, though. Um, almost 10 years later, in 1824, we signed another treaty where we were forced into um, giving up our reservation, and they wanted to combine us with the Caddo tribe and put us in uh, Texas, which did not work. Um, so we actually kind of secretly went back to Arkansas, and they found us, and so they sent us to Oklahoma, um, and that's where we remain. And in 1896, um, the government was going around and allotting, conducting allotment, the Dawes Rolls, and so we were the only tribe in Oklahoma that actually self-allotted. Uh, we had land in Kansas that was removed from us, and so we were familiar with what was coming. And so we developed a plan and proposed it to Congress and had our own allotment act. And as a result, um, nearly every member of our tribe got 300 acres as opposed to the 160 or 120. And so we allotted our entire reservation, although we still lost portions of it later. And I guess probably because we're such a small tribe, we actually were able to retain a traditional form of government until 1957, which is extremely unique in Indian country, especially in Oklahoma because of something called the IRA, or Indian Reorganization Act, in 1932. Um, the government forced a lot of tribes to reorganize, quote unquote, into a government that more resembled the European model, or excuse me, the American model. And um, we were actually able to avoid that until we got a settlement, and we didn't have a written form of government, so they forced us to get a written form of government that we continue to operate on today. Um, but that's just kind of a, I guess I should have showed that slide while I was talking. That's just kind of a brief overview of where we came from and moving into today. You know, we still operate on this form of government, and as of today, we have, um, excuse me, I checked uh, yesterday, we have 4,746 tribal members. I guess that's not a very large to most tribes, but uh, we have two casinos, two gas stations, um, I think it's four fire departments, and I don't even know. We have two daycares. The list goes on and on. We've been uh, most of that has been developed within the last 10 years. Um, so we've been trying to grow and diversify our economy, and we put a large emphasis on preserving our history. So I'll get into that in a minute. I just want to show you a couple pictures. They say a picture is worth a thousand words. So this here is uh, Maud Supernaw. She was. Um, I'm, I'm not going to talk about each one of these, but I just want to briefly mention to give some explanation um, about 
cultural history, people wonder how we know sort of these types of things, like about sites, pre-removal. This lady, I think, lived to be 108, we call her Grandma Superna, and she, um, her father um, was a chief pre-removal, up into removal, and his father was a chief in Arkansas. So she lived up into the 70s, and her grandfather, her father's father, was a chief when we were pre-removal. And the medals that she's holding in her hands are actually from 1801, and the other one is from, I think, 1870-something. But she also has a medal that you can't see. I don't think she's holding that picture from the Spanish, when the Spanish, they called, uh, they called where we lived, uh, the Louisiana, I guess. So anyway, um, all the way that far back, we have family heirlooms and stories. Um, we have her on tape talking about what our tribe did during the war of, eight, um, excuse me, the the New Madrid uh, earthquake in 1812, um, how we responded to that. So these are the, I just kind of wanted to use that as an illustration of where this information comes from that we use to consult why we view certain places as important. It's been passed down that far. I thought that was a really nice picture to show you that that's where it comes from. Um, these pictures, I'm not going to go into that much detail on, but these are pictures of my tribe ranging in dates from 1880 to maybe like 1960, I think. And um, almost every one of these pictures that I picked is actually displaying an uh, important site to my tribe that is not in the SHPO's list. So I'll come back to that point later, but <clears throat> just to kind of give you a idea of who we are and what we look like. And it kind of comes into today. You can see an image of our dance that we have every year, and a little bit more modern. And then these are pictures of our uh, current tribal council <clears throat> at some of the ribbon cuttings. Um, the, actually, the top one is from the uh, Catholic 40, is what it's called, a site that we gave the Catholic Church. Um, one of our tribal members gave the Catholic Church to create a mission. And um, they, we have led on our land, or did, and um, so the United States government mined it out and created the what at one time was the largest Superfund site in the United States, known, known as Tar Creek. And the Catholic Church, I guess, capitalized on that. They closed the school and allowed the government to come in and mine out everything and, of course, took the money and then eventually gave us back the land after it had been destroyed, pretty much. And um, we recently conducted a cleanup and finished that. So it was the first tribally-led uh, cleanup of a Superfund site in the United States. And um, we're trying to basically do things like that, be responsible for the community around us, work with them, and develop our economy. And I just thought that would kind of illustrate some of those points. But our office, um, the TIPO office, was founded in 2010 but it actually draws from the work of a number of individuals. Um, Alvin mentioned something yesterday I thought was really nice. He says, in, in, Indians aren't supposed to brag, and my people, we have a way of saying that. We say, uh, you know, you must try to be humble. And I thought that was a good point to bring up again here. That kind of gets lost, I think, in the larger context of dealing with people, but we do say that we can talk good about other people, so I'm going to give you a brief. Um, our chairman used to be on the advisory council. Um, so that makes my job much easier. So a lot of tribes don't have chairmen that understand historic preservation, whereas our chairman is actually on the advisory council. And uh, he did instrumental work in setting up our office, and he's been very involved with um, a number of issues in historic preservation. Um, when we first began to do consultation NAGPRA, um, Carrie V. Wilson is a member of our tribe, and she's currently our NAGPRA director. Uh, she, she set all that up initially. And um, she was appointed by our general council, which is basically um, the voting body of our tribe. And um, she has repatriated more human remains than any, other, than any other single person in the United States. So we're a bit proud of that. We have a very large archaeological presence in Arkansas. And then um, my predecessor, immediate pre predecessor, still works for our office in a reduced role. She needed to uh, step back a little bit. She still does a lot of work for us, and um, that's Jean Ann Lambert. And then we have a number of tribal elders that work on projects with our office that provide us valuable information, and we're doing uh, everything we can to sort of record that, kind of alluded to pieces of that earlier. And then um, I'm not going to sit here and read every piece of this, but I wanted to give you sort of the big picture of what our offices do, because I think 
so many people in TCNS, I get a call, and they don't understand why I can't expedite a review. They don't get it. Why, why, why can't I do that? So um, I can't see the upper part with the captions, but the upper part's describing where, uh, where we set up our office. And um, under 101D of the National Historic Preservation Act in 2010, we set up our office and assume certain TIPO roles and functions. And that's the way every TIPO office is, is sort of created if they're actually a TIPO under the National Park Service. But the brief sort of Reader's Digest version is we didn't take, I think, three of the SHPO roles. And we took all the rest of them, and that's administering federal assistance. So that's we have to do our own budgeting, reporting, and federal drawdown of money from our grant, which sounds like it wouldn't be that much work, but it actually is if you dealt with federal grants. And then historic preservation planning. We have to do long-term planning to preserve the sites that we have on trust land, as well as any other sites that we care to try and preserve. And then inventory and survey, I have to work with our business committee, cultural committee, tribal elders, and anyone else, such as archaeologists, to try and incorporate information into our database. Otherwise, it'd be useless if you send me a project and you tell me where it is. I need somewhere to compare and make sure that there's nothing there. So we create a database, and um, that consumes a fair amount of time. We're constantly growing that database. And um, then review and compliance, that's the biggest part of my job, consultation with partners and cooperation with partners, which are actually two different functions under the CFR. And then um, Section 106, Compliance and Mitigation Standards, that's where TCNS fits in. So out of all these things that I just listed, that's where TCNS is. And um, so we average anywhere between pre-PTC, I think it was about three to 400 TCNS projects a year, post-PTC, four to 600, something like that. Um, and Section 106 notifications can vary greatly, but I think last year I had about 3,900. So basically, I'm the only person in the office on a day-to-day -day basis. That means I have to read every one of those things. And then when people call me and wonder why they, you know, I asked for something and they sent it to me and I didn't respond within 24 hours, that's why. But um, the National Register nominations and preservation outreach and education, which actually is this, for example, I could claim this on my grant. Um, but <coughs> the way we do cell phone tower review to kind of hone in on that, um, we, you, we do use the TCNS website, which not every tribe does, but uh, we have it set up to send an automatic response any time that an applicant submits something that's within our area of interest, they should automatically get something back from us. And then we try to go in and send a courtesy email and um, give them more details, make sure that they actually got our email. And then we um, have all of these details posted on our tribal website if in case anyone never needs to reference it or if they don't, um, for some reason, feel like it's up to date, then they can check our website, which is always up to date. And um, I wanted to talk about why, what do we request and why and our area of interest map. How did we come up with this thing? So we asked for the TCNS number on every single thing that we get. It seems really obvious to me, but you'd be amazed how many applicants don't do that. If you send me a check and there's no TCNS number on it, what am I going to do with it? I mean, I don't know. I guess I could just cash it and take it home, but I'd probably get in trouble for that. So um, anyhow, I ask everybody to do that, and at least probably once every other month I get a check with no TCNS number, and I have to call someone, but that's a huge thing. TCNS numbers need to be on the top of everything. Some people get that, some people don't. Um, archaeological reports are considered extremely important to us. We expect shovel tests when necessary or an explanation of why they weren't performed. So if you're doing a co-location, obviously, there's no reason for you to go out there and do a shovel test. But, you know, it's, it's kind of a work with us basis, you know. But if, if, it's, if there's a good chance you need to do an archaeological report, we're going to expect it. And um, we explain that in our emails. And we also expect historic archive findings. Basically, I expect you to do some kind of research in that archaeological report. Some people don't want to do that for some reason. But um, it kind of gives us some more background information. It shows us that you went to the SHPO office. The SHPO has some information that tribes may not. And conversely, tribes have information that the SHPOs don't. The entire reason you must send them to both of us. Um, and we expect maps. Uh, I also don't get maps with certain things. It's kind of hard for me to tell if you say latitude, longitude. You know, I could take the time, but I'd much rather prefer you just give me a map. 
And um, depending on the project and where it is, we sometimes require SHPO comments. We don't typically, some tribes always require them. The only time we require them is uh, if I'm sort of on the fence about a project, if I think there's a potential for something to be there, but I don't actually have really good information, then I'll wait for them to, the SHPO to respond. Because the SHPO will oftentimes have better information in a state where we no longer are. And so that's about the only time that I actually require a SHPO comment which I will send an email to the applicant and say, we need to have the SHPO comment before we can issue a determination. Um, I do want to mention a couple things. Uh, the importance of archaeological work. I have a lot of applicants that don't understand why archaeological work is important. They'll say, oh, well, the soil bed's disturbed, or you know, this or that. They'll have a million different reasons why they don't want to do it. And I have one reason, and it's the only reason I need. There still might be something there. I don't care how long it's been disturbed. There was a site near, well, I'll just say it was in northeastern Arkansas, that had been plowed for the last 70 years, repeatedly. And the farmer went out there and plowed it once, and it rained, removed one and a half of an inch of topsoil, and exposed a major archaeological site. And there was 76 minimum number of individuals exposed from one plow and one rain. And it was plowed for 70 years. So you can't tell me that just because it was plowed for the last 40 years, it doesn't need an archaeological site. I could list examples like that all day long. That's just a quick, brief one. Um, and the importance of tribal review. I get applicants that send me letters that say, we have done historical background research, we've done an archaeological report, and nothing's been identified, yet still you have expressed an interest, and we, we have to send this to you. They basically make it like it's a pain. And... Um, the SHPO doesn't know about everything, so I just wanted to give one other example with that. I mentioned it yesterday. Within one mile of my office, there's 24 cemeteries that the SHPO does not know about and will not know about because they're tribal cemeteries and we don't disclose their locations. Um, that's a particularly high density. But uh, we have sites like that all over, including in our homelands and in the state of Oklahoma, that we don't provide to the SHPO for various reasons, or sometimes we provide it to them and they just don't have it in their database. Um, some common questions that I get. Uh, what the heck is this fee for? <laughs> he did a pretty good job of explaining it earlier, so I won't go into too much detail, but it runs our office. Um, our grant is determined by how much trust land we have. So I am the only person that's full-time doing 106, and then we have other individuals that are involved in it, but I'm the only person that's in there doing it every day. And I'm expected to run my entire office, and so my supplies, my salary, pay for the people that do work with us, and anything else I need to do, such as travel, I'm $51,000. That's impossible. How can I do anything with that? And that's what, the, that's, for, that's what the fee is for. It runs our office. Um, without that fee, we wouldn't be able to do the review. And then we already performed a review there. We know there's nothing there. Um, or they say, how would you know if anything is there? Well, I kind of already explained those questions. I won't go into too much detail. But you can't identify a Native American site without talking to the tribe. You might be able to identify an archaeological site. You might be able to say, hey, there's a mound there. But sometimes there's a site in... Um, Oklahoma, that's just a rock, and it's a sacred rock to my tribe, the Osage tribe, and the Caddo tribe. If you walked past it, all you'd see is a rock. Shippo doesn't know about it. You can't identify that site without asking us. That's why you have to ask us. So, um, another thing I wanted to, to discuss, most of the people in this room are TCNS people. They're pretty familiar with point of contacts. They're used to working with the TCNS system, but um, just thought I'd mention it in case there's any PTC people still around. Uh, we've had issues, this mostly happens with non-FCC projects, but people don't understand the point of contact, and they also mentioned this earlier, did a pretty good job of it. There's a reason why there's a TIPO. They're designated. When a tribe has a TIPO, they're designated by the Park Service, and the chairman of the tribe has to write a letter to the Park Service saying this person is a designated point of contact. So it's actually a failure to consult with that tribe when you don't send letters to the, to the TIPO. When you circumvent the TIPO and go straight to the chairman, that's a failure to consult. <laughs> your 30-day window doesn't start until your information gets to my desk. That's what it says in the National Store Preservation Act. So anyone that doesn't know that should mark that down and remember it. 
it's great if you want to CC our chairman, but I'm just telling you he's probably not going to respond to you directly. He's going to say, what is this to me, if he happens to remember. He gets hundreds of emails a day. He runs a tribe. So for some reason, a lot of people don't get that outside of this room. I think most of the TCNS people have gotten that. And then um, I did want to um, recommend one thing. When we were having a discussion yesterday, and some people were talking about how complex tribal organizations were. And um, this was mentioned earlier by Alvin and by Jeffrey that we have different types of tribes and different laws that affect us. And so I want to recommend a simple book. I don't normally recommend books, but I think you can get, I think you can get on Amazon for $10. And you can get parts of it for free on Google Books. It's called the ACL Guide. Excuse me. I need some water. The ACLU Guide to the Rights of Indians and Tribes. It's um, written by Stephen Pivar. I think it's on the third edition now. And it does an excellent job of explaining in great detail all the different laws and um, court cases that affect American Indian nations uh, from a legal standpoint and then providing a layman's terms explanation. And so I would suggest anyone that has to work with Indians to read that book. It's super cheap, and it'll make a lot more sense to you when we start saying things that sound bizarre, like trust land and fee and restricted land and fiduciary relationship. So some people will know what that is, some people don't. But my last point, um, there's been a lot of discussion about maps lately. So where did we come up with this map? This is our area of interest. Um, it's actually out of date. <coughs> I forgot to... Uh, download a new version before I left. There's one county missing um, because this is NAGPRA. We have one additional county for um, Section 106 review that we don't include in NAGPRA. Um, it's kind of a complicated reason, but basically that one county is currently the reservation of a different tribe, and we allow them to we work with them over NAGPRA issues, but we do Section 106 consultation over projects in that area because we have historical sites of significance in that county. But um, Starting up north is where we sort of had our prehistory that I described, and then you move down into Arkansas, and we have a large amount of sites clear all the way over into Oklahoma. And then um, where we are today is that little bitty blue, if you can see it at all, dot in the northeast corner of Oklahoma, right between Kansas and um, Missouri. And we actually have trust land in Kansas, but we consider the whole county, um, Ottawa and Cherokee County, Kansas and Oklahoma, to be our area of interest. So that's what our area of interest looks like. And I think as I was describing our history, I tried to touch upon the high points of where we lived. And so that way, hopefully, this would make sense to you. But if you have questions about it, I can go into more detail. But that's where we come up with these types of things that we put on our map. And there's no sites on this version, of course, that I gave you. I can't display something like that for a group. But um, this is just sort of the, the counties. But um, this map was developed actually 20 years ago. Um, we were one of the early tribes to develop a map like this by Kerry Wilson um, based on NAGPRA work. And so it incorporates um, information from our elders, historic research, archaeological research, and repatriations. And so uh, this represents 20 years of research, intensive research. It's not just something that we threw down. And. Um, Oh, uh, Jeff asked me to explain what NAGPRA is. I'm sorry. I'm used to talking to less diverse groups. Um, NAGPRA stands for the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act, and it um, is a law that governs um, ancestral remains and um, culturally significant items that are held in um, museums that have received federal funding or are federally funded. Um, so we can repatriate, i.e., we can file a claim against human remains and say, you don't need to have these human remains, we're taking them back, and then the tribe can do as they please. They may, some tribes, most tribes bury them. Um, some tribes do different things. That's, I don't really want to go into too much detail about NAGPRA, but that's, uh, that's, but that's where this map started, um, that work. And so this map, though, has represented a great amount of work that we're constantly evaluating. We're actually trying to shave about three counties off the top right now. Uh, I can't go into too much detail on it, but we're trying to, we're always trying to pinpoint where we are and where we're not. Because I don't want to talk to people 
about projects that aren't in our area. That might surprise you, but I don't. I get letters from Homeland Security in Texas asking me if I care about a border fence. I don't, and I've sent them constant, I mean repeated letters telling them I don't care about it. And yet still I get 30 or 40 letters every month about fences in Texas, and I don't care about them. So that's why we're constantly trying to make sure that our area of interest is accurate. Not every tribe, I guess, has that level of a map, but um, this isn't something that we just threw down for the TCNS system. This is for everything. And um, I just kind of wanted to explain that a little bit. I guess there's been people that have asked a lot of questions about those. That's where we come up with ours. That's what it looks like if you actually were to... Excuse me. If you were to actually like throw it on a map instead of just input a TCNS project and see what happens, that's what it actually looks like. And um, you might notice uh, there's not actually a line going from Arkansas into our current area. Um, we don't <coughs> we don't count. Some tribes do, and it's perfectly fine if they under the law if they do. But they count removal areas, and we actually don't count removal areas. If if uh, we didn't have a um, presence where we actually occupied an area, then we don't take the time to consult over it just because we walked over an area. There might be a historic site, and in which case then we deal with it, but um, we don't typically count areas where we walked. It actually may be much, much, much larger if we did that. Um, we joke around, we say uh, Bourbon Street in New Orleans would be the southern edge of our area of interest. <laughs> so um, anyway, uh, we went down there to visit the French and but we certainly didn't have any actual like villages down there or anything like that. So that's where we come up with this map. And um, I hope that helps you understand a little bit about uh, how we do things. So it's our tribal seal. I thought you might like seeing that. But if you have any questions, I can answer them. Or if you want more details about a certain portion, I don't know how long I talked. You talked perfectly. I think okay. what we'll do is we'll take some questions. So uh, I want to thank these gentlemen for their for their insights and for their efforts uh, coming such a great distance and providing us with your uh, with all of your information. Uh, I'd like to open it up to any questions. Does anybody have any questions for the panel? Um, don't all jump at once. All right. Does the panel have any questions for any of the attendees? <laughs> Why? Do we still have the railroad industry out there? Are there folks here uh, still from the uh, the railroad from who are involved in PTC? Yes, I think there are. So um, no questions, really. Wow. Yes. Yes, sir. Uh, Zach Champ, PCIA. Thanks again for for the travel and, and being here. This is very informative. Um, I have a question, and I think uh, it was alluded to a little bit about how you may be working with other tribes uh, to show lessons learned and best practices, what opportunities there are for uh, for you all to get together, um, and also for, you know, if there's an opportunity for industry to also partake in those uh, those meetings and discussions uh, where that's appropriate. Thank you. You know, uh, my personal philosophy is, is uh, crawl, walk, run. Uh, when we first started, we, we wanted to make sure that all the T's are crossed, the I's are dotted, or the T's eyed, or the dotted, whatever. But anyway, in order for us to be successful, we got to make sure all our ducks are in a row. And uh, as we mentioned earlier, uh, Eastern Shoshone is the first tribe that, that, that uh, we're going to be working with. My goal in the next year or so is about 11 other tribes. I want to form a coalition of tribes that's going to, and Neil expounded a little on that, to take that MOU of those five, five federal agencies to a level that's, that's going to be more conducive to uh, consultation, true tribal consultation on our terms. There is a movie. There's one guy says, "Show me the money," <laughs> and wh when the day is all done, that's what it takes for me to make sure that the people fulfilling the job that that I want fulfilled that they're in place. 
So uh, short answer is uh, we welcome any tribe that wants to be a part of this. Uh, question over here. Bob, uh, it, I think we had one, oh, one more, if you, if you will, just a moment. Okay. Oh. Is this on? Sorry. It is. Okay. Um, I'd just briefly say that uh, in Oklahoma we have TBAG, which is the to bridge a gap conference, and um, we meet annually. I say we, I'm not on the board. They've asked me, and I try to run away from that. But anyway, um, but uh, that's pretty much all the Oklahoma tribes usually attend that. And then um, NAFPO and USET are also large organizations where tribes share ideas, and groups do come and do presentations there. So just the in terms of existing organizations, those are um, existing organizations that are used to that type of thing, I guess, for lack of a better term. So, so there are, uh, I'll, I'll add to that answer, the To Bridge a Gap Conference, uh, the <coughs> NAFPO, National Association of Tribal Historic Preservation Officers, and the United South and Eastern Tribes, those are three organizations. Uh, the TBAG Conference is hosted by the Forest Service in coordination with the Oklahoma Tribes every year. And uh, it's not just, um, so to, to coordinate with the Oklahoma Tribes is actually to coordinate with a number of tribes that were removed from the southeastern United States. Oklahoma is quite an interesting uh, uh, place from the tribal perspective. There are Senecas from New York and uh, there are Seminoles from Florida and there are Modocs from Oregon. So it's it, uh, the tribes that participate have interests all over the United States. Uh, NAFPO is an organization that is growing. Uh, you know, uh, every year brings new thippos to, to the fold. Uh, and the FCC has participated in NAFPO, I think, 13 out of the last 14 years, with only sequestration uh, standing in our way that one year in 2013. Uh, the United South and Eastern Tribes is actually an intertribal government association of the tribes from Maine to Florida to Texas who have a cultural and heritage committee that is very active on 106 processes. Uh, I will say also this year, the FCC, we are working to hold a Section 106 summit uh, for tribal nations in concert with the uh, National Association with NAFPO. Uh, and uh, it's a little too early to announce a save the date, but we are working on a variety of opportunities that will allow, will create not just a, an opportunity for us to interact uh, with our treaty partners, but also for uh, industry to be involved. Uh, there are times where we, of course, have to shut the door and consult with tribal governments on our proposed rulemakings, but uh, none of this works unless, uh, unless everybody is working together. And genuinely, um, I can say this, my own personal view from my time working uh, for tribal industry, uh, they kind of want the government out of the way. They're in a great history with the United States government. They, uh, they would rather work more directly with your, uh, with the businesses that affect their future. Um, so, um, are there? I, I believe there was another question, sir. Well, it's kind of kind of an add-on to what Mr. Windyboy was referring to, and I, I was I didn't know if this is something that we wanted to get into today, but um, just out of curiosity, I, I've noticed similar to what you're saying. There's a very different way in in the very different method in the way different federal partners or federal agencies interact on uh, the Section 106 process. And I guess that's I was trying to, trying to gauge your perspective on whether you'd like to see the other federal agencies adopt something more similar to what the FCC is doing or if there's a different direction that you think would be more productive. As Neil mentioned, you know, that... Uh, uh, why, why reinvent the wheel when, when uh, FCC uh, through Jeff's office and this department have already done that? Uh, all, I, all I'm doing is Jeff led the dance and he's gonna, he showed me how to do the dance. So now I know how to do the dance. Why not other federal agencies? And uh, we're going to crawl to the point that uh, utilizing that uh, five inter, uh, federal government interagency agreement to get us there. And uh, it's, it's long overdue. It's been in existence four years, but none has ever happened to it. It's like consultation. As Neil mentioned earlier, uh, I was there on the White, South, House, South White House lawn, April 29th, uh, 1995, when then President Clinton signed that first executive order. 
I was part of the working group that that created that because we wanted to see consultation having some meaningful dialogue with tribes. Everybody was talking about treaty rights, executive orders, and uh, acts of Congress that made tribes. It made us, it got us there, but it didn't fulfill the obligation that the United States government had. You know, and healthcare, likewise, <coughs> as an example, you know, the rest of America is getting about, oh, $4,200 per individual. Reservations are getting about $1,800. We're still in that same scenario, even with the Affordable Care Act. And I couldn't understand why tribes were so adamant in, in getting the Affordable Care Act when they didn't even fulfill the government or treaty obligation getting it right. So there's a whole host of issues that, that, that we need to deal with. This, to me, is, is one avenue to fulfill that because four years ago when I heard President Clinton or President Obama talk on, when he was talking to tribes, <coughs> he said a statement there that, that said that to tribes that you're going to have to create other mechanisms of ways of generating revenue for your people. And that's, that was, to me, was kind of shocking. And that tells me that, geez, I gotta, I gotta think outside the teepee. And that's what I'm doing. Hi, hi. As Chief Dan George said in the movie Little Big Man. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so I wanna make sure also there are other opportunities for folks who work in the <laughs> industries uh, to interact with tribal nations. Our office, the Office of Native Affairs and Policy, hosts uh, training workshops and consultations on virtually every issue, uh, every major rulemaking, every issue under the sun here at the FCC. Uh, last year we held five of these in separate parts, different parts of Indian country. And uh, I'd be happy to make sure that folks, if, you are, if you're part of the contact database that Jeff Steinberg team has, uh, we can make you aware of those opportunities. Um, these are consultations that cover, these events that we host are consultations that cover wireless uh, spectrum, they cover broadband deployment, they cover broadcast, uh, radio, TV. Uh, and it is time to start involving more of the industries and in those opportunities. Uh, Indian country is a, is a place where uh, new and different and diverse types of business models can take root. Um, there was a question that was asked earlier that I want to, so I want to make sure that there are lots of opportunities for folks to plug in, uh, in and I'm, I'm happy to share more of that information with you, uh, uh, both directly from ONAP and in our public notices, and then also if there's a contact database for this event. Um, there was a question that was asked earlier, and that was a, it's, I want to tie on to your, your question, sir about um, sharing the tower construction notification system with other federal agencies. Um, look, put pl plainly, I, I think we've got a good thing going here. Uh, you know, this, this, uh, this system is a mature system. It's a system that has worked out a lot of the, uh, the, the bumps in the road. It's a system that's been highly adopted by, by uh, the folks at the other end of that system, the tribal nations that were, are, are difficult to contact that are in insular communities that sometimes have connectivity issues or, uh, you know, budgeting, staffing issues. It makes the ability for them to be able to take quick cuts on big pieces of, of, uh, of information. Um, and it has repeatedly gone through stress tests, the tower construction notification has, uh, system has. And, uh, you know, uh, right now it's uh, doing an admirable job with the, uh, with the PTC process. Uh, we have met with other federal agencies, several in fact. There have been agencies that have asked us for this. And we've engaged in consultation with the tribes about this. This is one of our top priorities. Uh, I will tell you we've been flat out asked by two regions of Indian country uh, about one particular agency that will not be mentioned. Uh, they simply asked us not to share it with them. And the entire region said that if we did share it with them, they would pull out uh, of the system. And, uh, and when I asked them, wow, why is that? There were very simple reasons. They said, well, this agency doesn't have a plan for complying with Section 106. They don't have a staff. They don't have a budget. They don't have a commitment to making the process run. 
because TCNS is just a process. It runs because of folks who work it every day. I mean, I don't think there's a tribal historic preservation officer in Indian country that doesn't know Anne Marie Vipievsky's name because you pick up the phone and call and you get somebody at the other end of the line. And the initial points of contact know that there's an entire staff and hierarchy structure framework here that can help support that. So when the uh, White House asked us in the, uh, as a result of one of the most recent uh, executive orders on broadband, what we could do to leverage the TCNS system, we said we would be happy to meet with any federal agency. But there are just a couple predicates. Uh, they got to have a plan for 106. They got to have a budget. And they got to have staff dedicated to it. Because it would be the worst thing in the world to hand an agency TCNS without that, because it would fail. And then it would impact the work here with our industries and, uh, and our good relations with you and with tribal nations. Uh, so far, nobody's taken us up on that, but the offer stands, of course. Um, are there any other questions? Well, amazingly, I was going to say it was due to the Oklahoma Indians who were at the table, but we're evenly matched with the Montana Indians. <laughs> I was going to say we brought things back on to schedule, actually put it ahead of schedule. So uh, I think then I'll turn to Steve and Jeff for closing remarks. Thank you, Jeff. Mm -hmm. um, actually, I don't. Okay. Except to say we're, we're early. I'm, I'm glad you all paid very nice attention to Alvin and, and to Everett. I'm glad you came. Um, I will thank you again, PCIA, for making that happen. Um, there are two very good dynamic speakers. I think you, even if you didn't have questions, I think you got a lot to take away from this session and from the rest of it. And um, not to make any commitments, but I guess we'll probably do it again next year. So. I'll just take a minute or two to wind things up so that um, we can move on. But I did um, want to just acknowledge um, several people b um, before we break up. Um, and first of all, Steve Del Sordo, who's organized this as he has done and developed the program as he has done for the past several years. And um, clearly, there's, there, you know, there's a lot of work that goes into putting the program together. And many members of our staff participated in that, but, but Steve's been the leadership in, in doing that. It was really his idea a few years ago to start doing these workshops, and, and he's carried through on it. Um, all of our presenters and panelists today, in addition to Steve, um, Erica Rosenberg, Dana Beta, Joel Gehring, Jill Springer, Manya Baghdadi, Jeffrey Blackwell, and Alvin Windy Boy, and Everett Bandy, and, um, and Neil as well. Um, once again, thanks to PCIA for um, helping to, to bring our tribal representatives here. Um, Cecilia Solhoff is our master event organizer um, and has been you know, with us all the way this year, um, as well as Myra Delao and um, Jim Swartz, who've been in the room to both um, taking reservations, helping put the you know, all the nuts, bits and pieces of this event together and have been in the room today at the registration table with the microphones taking the online questions. Um, thanks to Cecilia again and to Joelle for bringing in the refreshments. Um, feel free to take an apple or a banana with you on your way out. I don't think... Oh, yeah, as I was going to say, I don't think Joelle wants to truck them all back to Michigan with her, so... Um, um, thanks to, um, to Jeff Reardon and our AV staff and the closed captioners for, um, you know, all their support as always. And finally, you know, everybody here and everybody who's participated on the web, you've, um, you've had a, a lot to listen to today. Um, hopefully it's, it's been very good and helpful for you as it, as it is for me, but this, there's no point do, for us doing this without you. So, um, you know, th thank you for your attendance, for your participation, for your ongoing support. Um, anyone who is traveling back home, wish you safe travels and hope to see you all again next year when we do this again.